Chapter 15 Because he needed to know, he returned. He needed to know whether or not he was doomed, and along with him the revived Jedi Order he had created. Verger peered up at Luke from her perch on the stool. "'Come to ask more questions,' she inquired. "'I should warn you, I've already spent my day answering questions from fleet intelligence, and I'm tired of it.' "'I'll trade you,' Luke said. "'One of my questions for one of yours.' Her whiskers rippled. You didn't answer my last. If you can't detect the Yuzhan Vong in the Force, is the fault with the Yuzhan Vong or with your perceptions? Luke settled onto the chair opposite for Jer. You left out a third possibility. The fault may be in the Force. For Jer's feathery crest rose in surprise. Is this your answer? No. I don't have an answer, Luke admitted. He looked at Verger. Do you? Verger smoothed her crest with one hand. Is that your first question? It is. Verger paused for a long moment, as if mentally rehearsing an answer. Before I can answer, I need to know whether Jason told you what happened to me on Zonama Seacoat. He did, Luke said. So you know that I chose to accompany the Yuzhan Vong in order to discover their true nature. You spent fifty years with them. And so if anyone should have an answer to the question of whether the Yuzhan Vong are outside the Force, it should be you. Yes. There was a long pause while Luke waited for Verger to continue. Then she said, That was your answer. Luke smiled. The answer to my first question is yes. Correct. And I'll have to ask another question if I want further information. Also correct. Isn't this a little bit childish? Her feathers fluffed, then smoothed. It's your game, not mine. And I believe it's my turn. He shrugged. Go ahead. She fixed him with her tilted eyes. If the Yuzhan Vong are completely outside the Force... What does that imply for the Jedi and our beliefs? Luke hesitated. This wasn't just a question. This was the question of questions, the issue he had been wrestling since the invasion began. When he spoke, he spoke carefully. It implies that our knowledge of the Force is in error or incomplete. Or it implies that the Vaughn are an aberration a profanation of the Force, a thing that should not be. He hesitated again, but the implacable logic of his train of thought forced him to continue. To life we owe our compassion and our duty. But I must wonder what we owe to something completely outside our definition of life, to something that is a kind of living death. I must wonder if we owe them anything but a real death. You shrink from this thought. It was a statement, not a question. Any being of conscience must, Luke said. He could feel tension in his clenched jaw muscles. But still it is my duty to the Jedi not to fear where this leads. He centered himself and tried to send the tension into the far distance. My turn, he said. Verger nodded. Proceed. He took a breath and forced himself to ask the question that he suspected would doom him. Are the Yuzhan Vong outside the Force? I have only what amounts to an opinion. But it's the opinion of a Jedi Knight, experienced in the Force, who has spent fifty years among the Yuzhan Vong. Yes, and my opinion is this. By definition, the Force is all life, and all life is the Force. So therefore the Yuzhan Vong, who are living beings, are within the Force, even though we can't see them there. Luke felt months-long tension draining from his limbs, and a heavy stone fly weightless from his heart. Thank you, he murmured. She looked at him and spoke with quiet intensity. You owe to the Yuzhan Vong the same measure of compassion you owe to all life. 
no war of extermination is justified. You will not have to eradicate this profanation from the heart of existence. Luke bowed his head. Thank you, he repeated. Why were you afraid of my answer? Because if the enemy were not life, if they did not deserve compassion, then leading a war against them would have furnished a means of letting the dark side enter not only myself, but all the Jedi I have trained as well. My understanding of your position, then, is that such traits as anger and aggression are to be avoided, because they may lead to domination of the mind and spirit by the dark side of the Force. Luke looked at her. Was that your second question? Young master, Verger said. It was phrased very carefully so as not to be a question. I was merely attempting a clarification of your position. Luke smiled. Yes, your understanding is correct. Then my next question is this. Do you believe that nature would have given us traits such as anger and aggression if they were not useful? Useful for what? Luke countered. They are useful to the dark side. What use does a Jedi have for anger and aggression? The Jedi Code is specific. We act not from passion, but from serenity. Virger settled onto her stool. I understand now, she said. Our difference concerns where this serenity originates. You believe serenity is an absence of passion, but I believe it is a consequence of knowledge, and self-knowledge most of all. If passion is not opposed to serenity, Luke said, why are they paired in the Jedi Code? Because the consequences of these two states of mind are opposed to one another— an unchecked passion produces actions that are hasty, ill-considered, and often destructive. Serenity, on the other hand, may well result in no action at all. And when it does, serenity produces actions that proceed from knowledge and deliberation, if not from wisdom. Her wide mouth suggested a smile. My turn. I haven't asked my question yet. I beg your pardon, but you asked a question about the Jedi Code. I answered. Luke sighed. Very well, though it seems to me that I'm conceding a great deal. On the contrary, you're acting from serene self-knowledge. Luke laughed. If you insist, I do. Verger stroked her delicate whiskers and considered her next question. It was my observation that on your last visit you were angry with me. You believed that I had deliberately harmed your apprentice, which was accurate, though your anger was moderated somewhat when I explained my motivations. That's true, Luke admitted. Now my question is, was that anger dark? Was it an evil passion that possessed you, such that the dark side might have taken you as a consequence? Luke chose his thoughts carefully. It could have been. If I had used that anger to strike out at you, or harm you, particularly through the Force, then it would have been a dark passion. Young Master, it is my contention that the anger you experienced was natural and useful. I caused... Deliberate harm, pain and anguish and suffering over a period of weeks, to a young man for whom you had accepted responsibility, and for whom you felt a measure of love. Naturally you felt anger. Naturally you wanted to break my thin little neck. It is absolutely natural, when you discover that a person has inflicted deliberate pain on a helpless victim, to feel angry with that person. It is equally as natural an emotion as to feel compassion for the victim. Roger fell silent, and Luke let the silence build. After a moment, Roger bobbed her head. Very well, young master. You are correct when you said that if you had entered my cell and struck out at me with the force, that such an action would have been dark. But you didn't. Instead, your anger prompted you to speak to me, and find out the reasons for my actions. 
To that extent, your anger was not only natural, but useful. It led to understanding on both our parts. She paused. I'm about to ask a rhetorical question. You need not answer. Thank you for the warning. My rhetorical question is, why wasn't your anger dark? And my answer is, because you understood it. You understood the cause of the emotion, and therefore it did not seize power over you. Luke thought for a moment. It is your contention, then, he said, that to understand an emotion is to prevent its being dark. Unreasoning passion is the province of darkness, Berger said, but an understood emotion is not unreasoning. That is why the route to mastery is through self-knowledge. Her tilted eyes widened. It's not possible to suppress all emotion, nor is it desirable. An emotionless person is no more than a machine. But to understand the origin and nature of one's feelings, that is possible. When Darth Vader and the Emperor held me prisoner, Luke said, they kept urging me to surrender to my anger. Your anger was a natural response to your captivity, and they wished to make use of it. They wished to fan your anger into a burning rage that would allow the darkness to enter. But any unreasoning passion would do. When anger becomes rage, fear becomes terror, love becomes obsession, self-esteem becomes vainglory, then a natural and useful emotion becomes an unreasoning compulsion, and the darkness is. I let the dark side take me, Luke said. I cut off my father's hand. Ah. Berger nodded. Now I understand much. When my rage took control, I felt invincible. I felt complete. I felt free. Verger nodded again. When you are in the grip of an irresistible compulsion, it is then that you feel most like yourself. But in reality, it was you who were passive then. You let the feeling control you. My turn for a question, Luke said, and at that point a comm unit chimed. Master Skywalker, Neely Kirk's voice said, a fleet has just arrived out of hyperspace and they wish to contact you. Berger blinked at him. Next time, she said. Luke rose. Next time, he said. Outside, Neely Kirka met him with a bow. Sixteen ships just arrived, mostly freighters or modified freighters, but including a star destroyer, Errant Venture. There are messages to you from Captain Card, and also from Lando Calrissian, who commands one of the ships. Thank you. Neely Kirka walked with him to the nearest comm unit. I'm running out of questions to ask her, the Tamarian said, and I'm running out of reasons to hold her. Keep her until I can talk to her one more time, Luke said. I'm still not convinced that she's benign. The Tamarian's air sac pulsed meditatively. Then why would she rescue Jason? To gain access to the Jedi, perhaps so she can destroy us. Air whistled from Neely Kirker's sack. No wonder you want her held. The problem, Luke thought, was that if Verger was as powerful as he thought, she wouldn't be in Neely Kirker's cell any longer than she wanted to be there. Luke stepped aboard Wildcard to a salute from a double row of skull-headed, glowing-eyed droids with massive physiques and sloping foreheads. The ship smelled of machine oil. Luke returned the salute and marched down the line to be embraced by Lando Calrissian and to have his hand pumped by Talon Card. I see your droid factory is thriving, Luke told Lando. Everything you see, Lando said with a grin, is for sale to the government for a very reasonable price. Luke frowned at his friend's flippant remark. That strongly depends on whether we get a government, he said. Card looked serious and tugged his small goatee. You'd better tell us about that, he said. Card took Luke to his cabin, and Luke told Lando and Card of the latest developments in the Senate. 
There have always been rumors about Fjord Rodan, he said finally. Rumors that he's connected with smuggling operations on the rim. If either of you know any of the details, perhaps you can help us. Discredit Rodan by associating him with us? Card said and laughed. No offense, Luke said. None taken, Card said. But I'm afraid I can't help you. It's not Fjor Rodan who's the smuggler, it's his older brother Tormak. Tormak Rodan used to fly out of Nar Shaddaa for Jabba the Hutt, Lando said. After Jabba had his, uh, accident, Tormak went independent and set up on the rim. He and his brother hate each other, Card added. Tormak was into anything shady, and little brother Fjor grew up as straight-laced as they come probably in reaction to how big brother Tormac behaved. If you're sensitive on the subject of smuggling, I guess that's why. Still, he added, stroking his goatee, I think Lando and I can help your candidate along. Alarm tingled along Luke's nerves. How? he asked. Card gave a private little smile. It's best you don't know. I don't want Cal Omis discredited, Luke said quickly. If you get caught in something shady, no one will believe that Cal wasn't behind it. Lando put a reassuring hand on Luke's arm. Not getting caught at something shady is our specialty. There's always a first time. Luke, Lando said, we're just businessmen. We're trying to get government contracts. We have a perfectly legitimate reason for talking to anyone who could help us. And we have sixteen ships full of supplies that we're donating to the refugees on Moon Calamari, Card added, all courtesy of the Smugglers' Alliance. So we're going to be very, very popular for a while, and politicians will want to be seen with us. I'm not sure I like what I'm hearing, Luke said. Then we'll change the subject, Card said smoothly. He opened the locker and took out a metal container, which he thumped down onto the table and opened. Like it? Luke saw a boxy, wheeled droid, and gave a little shiver of distaste. It looks like a mouse droid, he said. Millions of mouse droids were in existence, chittering and squeaking and running their obscure errands beneath the feet of annoyed citizens. Why anyone had chosen to model a droid on disease-carrying vermin was beyond him. It's a mouse droid chassis, Lando said. We get them cheap. People practically pay us to take them away. But this mouse droid now contains the sensor unit of one of our Yuzhan Vong hunter droids. Ah, Luke said, understanding. The Yuzhan Vong hunter units are better at sensing Yuzhan Vong than they are at sensing humans, Card said. But they are aggressive and, well, murderous, Lando said. Card gave him a sharp look. Conspicuous was the word I was looking for. He tapped the mouse droid. One of our YVHM units can sniff out Yuzhan Vong infiltrators and, unlike one of our hunters, won't be tempted to immediately blow him to smithereens. Instead, it can be programmed to follow the infiltrator, record his movements, and take note of anyone that the infiltrator talks to. Whoever notices a mouse droid, Lando said. Most people do their best to avoid noticing them. Our next model will feature a small repulsor lift. Flying, Yuzhan Vong hunters. Just think about it. Luke had been making some quiet calculations while the others were involved with their sales pitch. I don't think you should talk about your YVHM models to just anybody, he said. We want these to be a surprise, especially to the Yuzhan Vong. Lando smiled and nodded. Can you suggest who we should talk to? Diff Scour and Idar Neely Kirka for two. The head of New Republic Intelligence and his military equivalent. That's very good. Luke reached out and gave the smooth plastic surface of the mouse droid a pat. I have a feeling, he said, this little critter is going to be very, very useful. 
Trickster was parked in orbit around Kashi Ik, and a group of Wookiee technicians descended on it, supervised by Lobaka. Quarters for the Twin Sun Squadron and docking base space for their X-Wings had been found on the old Rendili Dreadnought Starsider, which had been converted to a tender and supply depot for other ships. Jaina found her new cabin and threw herself down on a mattress that still smelled of the previous occupant's unwashed body. The first thing she checked were the hollow messages that had piled up waiting for her while she'd been on the Obroa Sky mission. Yes, there was a hollow message from Jason. Her fingers trembled as she pressed the buttons that would play the recording. Hi, Jason said. I'm back from the dead. And he looked it. He was ten or twelve kilos underweight, and the long hair and scraggly beard gave him the appearance of a hermit just rescued from a long period of fasting in the desert. He briefly explained that he'd been held prisoner by the Yuzhan Vong, and rescued by a Jedi named Verger, a Jedi of the Old Republic. "'I'm sorry I didn't try to contact you through our twin bond,' he said. "'You were in my thoughts the whole time.' but I knew that the Yuzhan Vong wanted you to try to rescue me. They were ready for it. They wanted to sacrifice us both in a special ceremony. So my greatest chance of staying alive was to keep you as far away from me as possible. They tell me you've played a big part in a victory. His brown eyes gazed mildly out of the hollow. I hope that means you've been all right while I've been away. It must have been bad enough knowing that Anakin was dead without thinking that I was gone as well. He hesitated. I know you're too sensible to get into anything really hurtful, but I hope you're well, and I hope we'll be able to talk soon. Tell Loie and everyone hi. Take care. I love you. The holographic image fizzled out. Jaina's thoughts whirled. It seemed she was forgiven for not trying to contact Jason through the twin bond they shared. But on the other hand, Jason seemed to have sensed, or perhaps heard about, her mad, angry brush with the dark side, her surrender to the fury that was her legacy through the blood of Vader. What could she tell Jason? It had been bad enough confessing her actions to her mother. The next message was from Jagged Fell reporting that he'd encountered her mother and father on the Hidian Way, and that Leia had told him Jason had escaped the Yuzhan Vong. Did everyone know before I did? she thought. I've missed you, Jag said. I wish I was with you. I wish I could see your reaction when you find out that Jason is alive. I want to kiss you in celebration. Even though she wanted to bask in misery at this moment— Jag's words brightened her spirit. The memory of his arms around her, and the phantom taste of his lips on hers, whispered like a warm summer wind through her memory. She really couldn't, she thought. Being in love at a time like this was madness. Not when death reached out to her at every moment, when another person to love meant only another person to mourn when the time came. But Jason had come back. Perhaps that meant that things had changed. Her mind whirled, but one thing was clear. Soon death would come for her. The fewer people to mourn then, the better. Gina found Kip Duran in the pilot's mess, chewing without enthusiasm on a reconstituted, freeze-dried Iogoin steak that may have been in a storage locker since the days of Empress Tata. Great one, he said, looking up. Please exercise your godly powers and summon real food. We're orbiting six hundred kilometers above the greenest planet in the New Republic, and the mess can't seem to find any fresh vegetables. He paused, then looked at her in surprise. What's wrong, Styx? Jason's alive, she said. He's on Moon Calamari with Uncle Luke and Mara. Kip's expression cleared. Wonderful, he said. Get yourself a plate of rehydrated salthia bean paste, and we'll have a feast and celebrate. Jaina sat heavily on the seat opposite him. What do I tell him I've been up to since he was captured? she asked. Comprehension dawned. 
I see, Kip said. Well, he looked down at his plate and pushed the Iogoin away with distaste, then looked at Gina again. You may as well tell him the truth. There's more to it than that, Gina said. During his capture, he made no attempt to contact me through the Force, for fear that I'd try to rescue him and run into a trap. So what do I tell him? That because he didn't contact me, I ran amok? What's that going to do to him? Kip listened carefully and nodded. I understand your concern, he said. But I think Jason can take care of himself. He always has. And besides, Anakin's death had as much to do with your going to the dark as Jason's capture did. Maybe so. But it's hard to know how he's going to take things. What if it sends him into another spiral of... of whatever it was that paralyzed him in the first place? You saw the hologram, Kip said. Did he look paralyzed? Jaina found herself smiling. No. He looked like he'd been through a lot, but he looked all right. And he was right enough to be concerned about me. Kip nodded at her solemnly. And I think, when you see him, you'll know what to say. Jaina looked at her hands. I hope so. Kip grinned. Is there anything else that's going to keep you from celebrating? Jaina smiled, but sobered quickly. Admiral Crefe, she said. He and the Bothans have gone mad. They've all decided they're going to wipe out the Yuzhan Vong to the last germ cell. So now we have a commander who's bent on destroying a whole species. She looked at him. Is that an invitation to the dark side, or what? Kip was impressed. Even I never went that far, he said. He leaned across the table toward Jaina. I think that the dark side can only take command when you are feeling certain emotions, he said. In my case, it was anger. In yours, it was the desire for vengeance. On behalf of a brother who turned out not to be dead, Jaina said bitterly as well as the one who was. Yes, that was wrong, and we're agreed on that. But I think we should try to make several distinctions here. All right, Jaina said, though she felt cautious at the idea of too many shadings and distinctions between light and dark. There's aggression for its own sake, which is bad, yes. There's defensive war, fighting against invaders on behalf of your own worlds or people or government, which, if not necessarily good, is at least justified. Jaina nodded. I'm following you. And then there's a counterattack in an otherwise defensive war, which was Obroa Sky. And it's what? Jaina asked. Good? Bad? Justified? Justified, Kip said. I've been thinking hard about this, and I think justified. Then he saw Jaina's dubious look and said, Let me give you an analogy, all right? Say you have a friend who has something valuable, like a ring, and a thief attacks your friend and steals the ring, and for some reason you can't prevent it. I'm following you. And later you meet the thief and you see the thief wearing the ring. So is it aggression to bring the thief to justice and return the ring to its rightful owner? So you're saying, Jaina said, that the thief is like the Yuzhan Vong, who have been stealing our worlds, and that it's not aggression to want our worlds back, and the Yuzhan Vong out of our hair? I'm not saying that there isn't a degree of aggression, but I'm saying it's justified. But if your aggression lets in the dark, then it's not justified, Kip said. He sighed. Look, you can go after the thief because you're angry at him, and you want to give him a good pounding. Or you can go after the thief because you want to see justice done. There's a difference. Anger is dark, but the love of justice is light. And perfect justice is impossible, Jaina countered. 
Perfect justice isn't the issue. You're setting too high a standard. We haven't sworn oaths to be perfect. He considered for a moment. Look, it's like when Luke was fighting Darth Vader, and the Emperor stood by urging him to strike out of anger. Fighting Darth Vader wasn't the wrong thing to do, but fighting him out of anger was. Jaina looked at him for a long time. No offense, Kip, but I wish it was Uncle Luke who was making this argument, not the greatest living expert on the dark side of the Force. Kip looked at her soberly. So do I, Jaina. So do I. When Winter opened the door, there was a slight hiss of changing pressure. She saw Luke, Mara, and Jason, and stepped away from the door to let them inside. Please, come in. Admiral Akbar's apartment was deep below sea level in Herkia Floating City, and was filled with the scent of the ocean. The rooms were rounded and dimly lit, and echoed to the music of falling water. There were deep seawater pools in every room, connected by submerged tunnels or by channels spanned by small arched bridges. The walls and ceilings shimmered with golden light reflected by the waves, and the floors were tiled in colors that reflected the moods of the sea, green, blue, turquoise, and aquamarine. The door hissed shut behind them. Winter wore a long white gown and a necklace of sea-green jade. She greeted Luke and Mara with an embrace, and kissed Jason on each cheek. "'How is the Admiral?' Luke asked. He pitched his voice low in the hope that these artificial caverns wouldn't amplify his voice and carry it through the house. "'His body is failing him,' Winter said. Her calm voice was matter-of-fact, but Luke could see the lines of sadness radiating from the corners of her eyes. "'Can anything be done?' Mara asked. "'As he told you the other day, there's no single thing wrong,' Winter said. "'The real problem is age, and the way he drove himself during the rebellion. "'He wasn't young even then, you know.' "'I suppose not,' Luke said. "'It never occurred to me to wonder how old he was. "'He seemed as young as—as as he needed to be, I guess.' You'll find his mind is as supple as ever, Winter said. He can still work for ten hours at a stretch if he takes care of his body. Work? Mara asked. At what? I'll let Akbar tell you that. Luke, Mara, and Jason followed the tall, white-haired woman over a small bridge and across stepping stones, actually the tops of tall pillars, set in a quiet pool. They came to a comfortable drawing-room with a central pool set amid comfortable furniture. There Akbar waited, bobbing in the pool. He waved one huge hand. Luke, he called. Mara, young Jason, welcome to my home. His voice showed no sign of the slurred diction it had shown in Admiral Sov's office, and boomed out as vigorously as if he were shouting orders on the bridge of his flagship. "'Thank you, sir,' Luke said. "'Please, seat yourselves. "'Forgive me for not joining you. "'I'm much more comfortable these days if I stay in water.' "'Your home is lovely,' Mara said. "'It suits me,' Akbar said simply. "'Winter efficiently served refreshments while Akbar and his guests chatted.' Then Akbar floated toward Jason, and looked up at him with his goggle eyes. "'Can you tell me of the Yuzhong Vong, young Jason?' "'I'm willing,' Jason said. "'But it's a large topic. You're the only person I know who has any exposure to them. Tell me what you can.' Jason spoke for a long time. Of the Yuzhong Vong and their castes, their leadership, their religion— the way they interacted with each other and their captives. He touched on his own experience only lightly. Luke was surprised and impressed that Jason, in pain and in slavery and alone, had observed his captors so acutely, 
and was able to organize his material so well. Winter listened in silence, and after a while sat on the edge of the pool, pulled up her gown, and dangled her legs in the water. Akbar floated next to her, and she rested an affectionate hand on his sloping, glabrous shoulder. Luke watched them, and thought of the many tragedies contained in Winter's mind. The white-haired woman possessed a holographic memory that recorded her entire life in perfect detail, but would not permit her to forget. The grief she must have felt at the destruction of her home world of Alderaan, with her family and friends, was as fresh in her mind now as it had been twenty-seven years ago. The battles of the rebellion, the struggles against Fergan and Joris Sabaoth, the kidnapping of the infant Anakin Solo. Winter could relive all these with the same intensity with which she'd first experienced them. Likewise, the years she had spent with Jason when he was a child were as vivid as her experience of the adult Jason himself, sitting near her. Winter's mind was a hologram, Luke realized. It contained a complete template of her life. Birth, death, joy, tragedy, violence, triumph, despair. Seen that way, it wasn't surprising that she'd joined Akbar in his retirement. Perhaps her mind contained more than enough severe experience by now, and she needed tranquil memories to place alongside those that were not in the least tranquil. But now, as Akbar declined, Winter was going to acquire even more long, sad memories that she would never be able to forget. Akbar listened to Jason's story, and then he and Winter asked a series of questions. Finally, Akbar sighed and settled peacefully in the water. Very good, he said. I know how to beat them now. Luke looked at the Admiral in surprise. So that's what you've been working on? Oh, yes. Akbar looked up at Winter and gave her knee a pat. With Winter as my memory and my invaluable assistant, I've been working very hard on a strategic plan for the war, and now Jason has confirmed my ideas of the Yuzhan Vong character. I think victory is now conceivable. Are you planning to come out of retirement? Luke asked. Akbar gave a burbling sigh. I don't know if that's possible. Admiral Sov is willing to take my counsel on this matter, but will anyone listen to poor Admiral Sov? They'll listen to you, Luke said. I can't imagine anyone not listening. Borsk failure wouldn't listen, Akbar said, and Borsk failure had many friends. He shook his huge head. I truly miss Moon Mothma. We understood one another. Our skills were so entirely complementary. She and I were a perfect team. She the great orator and politician, and I her sword. She was able to see the traps that I was blind to, and I saw the dangers that she could not see. Her wisdom saw the rebellion to its conclusion and created the new republic. And with my fleets, I helped bring about the defeat of the Empire. Again he shook his head. She spoiled me, he said. She understood my methods, and I understood hers. Since her passing, I've had to deal with others who were not so understanding, and I lacked the skill for it. I had never needed it before. He sighed, and for the first time he slurred his words, as he had the other day. Moon Mothma, perhaps I shouldn't have outlived her. Winter looked at Akbar in concern. Never say that. No, Luke said. You still have much to contribute. Your plan will prove that. Akbar sighed again. But who will see this plan? It requires not only the cooperation of the military, but of the highest levels of government. And our government has no highest levels. 
Akbar was obviously tired, and the visitors didn't stay long after that. As Winter saw them out, she paused and put a hand on Jason's shoulder. I was so sorry to hear about Anakin, she said. Jason nodded slowly. He was always grateful to you, he said. He knew how you fought for him on Anoth. His two hands took Winter's between them. If it weren't for you, he wouldn't have had the last fourteen years of his life. And it's not just Anakin who was grateful for that. It's Jaina and I and everyone who knew him. He kissed Winter's hand and let it fall. Mara and Luke embraced Winter and left the apartment. Perhaps, Luke thought, Winter's holographic memory was not always a cause for sorrow. She would remember Anakin as an infant, as a growing boy, and those brilliant undying memories might well be brighter than the more distant knowledge of his death. Somewhere at least memories of Anakin were preserved perfectly. Anakin as he was, alive and vital, unscarred by the tragedy that was his end. Luke took great comfort in the thought. Chapter 16 In the end, Jaina decided to put aside any other considerations and concentrate once again on being a good leader to the Twin Suns' squadron. Half her squadron had no combat experience beyond operating battle stations on Trickster and that was hardly their normal line of work. They were starfighter pilots, and Jaina knew too well that even experienced pilots had a very short life expectancy when going up against the Yuzhan Vong. She planned an ambitious training schedule, putting the pilots in their cockpits almost every day, battling against formations of A-wings, whose speed and combat characteristics most resembled the Yuzhan Vong coral skippers. On the days when the squadrons weren't in their X-wings, they would do classroom work on tactical theory and practice. Jaina's ambitious schedule fell apart on the second day. Twin Sun's squadron was practicing hyperflight maneuvers, pursuing a squadron of A-wings under Colonel Ijix Harona. Harona and his scimitar squadron made repeat short hyperspace jumps, while Twin Sun's squadron tried to both follow them through hyperspace and end their jumps in an advantageous tactical position relative to their quarry. The two squadrons were evenly matched. Both were composed half of experienced pilots and half of rookies. The two squadrons had completed their second pursuit, a modest success, Jaina thought, when a distress signal flashed across their hyperspace comm units. This is New Republic cruiser Far Thunder. We and the frigate Whip Hand are under attack by approximately sixty enemy coral skippers. Our hyperdrive engines are disabled. Coordinates follow. We request assistance from all nearby New Republic forces. I repeat. Janus' blood ran chill. Far Thunder was the cruiser that had been disabled at Obroa Sky and had been left under escort by the ex Imperial Lancer class frigate Whip Hand. Most of Far Thunder's personnel had been evacuated, and there weren't enough remaining to make up a fighting crew. Jaina thumbed the intership comm and signaled Major Harona. Scimitar One, did you copy the distress message? I copy, Twin One. Harona's voice was slightly distracted. Ask them for details. I'm going to query fleet command. Understood, Scimitar One. Jaina triggered the hyperspace comm. Far Thunder, this is Twin Sun Squadron. Can you give me an idea of your situation? Major Solo? A new voice came online, and Jaina recognized Far Thunder's Captain Hanser. We have only damage control and bridge crew aboard. We've slaved the weapon systems to droid brains, but it's not as effective as a real fighting crew. We've lost our tender. We've lost a lot of our shields, and we're getting hammered. Whip Hand is holding her own, but is too hard-pressed to protect us. Jaina heard quiet despair in the voice. I just want to buy some time to evacuate my crew and scuttle the ship. That's all I ask. Her heart went out to him. Hanser had argued so forcefully against Farlander, who had wanted to scuttle the cruiser, and finally won his point, only to come to this. Understood Farthunder. 
Jaina said. Stand by. She switched to intership comm. Scimitar 1, Far Thunder reports, I heard, Harona said shortly, and then added, Fleet Command is concerned that it's an ambush. The messages aren't faked, Jaina said. I recognize the captain's voice. Stand by, Twin One. Jaina waited a long moment while Harona signaled headquarters. Then his voice returned. Fleet Command has left the decision to me, Harona reported. If we don't go, they'll order Whip Hand to save herself and abandon the fight. Jaina bit her lip. It would take a considerable effort for coral skippers to destroy even a disabled capital ship, but they could do it in time. The two reinforcing squadrons would go a long way toward evening the odds, but half the starfighter pilots were rookies who couldn't be expected to hold their own against the Yuzhan Vong, and the experienced pilots would be distracted by having to look after them. Plus, the Yuzhan Vong themselves may have sent for reinforcements. She thought of shields falling, the hull being breached, death and slow-marching obliteration as far thunder was destroyed piece by piece, compartment by compartment. Jaina thumbed her comm button. "'I'd risk it, Colonel,' she said. "'If it's too hairy, we can jump out.' There was a long silence before Harona's voice returned. "'Agreed, Twin One,' he said. "'We'll use the A-wing slash, so that puts you in the lead.' "'Understood, Scimitar One.' Jaina spoke through clenched teeth. Harona's plan would commit Jaina's squadron first and keep his own A-wings out of the battle, until after the fight got nasty. Not that Harona's plan didn't make sense. The A-wings were little more than a pair of giant Novaldex engines with weapons and a pilot strapped on. They couldn't take punishment like an X-wing, and were best at hit-and-run fighting. Stand by to receive jump coordinates. Prepare to jump on my mark. I copy, Scimitar One. Jaina switched to the channel she used for communication with her squadron. We have received a distress call from two capital ships under attack, she said. We're going in to help them. This is no drill. She paused a moment to let that sink in. I want wingmates to stick close to their leaders. You are not to go off on a Vong hunt on your own. Each flight is to form single file with two kilometers between ships. Twin Five, I want your flight twenty kilometers astern of my flight and to the right. Louis howled in acknowledgment. Twin Nine, your flight will fly cover twenty kilometers astern of Twin Five. Acknowledged, Tsar said. She wanted her squadron in single file because it was easier for the rookies to keep up. They had all been assigned as wingmates to more experienced pilots, so all they had to do was follow the ship ahead of them and shoot at any enemy that got in the way. If the wingmates themselves got bounced, they'd have a veteran pilot behind them who might be able to keep their tails from being waxed. Jaina watched the displays as her squadron settled into the assigned formation. Not a whole lot of bumping and weaving, which was good. We won't know the full picture until we get in, she said, so be prepared to maneuver the second we get into real space. Any questions? No questions. Everyone in her squadron, she thought, was either very smart or very stupid. Jaina knew which way she wanted to bet. Extend your foils, arm and test weapons, now. Laser bolts flew past Jaina's cockpit as weapons were tested. At least her rookies hadn't blown her tail off, which under these conditions had to count as a success. Her navigational computer lit as Ijix Harona fed her coordinates. Jump on the colonel's mark, Jaina said, and switched to the all ships frequency to hear Harona's voice. On my mark, he repeated. Five, four, three, two, mark. The starlight streamed away around the cockpit and Twin Sun's squadron was on its way. It was a twenty-minute hyperspace jump, which gave Jaina far too much time to think about what was going to happen. Plans and contingencies swarmed through her mind. Most of them ended with the New Republic forces getting splattered. She thought of plasma cannon projectiles shredding her rookies, or Lobaka, 
or herself. She knew that if the war went on, it was only a matter of time before it happened. Sooner or later, the death lottery would call her number, just as it had called so many others. With an act of resolute will, she banished the dead from her mind. She had to think of ways to survive, not brood on the long list of the lost. Her mental armor slatted into place around her. She would concentrate only on the outcome, on a successful resolution of the fight. It was not until her nav computer gave her the two-minute warning that she thought to call on the force. She had been neglecting her daily force exercises and meditations, and not just because she was busy. Opening to the force meant opening to the totality of life, and that included the emotions she was denying herself. Grief, terror, panic, horror. It meant being vulnerable, and she couldn't afford vulnerability right now. She had to keep focused on the outcome, and anything that didn't lead directly to the survival of her squadron was irrelevant. Nevertheless, she called on the Force, calling only on its strength to refresh her, its vigor to keep her mind alert. She knew she could do that, for short periods at least, and not be distracted by all the other things to which the Force connected. Distantly, in her Force awareness, she could sense Lobaka and Tisar, and they sent her a burst of fierce warrior joy. She absorbed it, felt its keen anticipation of the coming combat, and tried to use it to give herself strength. She wished she had Jedi here, Jedi who could form the linked force meld they had called into being at Abroa Sky, but she and Loi and Tisar were the only three present, and three really weren't enough. The X-Wing nav computer gave its chiming warning, and suddenly the stars hurled themselves against the black backdrop of space and stuck there. Jaina scanned her displays and saw at once the two New Republic capital ships, big vessels surrounded by swarms of swift-flying gnats. Energies flashed on the displays. It was clear that the two big ships were still fighting. Far in the distance, standing off, were a pair of tender analogs, unarmed coral craft that had brought the coral skippers to the battle. They were in deep space. No suns, no planets, no moons, no asteroids, no comets. Twin Squadron, she ordered, alter course sixty degrees to left in succession. Once you hit my mark, accelerate to ninety-five percent maximum thrust. This is Twin One, turning now. The controls responded smoothly in her hands as she swung the ship on its new trajectory and punched the engine controls. Behind her, each X-wing followed in turn, the line of ships, almost fifty kilometers long, turning toward the fight. Tisar and Lobaka were a distant reinforcing presence in the force. Ijix Harona and his A-wings stayed behind, but Harona's ships had enough acceleration, Jaina knew, to catch her any time he wanted. This is Twin Sun Squadron and Scimitar Squadron, Jaina told Far Thunder and Whip Hand. Where do you want us? Whip Hand replied first. We're holding our own, Jaina was told. Your priority is to help Far Thunder. Copy that, Whip Hand. Whip Hand was a Lancer class frigate, developed by the Empire to guard convoys against attacks by rebel starfighters. It was a ship dedicated to battling swarms of small craft, and was ideal for holding off groups of coral skippers. If Far Thunder hadn't suffered so much damage and evacuated so many of its crew, the two of them together could have done more than hold their own, but as it was, Whip Hand was severely handicapped by having to guard its crippled consort. Jaina studied the displays and realized, to her relief, that the enemy— were not moving with the eerie synchrony that Menta Yamisk guided their attacks. That was good, because she didn't have any of her Yamisk jamming devices with her. There had been no point in taking one on what was supposed to be a training flight. The relationships of the two big ships, she saw, were interesting. They were flying abreast, with whip hand, making big rolls around the cruiser to wherever the threat seemed greatest. At the moment, Whip Hand was rolling toward Jaina and her approaching squadron, almost eclipsing her view of the damaged cruiser. Whip Hand, Jaina transmitted. 
Can you roll another fifteen degrees, and then hold your position relative to Far Thunder? I might be able to do you some good. There was a moment's hesitation. Very good, Twin One. Whip Hand ponderously rolled into place, completely eclipsing Far Thunder. Heads up, people, Jaina told her squadron. We're going to strip off some of the furball around Whip Hand before we get tangled up in Far Thunder's trouble. Pair leaders, pick your own targets. Wingmates, stick to your leaders. Remember, you're just there to keep their tails clear. Once you're clear of the skips around Whip Hand, look for me, and hang on to my tail if you can, because things are going to get hairy fast. If you have any questions, talk now. No questions. She'd made her instructions very clear for the rookies. Just follow the guy in front. The veterans, on the other hand, probably understood what she was up to. Whip Hand was getting very close. The enemy coral skippers had been fully committed to their attack runs, and were only now beginning to react to Jaina's presence. Too late. Jaina picked up one coral skipper that was only now finishing a run on Whip Hand's aft engine assembly. The skip was arcing in preparation for turning and making another run, and its Dovin basal shield was probably deployed aft in order to keep the frigate's defensive fire from climbing up its tail. Perfect. Jaina was closing so fast, the target probably didn't even know she was within ten kilometers. It was a deflection shot, but Jaina's reflexes synced perfectly with the controls of her X-wing and she turned the nose just slightly into the enemy's turn and quadded the laser cannon. The coral skipper shattered into fragments as the X-wing whipped past. Then the big frigate, surrounded by streams of coherent light from its turbolasers, flashed beneath the belly of Jaina's fighter. Rolling to right, twin two. Jaina wanted to roll in order to clear her tail of any enemy who might be bouncing her but she didn't want to lose her rookie wingmate as she shook the enemy free. I copy, Twin One. On her displays, Jaina could see her wingmate matching her maneuver. Twin Two was a female duro named Vale, who had thus far shown herself a reasonably capable pilot for someone just out of flight school. Jaina looked ahead and saw Far Thunder in bad shape. Parts of the big cruiser were shattered. Other areas were blackened as if by flame. But at least two-thirds of her turbolasers were still pumping out fire at the forty or so coral skippers that hovered around her, and defensive missiles were still being launched. Space around the cruiser was filled with brilliant fire. Again, Jaina chose a target, the hindmost of a flight of four coral skippers that had just made a run on Far Thunder's bridge. She lifted the X-wing's nose, matched trajectories, and blew the skip apart with a second shot. Then she pulled the stick hard, her fire climbing to the second coral skipper, and watched flame erupt from its stony hull as her laser bolts stitched its surface. The remaining two skips dodged left and right, and Jaina was unable to follow. In seconds, she had left Far Thunder far behind, and began to pull on the stick in order to loop around and make a second pass. Suddenly, laser bolts were slashing past her cockpit. Something crashed on her aftermost shields. Skip on your tail, Major. Vale's shriek dinned in her ears, and Jaina's heart jolted against her ribs. Breaking left, Jaina said, and yanked the controls. The laser bolts slid off to the right, and she caught a glimpse of a coral skipper as it flashed past, bright projectiles still flaming from its plasma cannons. She doubled back onto the coral skipper and launched a missile at it, but its doven basil sucked the missile into oblivion, and the coral skipper shot away, accelerating fast. Thanks, Twin Two, Jaina said. Her heart was still hammering, and she could only hope that Vale's frantic laser barrage had frightened the enemy pilot as much as it had terrified her. She spent the next few frantic seconds sorting out her command, getting Twin Sun's squadron organized after its fighting pass and in a position to make another run at the enemy. Seven coral skippers had been killed, with no casualties among the X-wings, but the Yuzhan Vong were ready for them now, two battle group sized formations having separated themselves from the main body, ready to bounce the X-wings when they next approached. 
The way you follow me, Jaina said. Tisar, your job is to fly cover and keep those guys off our tails. I copy, Tisar said. The A-wings should help you, Jaina said. We hope. She aimed her flight for the furball surrounding the far thunder and punched the throttles. An attacker's chief advantage was speed. Once she had to slow down in order to maneuver against the enemy, she'd be easy meat for those two battle groups hovering out of the action, waiting for just such an opportunity. So if she could help it, she wouldn't slow down. The A-wings weren't the only starfighters that could make a slashing attack. The problem was those two battle groups hovering on either side of Far Thunder, just waiting for her to do exactly what she was doing. Rolling to left, she announced. That would put Far Thunder between her squadron and one of the enemy battle groups, which would mean that the enemy would have to run the cruiser's gauntlet of fire before it could reach her. Maybe it wouldn't try. She could only hope. Leaders, choose your targets, Jana said. Wingmates, stick close. She already had a coral skipper picked out, one just beginning its pass on Far Thunder. She followed it into its run, lined it up, fired lasers, only to see the bright bolts of light curl and shift blue and vanish beneath the event horizon of the Dovin Basil. She fired again, to the same result. And then one of Far Thunder's turbo lasers punched right through the craft like a knife thrust through a bar of soap, turning it into bright rainbow fragments that spattered on Jaina's shields. The skip's Dovin Basil hadn't been able to guard against Jaina and the cruiser both. She breathed thanks to whatever droid brain had fired the lucky shot, then rolled away from Far Thunder and punched the throttle to escape the danger zone. Twin leader, you're being bounced, Tisar's voice. Watch your six. Rolling left, Jaina said again. That would put her in the overlapping fields of fire from both Far Thunder and Whip Hand, which she hoped might intimidate the Vong. Her cockpit brightened to streams of turbo laser fire the blue and red and green light strobing on her control switches and dials. Then plasma cannon projectiles flamed past her extended right foils, and she jerked her X-wing left again, then rolled back onto the tail of the skip as it raced past. She could see the Dovin Basil's singularity deployed aft, but she lined up the target anyway. Why not? Shooting at it might keep it honest. Skip on my six... Vale's frantic voice jolted Jaina's heart again. I'm breaking right. Behind Vale's words, she could hear the slam of plasma cannon projectiles on the X-wing's shields. Jaina abandoned her quarry and broke left, then right, an S-curve that she hoped would let her line up on the coral skipper that was hunting Vale. It flashed across her sights and she fired, but the deflection shot missed. Cursing, Jaina hauled the X-wing after the enemy. I've lost shields. The enemy's Dovin Basil had jumped forward and eaten Vale's shields. At least that meant the singularity wasn't deployed aft. Twin two, break left. Vale overreacted to Jaina's command, hauling the stick around so hard that her maneuvering thrusters killed her own speed and made her craft a perfect target. But the skip swam across Jaina's nose and she launched a missile. The enemy craft shattered like an egg, and for a moment... Jaina mistook the buffeting on her shields for debris until a brighter scarlet plasma cannon projectile slammed her canopy like a giant hammer, ringing a bell. She rolled her ship to right, but the cannon rounds followed, slamming her again and again. Veil, your six is clear, she shouted. But I've got a skip on my tail. I'm breaking to right. Her astromech droid, R2-B3, gave a squeal of chittering anger as a Dovin Basil overloaded one of her rear shields. She spun the ship in a wild corkscrew spiral as plasma rounds blazed past her cockpit. Jaina licked sweat from her upper lip. Vale, get me out of this. First Far Thunder, then Whip Hand, whirled through her vision. I can't find you, Major, her wingmate wailed. One of the enemy rounds darted through the broken shield and took off a chunk of Jaina's upper left foil. She led the enemy pilot on a mad dance through the void, but the skip hung on, its plasma cannons hammering. Breaking left, 
Jaina called, and hoped someone was in a position to hear and act on the knowledge. Turbo laser fire from whip hand traced surreal patterns across her vision. She could feel sweat beneath her arms and across her forehead, and felt her shoulders tense as if awaiting the shot that would blow her away. Twin one, roll right, Tisar's voice. Jaina heard the command through the force before she heard Tisar's words, and she yanked the X-wing around. Laser fire streamed past her canopy, and then actinic light flared off her cockpit instruments as the pursuing coral skipper was blown to fragments. Thanks, Twin Nine. Jaina blinked sweat from her eyes. Tisar's third flight had done exactly what Jaina had intended them to do. Hang out of the fight until one of the hovering enemy squadrons bounced Jaina, and then bounced the attackers. It wasn't over, though, by a long shot. Jaina's squadron was still tangled up with a swarm of coral skippers, and they were all moving very fast. By now they had overshot the cruiser and frigate, and were engaged in a fighter-to-fighter -fighter duel outside the zone of the capital ship's protective fire. They were all on their own, and the numbers were fairly even. A burning X-wing crossed Jaina's path, and she felt a steel fist clamp on her insides and twist. The two skips that had flamed the X-wing flashed past too quickly for her to get a shot at them. Twin Two, get on my tail. The lost aft shield was preying on Jaina's mind, and she very much wanted Vale behind her, helping to cover the gap. I still can't find you, Twin Leader. Vale's bewildered cry nearly shattered Jaina's eardrums. Never mind, Jaina said. Just stay alive. I'll find you. Jaina pushed her force sense outward, tried to locate Vale in all the confusion. Twin Ten and I will stick with you, Jaina, Tisar said. Thanks again. And then she had to dodge a Yuzhan Vong missile that was trying to find the hole in her shields. She yelled at her astromech droid to get the shield up again, and took a snapshot, and missed, at a coral skipper that flashed past. She found Vale in her heads-up display and chased her down just in time to shoot a coral skipper off her wingmate's tail. "'Right behind you, Twin Two, Jaina said as the burning coral skipper flamed off into the darkness. "'Oh, thank you!' Vale's exclamation was heartfelt. "'Twin Nine, Jaina told Tisar. "'Vale and I both have damaged shields aft. Can you stick with us?' "'Affirmative?' There followed several minutes of burning, tearing, confused combat that alternated with bewildered moments in which Jaina couldn't seem to find anyone to shoot at. She took shots at several coral skippers and launched a pair of missiles, but had no idea whether she'd succeeded in hitting anything. And then she heard Loey's roaring cry. More coral skippers were arriving. At least ten of them. This was the second enemy battle group that had been hovering out of the combat, waiting to jump Jaina when she made her attack. Thanks to her maneuvering, they'd been forced to fight their way past the capital ships in order to reach Jaina, and had lost a pair of skips in doing so. But now they had arrived. Now the odds against Twin Sun's squadron turned fatal. Jaina's next few moments were frantic with evasive action, as she danced and weaved and fled across the face of the void. In the course of her frantic maneuvers, she lost track of Vale, Tisar, and Twin Ten. She lost a sense of everything except her own terror. Through the Force she could only sense desperation and terror, and she closed down her extended Force sense, not wanting the other pilot's emotions to distract her. She saw an X-wing explode in a shower of orange light, and she fired at skips that crossed her path without knowing whether she hit them or not. The inner ship calm filled with shouts, warning, and screams of frustration, fear, and anger. Jaina was nearly blind with the sweat that poured into her eyes. Finally, she'd had enough. This was a fight that it was impossible to win. Twin Sun Squadron, she shouted. Prepare for hyperflight. Return to Origin on my mark. Return to Origin called for a hyperspace leap to the jump point previous to this one, meaning the place in empty space where Jaina had first heard Far Thunder's distress call. There was no problem jumping from here. They were in deep space, where every point was a jump point. Negative, twin leader, came a voice. Negative. Do not jump. 
Only now Jaina remembered Ijix Haruna and his flight of A-wings. Where are you? she demanded. She pulled her X-wing hard to the right to evade the bright fire of a plasma cannon. Another cannon jolted her front shields as a coral skipper tried a deflection shot. Colonel Hirona's voice was maddeningly calm. We're right here. And suddenly the dark night of space lit with the fires of burning coral skippers. Seven enemy craft were destroyed in two seconds as Hirona's twelve A-wings punched through Jaina's flight. Jaina's squadron had become so entangled with the enemy that both she and the coral skippers had slowed in order to maneuver leaving the Yuzhan Vong easy, sluggish targets for the A-wing's blazing storm of fire. Jaina gave a shriek of relief and joy. Cancel that hyperspace jump, she called. We're back in business. There was more desperate fighting for Jaina while Harona and his A-wings turned for another pass, but this time the odds were more even. She splashed one enemy and scared another off the tail of one of her rookie pilots— then Harona and the A-wings came slashing through again. The Yuzhan Vong this time were more prepared, and the A-wings nailed only four. But that tilted the odds more decisively in Jaina's favor, and now it was the enemy desperately evading across space while the X-wings pursued. Before the A-wings could make a third pass, the Yuzhan Vong broke contact and ran, heading for the tender analogs that had carried them here. Not just those engaged with Jaina but all the rest as well, all those harassing Far Thunder. Good work, twin sons, Haruna congratulated. A fine day. A fine day for you, Jaina thought. Her jumpsuit was soaked with sweat, and the air in her cockpit fairly smoked with the tang of adrenaline. Form your squadron astern of Far Thunder, Haruna ordered. Jaina's squadron had lost three craft and two pilots, both rookies. Jaina had barely had time to learn the names of the two pilots before the war tore away their lives. Her own wingmate, Vale, had survived. The rookie pilot, who had succeeded in ejecting from his damaged craft, was picked up by one of Far Thunder's shuttles that carried its evacuating crew to Whiphand. Once the crippled cruiser was evacuated, Whiphand maneuvered to within point-blank range of Far Thunder and opened fire. The unresisting cruiser blew to bits in a furious explosion, leaving nothing behind for the Yuzhan Vong. Jaina pictured the unlucky Captain Hanser on the bridge of the whip hand, as he watched the destruction of the ship for which he had fought so hard. Jaina knew just how he felt. The Yuzhan Vong had lost a couple of dozen coral skippers in exchange for the destruction of a Republic-class cruiser. Even though they'd fled the battle, the Yuzhan Vong had every reason to call it a victory. The two starfighter squadrons formed on whip hand and leapt together into hyperspace, heading for Kashi Eek. Once there, Jaina knew Twin Sun's squadron would bind its wounds, acquire two new replacements, and set out on its ambitious training schedule. Until, of course, they were again called upon to face the Yuzhan Vong and the roll of death's dice in the void. Chapter 17 Nomanor left the temple square in a thoughtful mood. The temple's head priest, standing before the altar, had just delivered the message that High Priest Jakan had written on the subject of heresy, a message that all priests were ordered to repeat to all Yuzhan Vong over the course of the next few days. Reverence of the Jedi was explicitly condemned. The congregation had been attentive much more attentive than they would have a few days earlier, before the Shapers had produced the antifungal bomb that had relieved their itching. Nomanor, his skin no longer aflame, had listened to the message with approval, at least until the message ended and the crowd began to disperse. It was then that he realized that the priest's message had been, perhaps, a little too detailed. What Jakan had done the executor suddenly realized, was to explain to any potential heretics exactly how to behave. The little band of heretics that Nomanor had infiltrated possessed a confused, inchoate doctrine, the elements of which they barely understood. But now it had all been explained to them. They had now been told that heretics believed that the Solo Twins were emanations of the gods, that the power of the Jedi was a threat to the gods. 
Jacan had just defined heretical doctrine for the heretics themselves. If Numanor should ever attend another meeting of the heretical congregation, he suspected they would have a much better idea of what they were doing. Numanor rose from his thoughtful trance and discovered that he was leaving the temple alongside a young shaper, one who had, judging from the freshness of the scars, only recently acquired the shaper's specialized hand. Numanor remembered the guarded Damutek on the fringes of the new city, the one where he'd observed Onimi, and he approached the shaper. "'Pardon me, friend shaper,' Nomanor said. "'I wonder if I may have a moment of your time.' "'Honored, sir?' the shaper said in surprise. He had knocked out several of his own teeth and replaced them with some kind of coral implants, presumably ones that aided him in his shaping duties. Nomanor didn't really want to know what shaper protocol required modified teeth— and he regretted the young shaper's lisp extremely. "'My name is Huli Krek, from the Damutek of the Intendants,' Nomanor said. "'We're from the Emergency Resources Department, and we've recently received a requisition from the office of—' "'Well, I shouldn't give the name, save to say that he's a master shaper. "'Unfortunately, the requisition is couched in rather technical language, and neither I nor my superior—' quite understand the purpose of the requisition. He says it is important work to do with the war, but we can't quite understand what the Shaper Lord intends to do, and my superior is unwilling to release the resources until it can be made clearer. Nomanor now had the Shaper's full attention. Yes, Nomanor thought at him, this is all about making your caste richer. How may I assist you, sir? the shaper asked. The requisition has to do with supplies necessary in order to fulfill the directives of, he feigned hesitation, of something called a cortex, I believe. A cortex is a body of shaper knowledge, the helpful shaper lisped. Each cortex was delivered in the before time by the gods themselves to the supreme overlord or to master shapers. I see, the intendant said. And how many cortexes are there exactly? Eight. The eighth would be the highest, then? Yes, Lord Intendant. The eighth cortex is the supreme body of knowledge of the shapers' art. Most of it was delivered by the gods to the dread one Shimra himself and he hath not yet seen fit to deliver the knowledge even to master shapers. Numanor felt a chill run up his spine. We're doomed, he thought. Who would have thought that extinction would be heralded by such an absurd, lisping voice? He barely managed to stammer out his thanks to the shaper and quickly tore himself away in order to contemplate in private what he had just learned. He knew how governments worked. How else could he subvert them? And that knowledge enabled him to draw conclusions from a sprinkling of facts. The Eighth Cortex, the supreme knowledge possessed only by Shimra and the gods, did not exist. The Cortex Project, headquartered just beyond the city and guarded by a corps of warriors, was intended to create the knowledge, which Shimra would then deliver to his people. The Yuzhan Vong were in a war of indefinite length, and they had run out of the knowledge that would enable them to win it. If the New Republic continued to learn and innovate, while the eighth cortex of the Yuzhan Vong remained empty, then the Yuzhan Vong were finished, doomed, about to be wiped from history. His mind whirled. Nomanor put a hand against a wall in order to steady himself. And if the gods, he thought in terror, have not delivered the knowledge to Shimra, then Shimra is a fraud, and so are the gods. Numanor wanted to laugh and shriek and wail all at the same time. The greatest pillars of faith, obedience, and hierarchy, the pillars that held up the great edifice that was the Yuzhan Vong, were nothing but a swindle. Numanor had always suspected this, but he had never expected to have it proved. Others were staring at him, he realized. 
He managed to pull himself upright and put one foot in front of the other as he marched to his office. The Yuzhan Vong needed to win the war fast, he thought, before the lack of an eighth cortex could make a difference. Nomanor would demand more information from his agents, and would sift their reports with the greatest care and diligence. He would find the enemy weaknesses and devise ways to take advantage of them. He would help the Yuzhan Vong hammer the enemy until the enemy surrendered, or was no more. And he would also try to work out a way to use the knowledge for his own advantage, because he was, after all, no manor. A hollow blared in the small room, and tiny, three-dimensional figures swung their fists, heroes fighting evil in the days of the Sith. "'You've returned,' Verger said. "'I have,' Luke said. "'And I brought you something.' He offered a package of sweets, candies made from Amon Calamari seaweed drizzled with a sauce of jewel fruit. "'Welcome, young master,' Verger cried and took the package. "'I'm afraid you won't find a file or a concealed vibroblade,' Luke said. Verger, chewing candy with an expression of bliss, did not immediately reply. When she managed to speak, she said, "'My debriefers seem to have run out of questions.' This means that they're busy cataloging all my answers, so they can ask the questions all again, and try to catch me in contradiction. There is a trace of amusement in her tone. If I contradict myself, they prove I'm a spy, because I can't keep my story straight. Whereas if I don't contradict myself, they prove I'm a spy, because I'm too well briefed. Luke laughed to himself, imagining Idar nearly Kirka, cursing as he heard this. He had just shown Luke the transcripts of Verger's interviews, all annotated for the reinterrogation. He'd now learned that Verger had anticipated his every move. Verger waved off the hollow as Luke settled onto his chair. There's this comfort at least, she said. The hollows are as witless as I remember. That must be a consolation. She peered at him. You've come to ask a question. You owe me an answer from last time. Verger settled comfortably onto her stool and popped another candy into her mouth. Begin then, she mumbled. How did you prevent the Yuzhan Vong from finding out about your abilities? We know that Yamisks can detect force users. It is easier to demonstrate than to explain. She faced him directly. Please attack me through the force. He looked at her in surprise. Attack you how? Mentally. Her whiskers rippled. If it helps, you may use a component of that anger you first brought to this room. I'll trust that you're a gentleman, and won't make it lethal. Give in to your anger. The Emperor's seductive voice echoed in his mind. Was Verger trying to provoke him to anger, bring him to the dark side? If so, that attempt was doomed. He had withstood Vader and Palpatine when he was barely more than a boy. Now that he was a Jedi Master in the prime of life, he would hardly fall victim to such a trick. Luke turned his chair to face her and crossed his legs. The Force welled into his mind like water rising in an artesian spring. Force awareness expanded in all directions. He was aware of Idar Nili Kirka outside the room, the two techs who monitored the equipment, a prisoner in another cell, others who worked in an office just above them. He could sense the glow of their lives in the Force, hear the throb of their hearts, and time their whispering breaths. He knew that one of the techs was concentrating on a technical problem, and that his friend was daydreaming of her fiancé, who had four arms and bright blue fur, and who sent her flowers and dreams of bad poetry. But what Luke could not detect was Verger. She seemed to have vanished completely from his force awareness, even though he could plainly see her sitting on her stool across from him. He refined his awareness and finally detected her, a kind of fitful, uncertain presence, her life force a faint, cool phosphorescence compared to the bright candle flames of the others. Luke tried to refine his sense of Verger to a greater degree, but she was remarkably evasive. 
She kept sliding away from his perceptions like a slippery melon seed squeezed between the fingers. The difficulty of keeping Verger in focus produced in Luke a sense of frustration, which he used deliberately to fuel an attack at the elusive target, a fast snake-like strike configured as a command simply to remain still. The mental bolt fired, but failed to find its target. He built a strike more deliberately, drawing more of the force to power the attack, not a jab this time, but a battering ram. Reveal yourself, he commanded, and launch the strike. Again, Verger eluded him. His frustration rose, and he used it to power another fast strike, like a reflex backhand blow. Nothing. Luke began to vary his attacks between massive, deliberate cannonades and swift, intuitive reflex strikes, hoping that one or the other would catch Verger by surprise. Nothing worked. Verger continued to sit on her stool, her reverse-articulated knees poking up above her head like knobby horns, her eyes gazing mildly into Luke's. I can see where she is, Luke realized. He didn't have to search for her in the force. So he built a force wall around her, an iron box to keep her mind from slipping away, and he made up the walls of the box with a command, Reveal yourself. After this he shrank the box, forced it smaller around Verger's small body, molding it until it fit her form exactly, a prison to contain her spirit. And then he called more of the force to him, building a vast mental cannonball that would obliterate anything in its path, Again with the command, Reveal yourself, and he aimed the cannonball at the tiny figure that he trapped inside the iron box. Reveal yourself, he commanded again, and he launched the cannonball. He knew it entered the box. He knew Verger's spirit was trapped there, boxed in, unable to move. But somehow the tiny target eluded him, and the cannonball slid away on a curving trajectory through the wall into the next cell, and Luke was suddenly and startlingly aware of the prisoner there, who jumped from his cot and screamed, Yes, I confess, I stole the captain's shoes while he was drunk. Revealing himself. Luke laughed and let the force awareness ebb to its normal level. I'm going to get tired if I keep this up, he said. That last one almost worked, Berger said from around a piece of candy. I hope you can teach this technique, Luke said. There is more than one technique involved. I managed to evade that last strike with a kind of mental parry, as in fencing. You know how a thrust can be parried not by opposing it, but by redirecting it slightly so that it misses its goal? Of course. I did something similar. I added just enough mental energy to your strike to cause it to divert. The timing was very difficult to judge, and there was no small measure of luck involved in my success. And your other techniques? Do you know the definition of a master of defense? Tell me. A master of defense is one who is never in the place that is attacked. One can move the attack, as I just did with my parry, but one can also simply not be there. Not so simply, Luke murmured. I call it making myself small. I narrow my focus bit by bit until it becomes, well, microscopic, tiny. My mind and force awareness I shrank to an infinitesimal size. An enemy has the same chance of finding me as his chance of finding one molecule amid billions of others. Your tears, Luke said. That's how you make your tears. Very good, young master, Verger said. Yes, in that state I can rearrange molecules, take them apart, and build new ones bit by bit. I use my tears because they are convenient, but I can accomplish the same thing with other material. I know a Jedi healer, Silgal, who would delight in this technique. I'll try to teach her, if you and she are willing. If I am ever permitted to leave this place. You can teach without leaving this room, Luke reminded her. A sly smile drifted across Verger's face. 
I can. But will I? Verger gave one of her wheezing laughs and popped a candy into her wide mouth. If the military releases you from here, Luke said, will you aid us in the fight against the Yuzhan Vong? Verger rolled the sticky candy into her cheek as she spoke. Insofar as it coincides with my goals, I will. Though I am much more a teacher than a warrior, and I believe my greatest objective is to help Jason to his destiny. Her eyes narrowed. I understand that he is your apprentice, not mine, and that you may have other intentions for him. I'm glad that you appreciate that. Luke had no clear idea whether he wanted to let Verger near Jason ever again. I think I have much to teach him. I don't want him to become dependent on you, Luke hedged, nor do I. There was a moment of silence. Then Verger said, Correct me if I am wrong in my understanding, but Jason gives me to understand that you've put restrictions on the Jedi during the course of this war, forbidding aggressive actions. I've tried to do so, Luke said, and then laughed. My success has been modest, but my understanding is that you yourself undertook offensive warfare against the forces of the late Emperor. For instance, you were part of a party that attacked the first Death Star. You led the destruction of the criminal organization of the Hut, called Jabba. You accepted military rank and participated in numerous offensive actions against the forces of the Empire and other enemies. You didn't confine yourself to spying missions and aiding refugees. All true. So my question is, what has changed? Luke paused and considered how best to marshal his arguments. The Yuzhan Vong are a different enemy, for one thing, he began. Our special talents are ineffective against them. And, as I expressed yesterday... I didn't know what we owed a species so far outside life as we knew it. Verger nodded her understanding. You have heard my opinion that the Yuzhan Vong are not outside the Force. I wonder if this has changed anything. Luke hesitated. I don't think so. The Jedi Code is clear in its statements against aggression. I know much more about the dark side than I did when I was twenty. I know how easily the dark can enter how the dark can infiltrate the heart, even when it's most certain of its own actions, and I know that many of my students aren't ready to face it. You cut off your father's hand, yes. You want to prevent your students from making the same mistakes that you have made. Of course. A disdainful look crossed Verger's face. That is egotism speaking. Resentment prickled along Luke's nerves. You don't know my students. You don't know how impulsive and reckless they are. Don't judge them all by Jason. He hesitated. Kip Duron killed millions. And this was your responsibility. Again, Luke hesitated. The situation was complex. I was paralyzed, and Kip was under the control of— You mean to say that it was not your responsibility— Verger interrupted, her tone harsh. "'I could have been more aware of the situation,' Luke insisted. "'There's so much I could have done. "'So it is your responsibility.' "'Interrupting again. "'The next time it will be,' Luke insisted. "'The next time one of my students is swept away on a dark whirlwind and catastrophe results, it will be my fault.' Verger's feathery crest rose. She smoothed it with her fingers. Of course it would not be your fault, she said. You are a Jedi master, not a nursemaid. I trained them, Luke said. If their training fails, when you cut off your father's hand, was it the fault of your teachers? Verger demanded. Did Yoda fail to instruct you what dark passion could do? No, I... Frustration throbbed in Luke's heart. That's different. I, I, Verger mocked. I, I, I. Upon you lies the spiritual health of yourself and all those whom you taught. Is that not ego speaking? 
Luke looked at her as realization struck. "'You're trying to make me angry,' he said. "'Yes,' she said simply. "'Did I succeed? You did.' Luke found his anger easing as he realized that Verger had been manipulating him. Though it didn't fade entirely, it still hummed, subdued, in his nerves. "'I prayed upon your weakness,' Verger said. "'I prayed upon your lack of self-knowledge, your uncertainty about where your responsibility lies for the behavior of those who have been your students.' Her piebald feathers rippled. "'Was your anger dark?' It was getting there, Luke said. So where was the darkness? In me, in you, or in the Force? I think you've been asking too many questions. Bruger sat back on her haunches. I wondered when you were going to notice. If you have a question, ask it. You've been saying that dark passions are caused by lack of self-knowledge. But Emperor Palpatine was dark and I can hardly imagine that he lacked self-knowledge. He seemed perfectly comfortable within his evil. How do you reconcile this with your theory? Bridger paused, assembling her argument. Darkness enters through dark passions, she said finally, but sometimes it remains through invitation. Palpatine, knowing himself thoroughly, may simply have decided to become dark, or to let the dark part of his own nature dominate. You're saying he may have chosen evil, coldly, not out of a hot passion. Sometimes people make such choices. Berger's tone was amused. Usually these people are trivial or silly. Swearing a midnight oath, solemnly intoning, I choose evil, what a ridiculous picture. But sometimes there may be a genius who chooses to free the dark side within him. Perhaps Palpatine was one such. I cannot say I knew him only distantly, as a politician. But I can say this. The dark may enter through meditation as well as through anger. Luke considered this. Certainly Palpatine and Vader's methods hadn't been to urge him to evil through meditation. But then— if he had joined them as their disciple, perhaps that would have come. Have I answered completely? Verger said. Luke nodded. If so, Verger went on, I would ask another question. Do you think the Force cares what shade your thoughts may be? The Force is all life. It embraces all options. But I care. Verger nodded. A good answer, young master. Because the shades, the dark and the light, and all the colors of the rainbow. She leaned forward and tapped Luke on the breast with one hand. They are here. Light and dark are not some great abstracts in the sky, but a part of you. And the force reflects what it finds in you. Later, when Luke spoke with Idar Neely Kirka, he said, You might as well let Verger go. You're not going to get anything out of her that she doesn't want to give you. Neely Kirka was surprised. You're no longer worried she might be a danger? It still concerns me, Luke said. But if Verger is an enemy, we won't find out by keeping her here. We'll find out by watching what she does once she's been released. The Tamarian looked thoughtful. I'll give your recommendation serious thought, Master Skywalker. If you decide to release her, Luke said, I'd be obliged if you'd let me know first. And you could let her know my address and comm code in case she wants to speak with me. I'll do that. Luke bowed. Thank you, Commander Neely Kirka. At your service, sir. Luke made his way to the planet's surface, Verger's words spinning through his mind. What has changed? Perhaps everything. We know that there must be many refugees from Vortex on Moon Calamari, Lando Calrissian said, and we're sure that they're in touch with your office. A great many of them, yes, said Fig Boris, the senator from Vortex. He and Lando were seated comfortably with drinks in the hotel suite Lando had rented. 
We sympathize, Lando said. And as you know, we've brought sixteen ships worth of relief supplies to Moon Calamari to help settle the refugees here. Ice tinkled in Boris's drink. The discreet scent of his minty cologne wafted through the air. I'm grateful on my constituents' behalf. We have a problem, though, and perhaps you can help. How may I assist you? We have the supplies, but no way to distribute them. What we thought we'd do is present you with twenty-five metric tons of supplies. You can distribute them to your constituents as you think best. Boris's eyes grew wide. That's certainly very generous, he managed. Twenty-five tons? He was almost visibly calculating how much twenty-five tons of relief supplies was worth in the current market. With the planet's few surface areas swarming with refugees from dozens of worlds, all desperate for the most basic necessities. Boris no longer had a homeworld to return to, and without a homeworld to vote him in, he was obviously never going to be returned to the Senate. He had to think about his future. Twenty-five tons, Lando repeated, though there is a catch. Boris's wide eyes narrowed to slits. And what might the catch be? We hope to be able to sell our YVH droids to the military, Lando said. If you can use your best efforts to vote an amendment onto the upcoming military appropriations bill, you'll find us extremely appreciative. Boris sipped his drink carefully. You'd best tell me about these droids. I have a full array of literature, Lando said, and of course a demonstration hollow. After Boris left with an armful of data pads to distribute to his peers, Talon Card stepped from the next room. It's all recorded, he said. Boris's bribe weighs twenty-five tons, Lando smiled. It's going to be hard for him to claim it doesn't exist. Unlike the distinguished senator from Bilbringi, who, on being offered the relief supplies, simply demanded their equivalent in cash, that hollow was particularly entertaining. "'Who's our next guest?' Lando asked. Card glanced at his data pad. "'Chao Feswin from the Elrud sector.' "'The Elrud sector isn't threatened by the Yuzhan Vong. "'Do you think he'd have any use for relief supplies?' "'Make the offer,' Card shrugged. "'We can always turn it into cash later.' He looked up. We've also got some calls from other senators who must have heard about us from, uh, our other clients. They're very interested in the military acquiring our droids, practically begging us to bribe them. Lando looked at him with a growing smile. I think we should oblige, Card shrugged. I can't think of any reason not to. He looked thoughtful. But I wonder, if these people are on our payroll... Who else's payroll are they on? That answer would be interesting, wouldn't it? Lando said. By the way, have you heard how Mara's doing? Not yet, but I hope to hear from her soon. Mara was, in fact, doing well. She had taken YVHM-1 out for its maiden Yuzhan Vong hunt, wandering government buildings and large public concourses. She lunched at a kiosk, set up in a shopping concourse, and then sat down to digest and to watch the passers-by. She told the droid to search on its own. She was distracted by the sight of a pair of children, children Ben's age, taking their first hesitant steps in the open-air crash the concourse provided as a convenience to its customers. Sadness rose in Mara and took her by the throat. For a moment she missed Ben so much— that it was almost a physical pain. And then the mouse droid signaled her portable comm. Mara looked up from the crash, startled. The mouse droid signaled again. The droid had located a Yuzhan Vong infiltrator, or at least someone the mouse droid claimed was a Yuzhan Vong. Mara asked the droid for a homing signal and followed it until she saw the person in question. A tall, rather broad female human, inconspicuously dressed, who wandered seemingly at random along the shopping galleries. Mara called the force into her mind, letting the lives of all the thousands of living beings in the concourse flood into her awareness. 
all the beings save one. Her target was a cold void in the Force, an emptiness that Mara had learned to associate with the Yuzhan Vong. Good work, Mousy, Mara said. Mara was plainly dressed, in worn robes such as a refugee might wear, with a hood that she could wear over her overly conspicuous red hair. She altered the hood with a floppy-brimmed hat in order to change her silhouette, and she carried a data pad through which she could issue commands to the mouse droid and also view what the droid was seeing. She followed the target at a distance and let the droid do most of the spying for her. The target wandered through the shopping concourse for twenty minutes or so, and then sat on a bench as if to take a rest. At this point, Mara managed to get the droid close and behind the bench, just in time to observe the target reach beneath the seat and peel off something that had been stuck there. Aha! Mara thought delightedly. This was better than getting an idiot's array at Sabak. The target lumbered to her feet and strolled down the concourse. Mara drifted after. The target paused a moment by a vending machine, then continued on. When Mara purchased a snack from the machine and looked behind her, she saw something stuck there with an adhesive. It was just the size of a bundle of credits. Mara decided to let the mouse droid follow the Yuzhan Vong, and to wait near the vending machine for whoever was scheduled to pick up his payment. She perched on a store windowsill and ate her snack, which was some kind of fried salted seaweed that tasted of iodine and was obviously intended for a moon calamari palate. Within an hour, the money was picked up by a Sulliston male, who used part of the cash immediately on a flashy new jacket purchased in one of the most exclusive boutiques in the arcade. The Sulliston then returned to work, which turned out to be in the building the Senate had requisitioned for its offices. Mara discovered that the Sulliston worked in the office of Senator Carl Pradgett, a member of the Security and Intelligence Council. Most interesting, Mara thought. She then caught up with the mouse droid, which had followed the suspected Yuzhan Vong infiltrator to an apartment building. Mara made a note of the address, and then called Idar Nili Kirka on her comm, and told him to buy as many of the mouse droids as Lando and Talon Card had available. YVHM-1 had proved its worth on its very first day. Cola Quist dropped out of the race for Chief of State following a ringing endorsement for Cal Omis, who had quietly promised him chairmanship of the Commerce Council, mid-level ministry jobs to several of his friends, and a branch office of the Kelmer Institute for Ryloth. On the next vote, Cal added enough votes to raise his percentage to 35. Not all of Quiss's supporters followed his lead, however, and Fior Rodan picked up another couple of percentage points and stayed in the lead with 37. Po held steady with three votes total. Tolum Ranth added enough to his total to raise his percentage to 22, which meant that the soft-spoken, exquisitely polite Gotal chairman of the Justice Council now controlled enough votes in the Senate to deliver the election either to Cal Omis or to Fior Rodan. Ranth was now being courted in earnest. Tons of refugee supplies were shipped to the planet's surface from the smuggler fleet overhead. The new military appropriations bill, with riders attached, involving the purchase of thousands of YVH droids, passed out of the Defense Council and onto the Senate floor. The Senate, urged by all three candidates to act quickly, passed the bill, with only a few token attempts at adding amendments to earmark funds for a particularly worthy planet or cause or brother-in-law. Mara found a second Yuzhan Vong infiltrator. She and a squad of mouse droids and Neely Kirka's agents began mapping the two infiltrators' contacts and associates. Primary residences and safe houses were located, and eavesdropping devices quietly inserted. Considering the alarming implications of everything she was discovering, Mara was having a strangely pleasant time. Every morning, I want every person in my command to ask himself the same question. And that question is, how could I hurt the Yuzhan Vong today? Admiral Trieste Crefe 
was visiting every ship in his command, first to conduct an inspection and then to address ship personnel. He was speaking from the enlisted mess of Starsider, a room large enough to contain all the fleet personnel who were stationed or passing through or barracked on the old dreadnought. Jaina, flanked by Kip and Lobaka, sat at a table on one edge of the room, watching the white-furred Bothan bound up and down on his speaker's platform. Crefe was in good spirits today, and his body language showed it. He bounced on the balls of his feet as he repeatedly punched the air to emphasize his points, and his fur continually peaked and smoothed with surges of emotion. And if you can't find a way to hurt the Vong, the Admiral continued, I want you to ask yourself this question. How can I help my own side grow stronger? At least it's leadership, Kip said, his murmur pitched to carry only to the ears of his fellow Jedi. It's not like we've seen a lot of leadership in this war. Maybe it's a little more leadership than we need, Jaina murmured in answer. Loey knew better than to say anything himself. His translator droid lacked discretion, and would probably shout the translation out at full volume. But he allowed himself a small moan of agreement. We're going to win the war of production, Crefe proclaimed. Our factories are building more starfighters, more capital ships, and more weapons than ever before. Our schools are turning out more pilots and other personnel. Within months, we'll have replaced all the terrible losses we've suffered so far in this war. Jaina thought of Anakin and Chewbacca, and Annie Capstan and others. The millions who'd lived on Cernpedal and Ithor. Unique, individual beings, alive and responsive to the other lives around them. Replaced? No one could replace any of them. That trip to Bathawi has changed the Admiral, Kip said. He used to be a lot less bouncy. The Bothans declared our cry and removed any necessity for moral responsibility, Jaina said. I imagine that could cheer a person up. We're going to smash the Vaughn, Crefe proclaimed. We're going to smash them every day. We're going to smash them until there are no more Yuzhan Vaughn. The room erupted in applause. Jaina and the other Jedi remained silent. After Crefe's speech had worked its way to a rousing conclusion, Jaina was stopped at the exit by one of the Admiral's aides. Major Solo, he said, the Admiral would like to see you. Crefe met Jaina in an office loaned him for the purpose by Starsider's captain. Crefe was still clearly exhilarated from his speech, still bouncing energetically on the balls of his feet. His vicinity smelled very strongly of excited Bothan. I saw you in the audience, and I thought I'd have Snade pull you in for a chat. Very good, sir. Which seemed a proper sort of thing for a bewildered officer to say. Chats with admirals were a rarity in her experience. Crefe's whiskered face beamed. Did you like the speech? Jaina answered truthfully. I thought it was the strongest speech I've heard in this war, sir. At least it said most of the right things. Crefe was impressed. Coming from Leia Organa's daughter, I'll take that as a very special compliment, indeed. My mother hasn't had many chances to make speeches lately, sir, Jaina said. Regrettably true. Crefe paused, his furred hand brushing the polished tabletop. I thought, he began, that I would send you to see your brother. Sir? Jaina was almost speechless with delight. She could see Jason, touch him, feel his mind floating toward her in the twin bond. Colonel Darklighter tells me that you've been in continuous action against the enemy for many months. You deserve a rest, but the war hasn't been able to spare you. But things have grown quiet with both sides reorganizing after Coruscant, and we can spare you now. So I'm going to send you on a furlough to Moon Calamari for two weeks. He drawled out the last words, then raised a finger and pointed at Jaina. But you're going on a special mission for me, understand? Jaina tried her best not to stare at him. No, sir, she said. I don't understand. You said that you needed more Jedi for your experiment in Force Meld to work. 
I want you to talk to your mother, to your Uncle Luke, and I want you to get me those Jedi. I want to put those Jedi in my ships and have them link through the Force in combat. He grinned. What do you think? I'll do my best, sir, but— Protests rose reluctantly into her mind. My squadron's been completely reorganized in the last month, sir. I have two brand-new pilots fresh out of flight school. Another four who've only been with us a few weeks. We haven't flown together long enough to— I need time, sir. I'm afraid my squadron can't spare me. Your number two can take over for a few weeks, Kreefe said. He's another Jedi, isn't he? The Wookiee? Yes, but he's busy with his team investigating Trickster. His team can do without him for a few hours every day. I want you on Moon Calamari finding Jedi for me. He smiled kindly, and getting some rest, of course. You've been working too hard, like all of us. He rose, and Jaina realized the audience was over. She stood and saluted. I'll have Snaid draw up your orders, Kreefe said. You are to leave tomorrow. Very good, sir. Soon she could see Jason. The next day, as she set out in her X-wing for Moon Calamari, Twin Sun's squadron soared past her, brilliant in the light of Kashi'ik's sun, and tipped their wings in salute before cutting in their engines and flashing away out of sight. She felt like a traitor for leaving them behind. The rookies needed much more training before they'd have a chance of surviving against the Yuzhan Vong, and she wouldn't be there to supervise it. What if one of them died because of something she hadn't been present to teach them? What if the whole squadron was led to disaster because of something she could have prevented? Jaina had every faith that Loi would do a good job as squadron commander, but it wasn't Loi's squadron. It was hers. Whatever happened to it, it was she who was responsible. Jaina sighed, settled into her molded seat, and began plotting the first of a long series of jumps that were calculated to avoid the dangerous parts of the wide Yuzhan Vong-occupied swath of worlds between Kashi'ik and Moon Calamari. She thought about seeing Jason again, and all her doubts faded. Welcome, Senator. Lando, smiling broadly, shook Fig Boris's hand and escorted him to an armchair. I'd like to express my admiration on the rapidity with which your committee dealt with the YVH amendment. A surprising number of my colleagues were in favor of the amendment, Boris said. An unsubtle number, perhaps. These days, Lando said, a person with tons of relief supplies can't help but make a lot of friends. You're giving away enough. The price of basic commodities has dropped enormously in the last few days. But surely that's a good thing, Senator, Lando said. No doubt. Boris gloomed. Lando and Card had so flooded the market with relief supplies that the Senator's illicit profits were barely keeping ahead of the costs of warehousing everything he was secretly offering for sale. Cheaters never prosper, Lando thought virtuously. I thought we might discuss the future of our relationship, Lando said, and seated himself adjacent to the senator. I hope you're not going to offer me more relief supplies. Lando steepled his fingertips and tried to ignore Boris's nose-tickling minty cologne. What I hoped, he said, was to discuss the next chief of state. I'm committed to Fjord Rodan, as you know. I was hoping to change your mind. That's not possible. Boris said shortly. I've made a definite commitment. I regret that extremely, because it's then possible that people may see this holovid. He touched the control of the room's hollow projector, and Boris watched with increasing petulance at the sight of himself in his first meeting with Lando. You can't release that, he snapped finally. If I'm guilty of taking a bribe, which I'm not, then you're guilty of offering one to release that hollow would be to put your own head into the noose. I would never claim that I bribed you, Lando said with indignation. I have never bribed anyone in my life. Then what's all this about? Boris snarled. I gave you the supplies to be given free to refugees, Lando said. 
That's very clear in the hollow. If it could be demonstrated that you were selling the supplies instead of giving them away, then that would be... Why, it would be illegal, wouldn't it? Boris stared at Lando with burning hatred in his eyes. Now, Lando said with a perfect white smile, about the next chief of state. The next three days saw an extraordinary number of defections from the camp of Fjord Rodan. Not just those who had allowed themselves to be bribed, but others whose activities had been revealed by a little of Talon Card's research. Those who stole fleet elements in order to make their escape from Coruscant, or who called for the fleet to escort them to safety while other naval units, deprived of support, stayed and died. There were those who had sprung criminals from custody on condition that the criminals help them escape the Yuzhan Vong. Others had taken massive bribes in order to take world-class criminals off-planet. There was one senator who had left his whole family behind in order to provide transport to a well-fed Coruscant plutocrat and his harem of mistresses. Some of these, the supporters for Rodan most counted on, were persuaded to announce publicly that they had changed their minds and intended to vote for Cal Omis. The following morning... Mara, now operating with a pair of YVHM mouse droids, picked up a Yuzhan Vong infiltrator at her place of residence and followed her through refugee-packed streets toward the edge of Herkia Floating City, where gracefully curved sea walls kept the green ocean rollers from sweeping right up the streets. The Yuzhan Vong wasn't interested in the view, but walked along the base of the seawall to a bubble-topped structure that projected out over the water. When the target entered, Mara remained outside and sent one of the mouse droids through the broad, open doorway. The structure proved to be a private marina, with boats and submersibles of various sizes moored in long rows of slips. The Yuzhan Vong spoke to a quarren who sat behind a desk near the entrance, and the quarren handed her what might have been a set of keys. The infiltrator then walked out onto one of the jetties. Mara left her second droid near the entrance and entered the marina herself. The salt and iodine scent of the sea was strong in the confined space. The Yuzhan Vong, she saw, was inspecting a submersible. Drawing the hood of her robe forward to partly mask her face from the Vong, Mara approached the Quarren. "'Do you rent submersibles here?' she asked. "'No,' the Quarren said. "'We rent berths to private vehicles only.' One of his facial tentacles pointed politely toward the door. If you want to rent submersibles, you can turn right at the entrance, then walk along the seawall to... Mara's comm unit chittered at her. Excuse me, she said, and stepped away from the desk, just as a large human male walked into the building. The new arrival blinked as his eyes adjusted to the relative darkness inside the covered marina, and during that time Mara read the information that her mouse droid was trying to tell her. The new arrival was another Yuzhan Vong. Mara's heart leapt. She turned her head away from the new arrival and tried to shrug into her hood. It wasn't as if Mara Jade Skywalker wasn't someone an enemy infiltrator might recognize at close range. But the infiltrator wasn't interested in her or in the Quarren. Without looking left or right, the Yuzhan Vong marched into the building, walked down the long jetty, and joined the first Vong. Frantically, Mara considered her options. For years, she had been the Emperor's hand. She had lived as a spy, infiltrator, and assassin, and she understood spy work well. Two Yuzhan Vong infiltrators meeting face to face violated every single principle of tradecraft. If the two needed to speak, they could do so by Villip with complete privacy. If Villips weren't available, they could use dead-letter drops, or, with precautions, simple comm units. There were three possible reasons why the two Yuzhan Vong were meeting face to face. They could be stupid. They could be overconfident. Or third, something was happening that was of such overwhelming importance that the Yuzhan Vong were forced to throw all caution to the winds and conduct the operation together. Mara knew which way she wanted to bet. The Yuzhan Vong had opened the cockpit of their submersible and were descending into it. Mara returned to the quarren at the desk. Are you sure you don't have any submersibles for rent? 
she asked, and made a gesture with one hand. Yes, the Corin said. We have submersibles for rent. I want a fast one, and I need it immediately. The Corin reached beneath the desk and produced a set of keys. Berth 5B, ma'am, it said. Thanks, Mara said, snatching the keys. The face tentacles waved goodbye. Have a nice voyage. The Yuzhan Vong were swinging their cockpit closed. Mara tried to avoid a dead run as she headed for berth 5B. Her submersible was a slim sport model, whose sleek lines showed the customary moon calamari attention to elegant design. The transparent cockpit seated two passengers, one behind the other, and the deep green paint job featured a scalloped pattern that suggested fish scales. Mara cast off the two mooring lines, then put a foot on the submersible and felt it bob under her. She keyed the lock, and the bubble canopy rolled aside with a hydraulic hiss. Mara vaulted easily into the pilot's seat and found the main power switch. She pressed it, and the instrument panel came to life. The instrument panel was simple compared to that found in a starfighter. Mara pulled away a drape of her cloak that had caught on the cockpit combing, then closed the canopy. Canopy locks clamped down to make the sub watertight. Ventilators whirred as they automatically switched on. Mara engaged the engine, and water jets hissed as Mara backed out of the slip. The Yuzhan Vong craft, she saw, was already moving through the seaward entrance of the marina and into the open sea. Mara kicked the rudder over and accelerated, shaving the stern of the nearest vessel by millimeters as she set out in pursuit. She zigzagged around the piers and dashed through the exit to see the first ocean wave break over the Vong's canopy as it began to descend. Mara steered after the vanishing craft and looked for the ballast tank controls. Air sputtered from vents as she began her descent. Piloting the submersible, she found, was like flying a starfighter, but in slow motion. It rolled and banked like any atmosphere craft, and, like any atmosphere craft, it flew better when it was in trim. The ballast tanks filled equally fore and aft, which meant she didn't have to be constantly fighting the dive planes to keep the boat at the right depth. Visibility was quite good, but good visibility in the water only extended a hundred meters or so. Fortunately, her displays kept her informed of other craft in the water. Radio-based detection systems were useless in the water, so submersibles featured a system based on sound. Rather than having every underwater craft pinging away all the time and confusing each other's sensors with overlapping noise, Herkia Floating City itself issued regular low-frequency sonar pulses that highlighted every craft in the vicinity for thirty kilometers or more. In order to detect the vessels around them, all the submersibles had to do was set their own sonar sets to passively receive the city's pulses. Mara had no trouble following her target, and doing it without calling attention to herself, though she did speed up at one point in order to make certain that the craft she was following was the right one. She crept up on its tail until she recognized the configuration of the cabin, then allowed her boat to drift back. Compared to her own, the Yuzhan Vong boat was a squat, broad, roomy vessel, with its two passengers sitting abreast of one another and she reckoned her own tube-shaped craft was much speedier. This and the usefulness of Herkia's city sonar allowed her to keep her distance from the Yuzhan Vong vessel, even to join other traffic patterns, in order to make it less obvious to the Vong they were being followed. The target vessel plodded on at a deliberate speed, descending to thirty-five meters and circling the floating city until it was almost directly opposite the marina from which it had started. At this depth, all color faded away to blue or gray, except for the occasional silver flash of a predator fish darting at the smaller fish attracted by the brightly lit windows of the residential areas. Below, the sea was a profound deep blue that seemed to stretch down forever, an azure vastness that seemed as limitless as empty space. The Yuzhan Vong boat checked its speed and began to hover. Mara slowed her own vessel, uncertain what she could do without giving herself away. If she began to hover herself, it might make the Yuzhan Vong suspicious, but so might tracking back and forth in their vicinity. 
Instead, she decided to pass within visual range of the target and see if she could make any sense of its actions. She dipped the dive planes to pass under the Vaughan craft and set the throttle to a slow rate of speed to give herself as much time in visual range as possible. Then she almost jumped out of her skin as she passed in front of one of the city's sonar emitters and felt the deep, low-frequency rumble as it shivered along her bones and caused her boat's small metal fittings to rattle. The squat form of the target submersible loomed up, silhouetted against the bright blue and silver of the ocean surface thirty-five meters above. The Vong boat had its stern to the open ocean, its bow toward the floating city, and it was simply hovering in place. Mara peered up at the boat, unable to see much of anything along its dark underside. But then, through the perfect acoustic medium of the water, she heard the hum of an electric motor, and with it, a brief scraping. The sounds repeated themselves. This time, as she gazed up at the Yuzhan Vong vessel, she caught a brief movement from the bows, a kind of dimple that appeared on its port bow, to match an identical dimple on the starboard side. And then... Her blood froze with horror at the realization of what she had just seen. The Vong boat had opened a pair of torpedo tubes. It was about to open fire on Herkia floating city. But why, she thought. Herkia was colossal. A pair of torpedoes couldn't possibly sink it. Mars had cranked to port, staring in consternation at the face of the city. At the series of clear windows that gave out onto the ocean deep, and there, silhouetted, she saw her answer, the tall, shaggy form of a Wookiee. Tribak. Tribak, gazing out of the sweating, transperisteel wall of Cal Omis's apartment. Cal, the chief of state candidate most likely to carry on the war against the Yuzhan Vong. And Tribak was soon joined by another lanky figure that Mara recognized at once. Cal Omis. Cal and Tribak continued to stand by the viewport. Mara realized they were holding drinks. Perhaps they had something to celebrate. The Yuzhan Vong boat swam into view dead ahead. Mara's boat had no weapons, no torpedoes of her own, but on the other hand her craft was a weapon. It weighed a metric ton or more, and it was moving fast, and if she couldn't sink her enemy by ramming, she might be able to disable it. Mara rolled her sub more or less upright and fed power to the water jets as she aimed her vessel at the enemy canopy, descending on the Yuzhan Vong craft from above its starboard quarter. If she could smash into the canopy, the enemy would probably be killed outright, and at any rate would drown. Pull up! Pull up! Collision alert! Pull up! Mara's nerves jumped as a roaring voice filled the cockpit, and her vessel's passive sonar went active with a series of high-pitched warning screeches aimed at alerting her target to its danger. The controls bucked in her hands as an autopilot seized control of the vessel. Grimly, she fought the controls as she tried to keep her craft aimed at the enemy, while her eyes scanned the controls for a switch to turn off the autopilot. Pull up. Collision alert. Pull up. Things happened too fast for Mara to locate the autopilot override. There was an impact, then a scraping sound as her submersible rolled over the enemy craft. Her boat slewed violently to port as her aft port dive plane caught on the Vong's dorsal rudder. Locked together, the two subs whirled around each other, then parted with a grinding shudder. Mara looked over her shoulder to see the Vong sub inverted and pitched nose down. Cavitation bubbles sprang from its jets as it tried to right itself. One of the Yuzhan Vong, thrown against the canopy by the impact, glared at her with his false human face, distorted by a furious rage. Mar sensed that Calomus and Tribak weren't running away. They were peering out the viewport, trying to make out what had just happened in the deep, distant blue of the water. Then the enemy faded into the darkness as Mara's boat sped away. Mara fought the controls to pull her boat around for another pass. Her port dive plane had deformed with the impact. She could hear the hiss and squelch of water as it passed roughly over the distorted surface, and feel the sideways slowing motion that the distortion imparted to her craft. Then suddenly she heard a whoosh and a frantic pinging, and her nerves keened with the knowledge that the Vong had just fired a torpedo. Her force sense told her 
that it was aimed at her, not at Calumus. She could sense the mass of the torpedo as it neared, and hear the increasingly fast Doppler-shifted chirps of its active sonar as it sped closer. Mara yanked the craft to port, hoping that the drag of the distorted port dive plane would assist her in making a tight turn. At the same time, she pushed out with the force, trying to shove a stream of water at the torpedo to push it off to the right. The torpedo sizzled past Mara less than two meters beyond the sub's starboard dive plane, and Mara felt herself brace against the power of the explosion that would come with the detonation of a proximity fuse. But the torpedo must have had a contact fuse that ignited only on impact, because the underwater missile sped on, its frantic sonar pings dopplering lower in pitch as it raced away. Mara gazed at her displays and discovered the Vaughn craft lumbering in a turn, trying to bring its second and last weapon to bear on Calomus. Mara fought the damaged dive plane, lifted the sub's nose, and straightened once she'd gained five meters of altitude above the enemy boat. She could see no way to disable the autopilot that would try to interfere with her ramming maneuver. Either it wasn't possible, or it required codes she didn't have. She would have to anticipate the autopilot's taking over this time, and take its interference into account as she held her course against the enemy. As she pushed the throttles forward, she realized that the fast pinging behind her had shifted, then began to pitch higher in volume. The torpedo had turned around and was coming at her again. The Vaughn craft loomed ahead, still turning to bring its torpedo to bear on the floating city. The pings behind Mara grew more frequent and higher in pitch. She pushed her throttle to maximum speed and dived down onto the enemy boat, water hissing through her jets. Dive! Collision alert! Dive! Collision alert! This time the autopilot was trying to pitch her downward to let her craft slip below the enemy. She fought the controls, trying to keep her machine on target. Dive! Dive! The pinging from astern beat faster than Mara's heart. Mara felt her sub shudder at the contradictory commands given the control surfaces, sensed the mass and speed of the torpedo approaching, and then she took her hands off the controls and let the autopilot take over. The damaged dive plane screwed the sub around to port as it dived beneath the swollen shadow of the enemy craft. Mara saw the looming shadow of the Yuzhan Vong sub's rudder dead ahead, cutting toward her cockpit like a huge knife. But the drag from the damaged dive plane pulled her out of the way with millimeters to spare. The torpedo was so close that Mara could hear its hiss as it shot through the water. And then the torpedo hit the Yuzhan Vong craft dead astern as Mara's boat slid underneath, and a great watery hand took Mara's sub and flung it spinning through the sea. Her hands and feet worked the controls as she tried to stabilize her craft, as she tried to gain her bearings in the giant white boil of the explosion. Mara managed finally to bring her craft to a hover. She was hanging upside down in the cockpit, one of her legs clamped hard on her seat, and the other braced under the instrument panel. With careful squirts of her maneuvering jets, she managed to roll her sub upright. To one side, she could see the wreckage of the shattered Yuzhan Vong craft spin downward into the blue depths below. The great mass of the floating city, on her other side, seemed intact. Trebok and Cal were gone from the viewport, and through the roiling sea she could barely make out the apartment's front door. Ajar. The two had fled finally figured out what those fast pings meant, eh, she thought. Well, better late than never. Luke, alerted once Mara got to the surface, stashed Cal Omis in their own apartment, which, with Jason still there, was getting a little crowded, but was at least above water and in a part of the city with better security. Lando shipped down a pair of YVH droids for safety's sake, and, out of the presumed goodness of his heart, offered security droids to the other candidates as well. Idar Neely Kirka managed to get Mara out of the trouble she was in for stealing a submersible and getting it damaged during the course of an underwater dogfight. Mara arrived at her apartment late in the evening to discover why Cal Omis and Trebak had been celebrating. On a vote held earlier that day, Cal had jumped into the lead with 46 percent, followed by Fjord Rodan with 24, and Talam Ranth with 20. 
Quo had actually gained a vote for a total of four. Suddenly, Talam's twenty percent isn't worth as much to him, Cal told Mara. I don't have to promise him much, because his supporters are going to defect in droves in the hope that I'll be grateful later. He looked puzzled. What I can't work out is how Fior's supporters turned out so wobbly. He glanced at Luke. You didn't somehow arrange this, did you? No, Luke said. Cal grinned. I didn't think Jedi mind control worked as well as that. I guess Fior supporters found out something about him that might be embarrassing if it got out, and decided to jump ship while they could. I didn't arrange it, Luke said, but I think I know who did. Mara gave him a sharp look. I'm not the only one who's been having adventures, she thought. Cal's grin faded. Should I know about this, he asked. Absolutely not, Luke said. But I wouldn't count on Fjord's defectors for anything more than getting you into office. My guess is they're good for one vote only. If I were you, I'd court Talam Ranth and as many of his people as you can, because you're going to need them later. Cal rubbed his chin. I'm not going to ask any more questions. You're an intelligent man, Luke said. You'll work it out without my help. By that point, Mara had worked it out herself. The next day, Talam Ranth released his followers to vote for Cal Omis, and Cal was elected with almost 85% of the vote. Fior Rodan and a few diehards refused to make the vote unanimous, and three loyalists still voted for Puo. Cal moved off Mara's sofa and to the suite reserved for the new chief of state at Herkia's poshest hotel, where he was ably guarded by a platoon of YVH droids. He began working on the acceptance speech he would have to give the Senate the next day. But before he began, he signed the order, creating the new Jedi Council, with Luke at its head. Chapter 18 Your candidate has been elected, Verger said over breakfast. Yes, Luke answered. Congratulations. Luke looked toward Mara, who was busy with the apartment's communit. It was more Mara's doing than mine. She kept Cal alive long enough to give his acceptance speech. Still, Verger said, you played a public role in his campaign. True. You realize that you and the Jedi will have to pay later for this political involvement. Luke nodded. I know. Just so you are prepared. Luke tasted his glass of blue milk with a wistful yearning for the fresh, more richly flavored variety he'd enjoyed on his Uncle Owen Lars's moisture farm. Mara rose from the comm unit, came to the table, and laid out several hollows that had been transmitted from the hidden Jedi installation in the maw. New images of Ben. Luke gazed at the hollows with his usual mixture of delight and longing. Infants developed so rapidly at Ben's age that... Luke could plainly see how the boy had grown and changed in the short time since he'd been sent to safety in the maw. He was walking now, with greater and greater confidence. He was speaking, too, though at the moment his vocabulary seemed to consist mainly of the word knee. At such moments, Luke's misery at Ben's absence outweighed his thankfulness that Ben was in a place of safety. Luke and Mara showed the hollows to Verger, who looked at them with quizzical eyes. A handsome human child, she said, as best as I understand these things. And strong in the force, Mara said. That's been clear from the beginning. Verger's crest sleeked back. Perhaps that is misfortune, she said. Luke stared at her in surprise. Verger, he said. You permit Jedi to marry, Verger said, and permit not only marriage but children. By your example, Luke Skywalker. Luke tried to contain his surprise. In your day, he said, Jedi were chosen as infants. They were raised knowing they wouldn't marry. But I had to recruit Jedi who were already grown, who had already established relationships. It is very dangerous, Verger said. What if Jedi were forced to choose between their duty and their family? Luke had made that choice more than once, and was comfortable with the necessity. 
Family makes a Jedi more of a whole person, he said. It makes them less than Jedi, Verger said. Her head swung toward Mara on the end of its long neck. And your child is strong in the Force. That is worse. Mara's green eyes glittered dangerously. And how is that, Verger? she asked. Your Ben is heir to more than your husband's name. He is Darth Vader's grandchild, Verger said. Three generations now of Skywalkers, all strong in the Force. This is a Jedi dynasty. Verger's head swung back toward Luke. Can't you see how governments will view this as a threat? Once it is possible for Jedi to leave their power to their children, the balance that exists between government and Jedi falls. Luke held up one of the hollows of Ben. This is a threat? In a universe with the Yuzhan Vong in it? Roger's crest sleeked back again, and she made a hissing noise that raised the hairs on the back of Luke's neck. He almost wanted to snatch the hollow of Ben from the danger. The door chime sounded. Through a gentle force projection coming from the other side, Luke knew that the visitor was Silgal, come to collect Verger for another healing tutorial. When Verger wasn't being debriefed by fleet intelligence, a process still ongoing, she had been perfectly amenable to spending time with Silgal, teaching the Moon Calamari healer the art of making herself small. Perhaps Silgal, too, would learn to heal with her tears, and then the two could pass the knowledge on to others. At the sound of the chime, Verger gazed stonily at Luke for a moment, then hopped off her chair. I must go, she said, but I beg you, young master, to think of this. She padded to the door and let herself out. Luke looked at Mara. What do we think, he asked. Mara reached for a knife. She began cutting up dried bofa fruit and adding it to a dried, crunchy form of moon calamari seaweed eaten by the locals. Maybe she's embittered over fifty years of loneliness, Mara said, but I call that an overreaction. Yes. Verger is too smart, too perceptive, too enigmatic. Her green eyes flashed. Too willing to torture young humans to get what she wants. I don't want her ever to get near Ben. Agreed, Luke said. I've checked the Jedi holocron. There was a Jedi named Verger fifty years ago, a former apprentice of a master, Thracia Cholim. Mara's knife made neat little paring motions. There would be, wouldn't there? If she was an infiltrator. It's awfully roundabout to infiltrate the Jedi by way of the Yuzhan Vong. Mara put down her knife. Maybe she was a Jedi. The question is, after fifty years with the Vong, what is she now? Luke had no answer. She doesn't feel dark, he said. She doesn't feel anything. She's practically invisible. We only sense what she wants us to sense. Are you going to play spy today? Neely Kirk can handle the enemy networks on his own today, if you have another idea. Do you? I have a Jedi Council to put together, Luke said. I thought you might help me. Mara smiled. We get to spend the day gossiping about our colleagues and calling it work? I'm willing. He leaned over and kissed her cheek. I knew I could count on you, he said. Ruined. Ruined. Warmaster Sabongla gazed in revulsion over the square of sacrifice, where the great formations of Yuzhan Vong, each in formal robes, had been assembled to witness the painful, extended death of more than a hundred captives, all for the glory of Yun Yuzhan, whose great temple was being dedicated on this day. Many of the captives were of high rank, military officers or senators captured in the battle for Yuzhan Tar. Their lives had been carefully preserved just for this moment. They had been strapped to their execution beds, and the priests stood by with their flesh-eating beetles and their flaying knives. The symphony of the captives' screams would have risen for many hours to the delighted ears of the god. But instead, it was ruined. 
While Supreme Overlord Shimra stood on the steps of the temple, the high priest of Yun Yuzhan had gone into his extended blessing, hands raised over the thousands assembled to watch the work. And then a pestilential odor swept over the assembly, and the squares of formed Yuzhan Vang began to eddy as something crept among them. The square was being flooded by a noxious liquid, something spewed up from beneath ground level. The muck spread through the crowd, but the Yuzhan Vong were disciplined and remained in their ranks, plucking up the hems of their cloaks to keep them out of the ooze. The rank fluid was composed of every kind of waste. Below ground level lived the Ma Lur, who digested the sewage produced by the growing city. But apparently something had upset their omnivorous stomachs, and they were regurgitating onto the square. The high priest's voice hesitated, resumed, hesitated again. He wheezed as a gust of wind brought a wave of stench to his nostrils. The high priest managed to renew his prayers, but Shimra's booming voice cut him short. The sacrifice is spoiled. Dismiss the onlookers and kill the captives. The high priest turned to face the supreme overlord. Are you certain, dread one? Shimmer gave a savage laugh. Unless you think that sewage is deep enough to drown our victims in. The high priest looked out over the flooded square. I don't believe so, Supreme One. Then order your people to kill the captives. Shimmer turned on his heel to enter the temple. The rest of you follow me. Savangla followed his overlord into the shadowed green and purple depths of the temple, where the air smelled properly of heavy organics. Shimra seemed more thoughtful than angry, which Savangla thought was not a good sign. It might mean the rage would burst out later, and in an unpredictable direction. At least the Dread One wasn't accompanied today by his shadow Nimi, as the presence of a shamed one at a sacrifice this grand would have been an insult to the gods. Another failure, Shimmer growled. Another public failure, witnessed again by thousands of our people, and by our chief god. Treachery, Supreme One, someone called. Sabotage by this so-called underground. Or by heretics, said a priest, loyal to his leader, Jakan. I have six remaining voxen, dreadlord, Savangla said. Let me take one or two out. And if there are Jedi involved in this business, the Voxen will find them and tear them. Shimmer looked left and right. His burning eyes turned yellow, then red as they settled on Numanor. You have received no reports of underground activity? he demanded. Savangla rejoiced at Shimmer, turning to Numanor with this question. After Numanor's attempt to brand him with the catastrophe of Ruger, any discomfort in Numanor could only be to Savangla's delight. No reports, Supreme One, Numanor said. Numanor almost wilted beneath the fierce glare of Shimra's macaquet implants. But Shimra again chose to withhold his anger, and his savage look again turned thoughtful. We know the world brain has been contaminated by that fool Chagong Hool. Shimmer said. Could this be another manifestation of the Shaper's incompetence? No one dared to either confirm or deny this supposition. It's almost as if the world brain has developed a nasty sense of humor, Shimmer said thoughtfully. Onimi won't care for that. He much prefers being the only one permitted to make jokes. No one commented on that either. The Supreme Overlord turned to one of his assistants. Find a shaper to die for this. I will, Supreme One. Numanor seemed to sag with relief once he realized that the shaper class was going to get the blame for the botched sacrifice. Savangla snarled at him. Next time, filth, he thought. Shimra's glowing, restless eyes swept again over the company, then settled on Savongla. The war master straightened, then bowed from the waist, keeping his back rigid. Dread Lord, he said, your forces eliminated an enemy cruiser at small cost to themselves. Vengeance for Kamkash, though a small one. 
Salong La took a grip on his courage. With your permission, Supreme One, I will exact vengeance in full. Give me permission to take the fleet and— No, War Master. Give me a decisive battle, Supreme One. Let the infidel's blood fill the spaces between the stars. The words sprayed from the War Master's slashed lips. Be silent. Savang La threw himself to the ground before the Supreme Overlord's feet. I obey, he said. There was a moment of awful emptiness in which Savang La contemplated his own immediate death. Then the silence was broken by an unexpected voice. With respect, Supreme One, Nomanor said, I agree that a decisive battle must be fought, and soon. Astonishment filled Savang La's soul, followed immediately by suspicion. Nomanor couldn't be agreeing with Savang La out of sympathy for his position. This had to be some plot, some devious scheme by the executor to discredit him. To Savang La's surprise, Shimmer restrained his anger. Your reasons, executor? he asked. We aren't growing any stronger, Supreme One, Nomanor said. As soon as our auxiliaries are in place, and the fleet is at full strength, we must seek to bring about a decisive engagement that will win the war. Mockery entered Shimra's tones. I thought the Battle of Jujantar was supposed to be the decisive engagement that would win the war. Nomanor hesitated. The infidels have proved more adaptable than we suspected. Savang La stepped in. We shouldn't waste our strength on an offensive for its own sake. If we choose the right moment, however, the right target, if we can catch their forces at a disadvantage, then we can smash them beyond recovery. The mockery continued. How can we choose such a time, such a target? We must depend on accurate intelligence of the enemy, Supreme One, Nomanor said. Shimra laughed. On you, then? All hail, Nomanor. This victory depends on you, who has just lost a pair of valuable agents in a bungled assassination. Nomanor wisely chose not to rise to the mockery. Assassination is always a risky business, Supreme One. Agents may be risked in this way, but no chances should be taken with the fleet. Very well, then. Shimra hesitated. Rise, War Master. Samong La got to his feet, his clawed Vuasa foot scrabbling for traction on the chitinous temple floor. He looked at Nomanor and tried to mask his resentment. Shimra looked from one to the other. War Master, you will have your decisive battle after the fleet is ready, but you will not launch the battle blindly. You will wait for Nomanor's spies to report that the time is ripe, and my own permission will be required. Do you understand? Completely, Supreme One. Savong La bowed in submission. A smile twisted across Shimra's features. It seems that the two of you are bound together once again. The fate of one will depend entirely on the fate of the other. If success comes to one, it will come to both. But if one fails... He left the thought unfinished. Savong La straightened and looked at the executor, who he found looking back at him. Savong La let a smile spread across his slashed lips. At least if I fall, he thought at him, I may rejoice in the thought that you will not long survive me. Though it was not comfortable to think that Nomanor was probably thinking the very same thing. I want Sildal, Luke said. I want a healer. The fact that she's an ambassador is a bonus. He and Mara were in their apartment trying to choose five Jedi to serve with Luke on the new Jedi Council. In the background, a live hollow of Cal Omis was giving his acceptance speech before the Senate. With sorrow for our countless dead, but with hope for the future, Cal was saying. With sadness for the many who have fallen, but with confidence in the many who have taken their place. Silgal, Mara said, very well. 
Luke looked at her. Who I really want, he said, is you. Mara's green eyes sparkled. I'm always flattered to hear that. For the council, I mean, Luke said, as of course in every other way. But a Jedi master can't appoint his wife to government jobs without people disapproving. You'll get my advice anyway, Mara said. You won't be able to avoid it. She looked at the list they'd compiled. Who's next? How about Kent Hamner? He has the contacts and the knowledge. Mara nodded and entered the name on her data pad. Hamner's in them. She looked up. Cam Solisar? Or Tion? It would be good to have someone representing the Jedi Academy. Put them down as maybes. If we weren't at war, I'd put one of them on the council for certain, but right now we may need a council oriented more toward action. Then why Silgal? Luke looked at her. Healing is important. Mara held his gaze, then nodded. Of course. Saba Sebatin. She commands an all-Jedi squadron and brings all the Barabels on board. She's proved herself many times over, and it's time she had a higher profile. Saba hadn't been trained at the Jedi Academy, but on Barab won by the Jedi Master Elissa. Saba, in turn, had recruited and trained a whole pack of her fellow Barabels, most of whom formed her Wild Knights Squadron. You've thought about this pretty thoroughly, haven't you? Mara said. I do my best. She gave a sly smile. Maybe Cal is right. You are turning into a politician. Luke affected horror and made a warding gesture. Mara laughed. My only objection is that Saba is a knight, she said, not a master. Knights should have some representation on the council, too. Mara looked at her data pad. Saba's representing a lot of people. Knights, Barabels, and an all-Jedi squadron. Then it's all the more important that she have a seat. With compassion for the millions of our dispossessed, Cal's Hollow was saying, with firmness in the rightness of our cause. Mara shrugged and made a mark by Saba's name. Streen, she suggested. A maybe. Tracina Lobi? She'd be good. From the hollow came Cal's voice. I accept the Senate's nomination to be Chief of State of the New Republic. Roars followed and applause. That was a good speech, Mara said. It was. Luke glanced thoughtfully at the hollow Cal, listening respectfully to the Senate's applause. You know, I'm beginning to have a lot of sympathy for Cal. He's got to fill seats not only on the Jedi Council, but in all the government departments as well. He has more practice at this sort of thing than we do. Let's hope so. Luke glanced at Mara's data pad and the list of names. Let's add one more, my most controversial nominee. Mara turned her eyes to him in rising horror. Not Kip Duran. Luke returned her gaze, then gave a deliberate nod. For what it's worth, he said, I think that Kip's actions at Hapes and Borlias show that he's a much more stable person than he was. He seems to have made peace with himself. Remember, he renounced pride on Ithor, and since then he voluntarily put himself under Jaina's command. He's always supported the idea of a Jedi Council. You're setting yourself up for a lot of grief. Wouldn't it be more grievous to have a Kip running around loose where the Council can't control him? Luke said. Remember, he's only one vote. If he takes an independent line, he'll be outvoted by the rest, and then he'll be obliged to support the majority. I think you have a very generous idea of Kip's sense of obligation. Plus, Mara considered, how do you know he'll be outvoted? There are going to be six non-Jedi on the Council now. What if Kip's arguments make sense to them? If Kip's arguments make sense to half a dozen political appointees, then I'd better pay more attention to those arguments than I have been. Mara gave him a skeptical look. I think you're going to regret this. Luke shrugged. I may. I probably will. 
But if a person in authority talks only to those who agree with him, he soon finds himself out of authority. Mara sighed. You are a politician, she said. Luke presented his nominees for the Jedi Council to Cal Omas the next morning. Cal leaned back in his office chair. The office smelled of fresh paint and newly laid carpet, looked at the list, and gave Luke a skeptical look. Kip Duran, he said. Kip has changed, Luke said. He hasn't blown up any planets in a few years, that's true. That wasn't precisely Kip who did that, Luke said. He was possessed by the spirit of a long-dead Sith Lord named Exar Kun. Cal shook his head, and when he spoke his voice had a mournful air. That's exactly the sort of thing I hope never to have to explain to a senatorial committee, he said. Luke looked at Cal in concern. Should I withdraw the nomination? I don't want to wreck our chances of re-establishing the Jedi Council. Cal considered, then shook his head. No, he said. I understand why you did it. It's best to have the opposition inside the tent where you can keep an eye on them. That's why I'm putting some of Thalia's old faction on the advisory council, and Fjord Rodan, if you'll agree. He looked at Luke. And you? Surprise rose in Luke. Are you sure? he asked. Don't you think Leia would be better? Maybe. But Leia hasn't returned from Bastion, and you're here. Luke smiled. You're going to keep me so busy running to meetings that I'm not going to have time for anything else. Would that be a bad thing? Cal asked. Does the head of the Jedi Order need to be blowing up Death Stars and engaging in lightsaber fights at his age? Luke smiled. I haven't blown up a Death Star in ages. That's what your young folks are for, Cal said. If you put me back in a starfighter, I'd feel like an idiot. I doubt that very much, Luke said. Maybe I exaggerate. Cal smiled. I'm appointing myself to the Jedi Council, by the way. I had hoped you would. And Tribak, a senatorial representative. The Senate will need to confirm that, but I don't think we'll have any trouble. Diff Scour, the chief of intelligence. Someone from the Justice Council. I haven't worked out just who as yet. Reliki Akla, who will also head the Ministry of State. Her uncle was a Jedi, I know. You don't have any of Thalia's people, or Fjord Rodan's? I know, Cal smiled. They'll have to be satisfied with seats on the Advisory Council, won't they? You haven't mentioned the Sixth. Sin Sov, as head of the military. He looked troubled. If I decide to retain him. He offered me his resignation practically the second I finished my acceptance speech. Luke gave Cal a serious look. You need to call on Akbar. Cal looked curious. To be Supreme Commander? No. But you need to talk to him. He has a plan to deal with the Yuzhan Vong. I'll talk to him very soon, Cal. Luke warned. You know how good he is. Cal nodded again. Fine. Soon. The voice of Cal's comm droid came from the speakers on his desk. Senator Rodan is here for his appointment. Cal rose. I shouldn't keep Fjord waiting. He escorted Luke to the door, allowing the Jedi Master to precede him into the outer office. Fjord Rodan stood there, wearing a stainless gray suit and a cold demeanor. Luke gave him a polite nod, but Rodan only returned to glare. "'I see you have the compliant chief of state required by your plans,' he said. "'I don't believe you ever asked me my plans,' Luke said. "'You only assumed you knew them.' "'You interfered,' Rodan said. "'You and your wife did something to my supporters.' "'We did nothing of the sort,' Luke said. "'Then it was your pirate friends. Do you deny that?' I deny that I have pirate friends, Luke said mildly, and I have no idea what my other friends may have done, if anything. Jedi virtue, Rodan said. You remain stainless while your friends do the dirty work. I couldn't help but notice that your friends' droids are guarding the chief of state whom they created. The YVH droids in the corridor belong to the government, Calomus said. 
You voted for the appropriation yourself, Fjord. Fjord Rodan turned his scornful eye toward Cal. I thought you had more pride than to sell yourself to a bunch of renegades and their witch-doctor accomplices, he said. I refuse to have anything to do with supporting the illusion that your government is anything but illegitimate. I'll thank you to keep my name off any list of appointees. He turned stiff-spined and marched out. Luke and Cal looked at each other. Stickier than I thought, Cal said. Chapter 19 Jason spent his first day of freedom in the apartment, marveling at its strange solidity. The scratch of the carpet against his bare feet, air that didn't taste like a rich stew of organics, walls that were vertical and a ceiling that was a flat plane above his head, hollows on shelves, popular music that bounced its rhythms from hidden speakers, a kitchen full of wondrous, gleaming appliances, a refrigeration unit full of food designed for the human palate. Furniture. The Yuzhan Vong didn't have furniture the same way that people did. It wasn't crafted or assembled. It was sprouted. And their sense of scale was different. The way they placed it in one of their rooms with its resinous floors and walls of coral or stabilized protein. Jason had said farewell to furniture, to hollows and kitchen equipment and refrigeration units and to everything else that was human. Finding it again was a rediscovery. Messages appeared on the comm unit. Way to go, Sprout. And, once again, Jason, you have answered a mother's prayers. The messages gave him a singing joy that stayed with him for the rest of the day. That evening his Aunt Mara tactfully hinted that he might buy some clothes, so the next morning he set off to do some shopping. He borrowed some of Uncle Luke's clothes and threw a cloak over everything, but people recognized him anyway. His face had been everywhere in the holocausts. Many were friendly, many curious, and only a few turned away with angry glares or muttered asides. The Jedi, it seemed, were more popular than they had been. He bought clothing from a quarantailer, tailor, who assured him that the drape was perfect and in the mode, at least for humans. Afterward, he wandered the city, enjoying the elegant architecture beneath the vivid blue sky, and tried to ignore the fact that wherever he went, he was the center of attention. Later, from the apartment, he tried to contact Verger, but was told she wasn't allowed calls. He spoke to Luke about it, but Luke only said, You're on vacation, and that includes being on vacation from Verger. Then Luke invited Jason to sit by him. I'd like to hear your ideas on the Yuzhan Vong, he said. Verger would be the one to ask, Jason said. I have asked her, but I'd like to ask you. Their immunity to the Force aside, are the Yuzhan Vong so very different from us? Jason considered. No. They have a tyrannical government, and their religion is absolute poison. But they're no better or worse than humans would be if we were raised in their system. Luke looked at him. Do you hate them? he asked. No. Jason's answer was swift and very certain. Why not? This time Jason had to think. Because, he said finally, it would be like hating a child for being raised badly. It's not the child's fault. It's the parents. I could hate the leaders who made the Yuzhan Vong what they are, but they're long dead, so why waste energy and hatred? Luke rose and put a hand on Jason's shoulder. Thank you, Jason, he said. I understand them, Jason said. Luke seemed startled, his mind inward. "'You do not hate because you understand,' he murmured. "'Sorry?' Luke's attention snapped back to Jason. "'No, go on.' "'I was implanted with a slave seed, remember, and it interfaced with my nervous system. It was supposed to be a one-way communication link to enslave me and give me my orders, but I discovered that it worked the other way. It's produced a kind of telepathy. I can extend my mind into the Yuzhan Vong and into their creatures, and sometimes I can influence them. Luke looked at him in surprise. You can touch the Yuzhan Vong with the Force? No. 
It's different. I can't use the Force and my... my Vong sense at the same time. Luke's eyes narrowed in thought. Can you teach this? Jason had been wondering this himself. I don't know, he said. I don't think so. I think perhaps you need to be implanted with a slave seed, or some other form of Yuzhan Vong control that can interface with your nervous system. A thought struck him. I might be able to teach Tahiri. After what they put her through, it's possible that she might still be attuned enough to the Yuzhan Vong to learn to do as I've done. Luke frowned. Tahiri found her experience at the hands of the Vong to be highly traumatic, and she's had some traumatic experiences since. I wouldn't want to force her to revisit an experience that damaged her. Nor would I. Jason didn't tell Luke about one of the consequences of what he'd just called his Vong sense. The fact that he was still in occasional mental contact with the entity whom the Yuzhan Vong called the World Brain, the Duryam who controlled the environment of Coruscant. He and the Duryam were conspiring against the planet's world shaping, sabotaging it in minor but annoying ways, through the creation of an itching plague, for instance. Jason had just inspired the World Brain to cause a sickness in the Maulur the creatures who recycled Yuzhan Vong waste, during what the Duryam sensed was an important occasion or ceremony. Though Jason could theoretically inspire the world brain to more deadly action, from poisoning Yuzhan Vong food to causing an ecological catastrophe, he had refrained. His empathy with the Yuzhan Vong had grown along with his Vong sense. He would not be a mass murderer, not even of a deadly enemy. In part, that was why he hadn't told Luke of this particular ability. He didn't want his ability known for fear that someone would want him to use it as a weapon, though he realized that Luke would never ask such a thing of him. He felt that the more private he kept this secret, the better. The conversation with Luke was interrupted when a hollow journalist calmed, asking for an interview. Jason told the comm unit to refuse anyone it didn't already know was a friend. The following morning, Jason felt delicate, ate a bland breakfast, and returned to his bed. Luke left to do political things, and Mara went off to play counter-spy with her mouse droids. He was awakened by a call on the comm, which meant that the comm's artificial intelligence recognized the caller as family or a friend. He answered and stared into a pair of green eyes framed by curling blonde hair. Danny Quee. Hello, Danny. Jason, I hope it's all right to call. I'm not sick or in quarantine or anything. I'm allowed to talk to people. That's good. Would you like to see a bit of the city? Or are you being besieged by friends? I'm not besieged by friends, Jason said. I guess because they're as tactful as you are. But I'd just as soon not go anywhere public because I seem to attract crowds. She grinned, teeth white against her tanned face. I saw you on the Hollow News yesterday. Was that cloak supposed to be a disguise? Not exactly. If you're not ready to face your public, then why don't I get a hovercraft and take you out to Mester Reef? Sure. Twenty minutes later, Jason met Danny at a public pier. Nice clothes, she remarked, and gave him a hug. Soon they were on a craft racing west on its repulsor lifts, ten meters above the water. Danny had provided diving equipment for two, as well as a light lunch. Fast work, Jason said. I was going to go anyway. If I hadn't reached you, I would have gone with another friend. He looked at her. Anyone I know? Thespar Trode. She's another unemployed astrophysicist. You're not employed these days? Danny gave a wry grin. We'll talk about that later. Mr. Reef was in such tropical waters that no insulation suits were necessary, but Jason and Danny wore them anyway to minimize abrasions. The air supply was a light unit, worn on the back that silently extracted air from the water and fed it to the diver, and was limited only by its power supply, which was good for about fifty years. There was a vest that could be inflated or deflated to adjust for buoyancy, with pockets for weights to make sure the diver didn't pop back to the surface. 
Annie held a pair of swim fins. Old-fashioned transportation, she said. I could have brought some drive units to speed us along under the water, but I think they're a distraction. It's better if it's just you and the reef and the ocean. Fine with me, Jason said. It's not like we're in a hurry to go anywhere. The water was like a warm salt bath. Adjusting to the breathing apparatus felt natural, and was easier than using a pressure suit. The inflatable vest was a little more difficult, and Jason found himself sinking or bobbing toward the surface until he managed to equalize his buoyancy properly. Once he adjusted to the experience, he found he could think himself higher or lower. And he didn't need the force for it either, just a kind of relaxation. A current ran along the reef here, and he and Danny simply drifted along. The water that leaked past the mouthpiece tasted of salt and iodine and a thousand living things. Above was the rippled sunlight of the ocean surface. To one side the vivid colors of the reef, on the other side the boundless ocean, and below the profound blue of the ocean deeps, clear and seeming to go down forever. They didn't dive below twenty meters or so, because below that depth the light faded away badly, and they wanted to see the brightness of the coral. The coral formations, the anemones and the sponges, were ablaze with brilliant color, and the fish and other animals were as incandescent as the coral through which they swam. There were hierarchies here. The coral rose like great ramparts of a castle, occasionally breaking toward the surface in towers. Living things attached themselves to the coral, or sheltered inside its convolutions, or imitated the coral with its colors, its seeming quiescence, and its stinging spines. Reef fish hunted these, searching among the coral for their dinners and sometimes being engulfed and digested by a cunningly camouflaged predator, while torpedo-shaped pelagic fish from the deep water ate the reef fish, darting in from the open ocean to strike, kill, and devour coming from a place far beyond the comprehension of the reef fish, like pirates from another world. And everything on the reef was alive. The coral, the sponges, the fish, the crustaceans, and anemones, all were living things. Even the seemingly empty ocean was filled with microscopic life. That was the true wonder of it. Jason summoned his force sense and let the song of the reef enter him all the tiny creatures living together in a complex, interconnected pattern, basking for a moment in the sheer glory of it. This was such a glorious change from the Yuzhan Vong environment. There everything lived as well, but all was alien, strange, and full of sinister purpose. It was like living in a void. Here the reef and its life practically shouted at him through the force. Jason extended his force sense toward Danny. She was force sensitive, but her training had been unsystematic, scattered into spare moments between battles and obsessive research. He sensed her startled surprise at the first touch of his mind, but she then relaxed, and he let the reef's existence flow into her, the great vital accumulation of all the tiny lives, and the two floated along the reef in silent communion, absorbed in the reef's complexity and abundance. Eventually they grew chilled, even through their insulation suits, so he and Danny rose to the surface, and Danny triggered the transponder that would bring her hovercraft flying toward them. It settled into the water five meters away and lowered its ladder so they could climb aboard. They took off their dive suits and let the sun warm them as they ate their lunch. And then, while digesting, they simply relaxed, stretched out side by side on the foredeck. You said you weren't working, Jason asked. No, I was working for the Jedi until my unit began to achieve results, and then we were co-opted by the government. And then, after we reached a certain stage, we were... Well, we weren't disbanded, but some of my team was taken away. I'm taking some training in communications and infiltration so that I can help set up resistance cells, and then I'll get back in the war. Jason rolled on his side to look at her. "'But you've done such crucial work,' he said. "'You discovered how to jam the Yamisk signal. "'That's the single critical discovery that's enabled our ships to survive battle with the Yuzhan Vong. 
Why would they disband your group now? She turned her green eyes to his. Astrophysicists aren't important for war work, she said. I made the initial discovery about how Yamisks communicate, yes. But now that the discovery's been made, it isn't a theoretical problem anymore. It's an engineering one. Now it's up to the engineers to build jammers and spoofers and try to work out more and more ingenious ways to foul up enemy communications. All the theoretical work has been quietly shunted aside. She sighed. I was working so hard and for so long. Nothing has ever been so thoroughly studied in such a short time as the Yuzhan Vong. What Silgal and I did alone could have won us half a dozen major scientific prizes. But our work is secret, so the prize communities will never find out. And as far as anyone knows, I'm just a twenty-three-year-old stargazer without a job and with no hope of finding one. She stretched languidly and looked at the brilliant sky. A strange look came onto her face, and she sat up, crossing her legs and leaning toward Jason. Not all the theoretical work has been pushed aside. Did I mention that? There's some still going on, and it's kind of strange. Jason blinked up at her. Tell me. We had some people in our group who were working on the details of Yuzhan Vong bioscience. They made a discovery, and right away were pulled away into a new unit in the Intelligence Division. They're working directly under a group of Chiss, who report directly to Diff Scour. Scour's working with Chiss? Jason was surprised. They're all off-planet now. None of my messages to my friends get through. I just get messages saying they're temporarily off the holonet. All at the proverbial secret laboratory off in deep space, Jason muttered. And why the chiss? And you say you're working on Yuzhan Vong bioscience. Jason pondered for a moment, then shook his head. The problem is we don't know enough about the chiss to know why they'd be valuable. We don't even know where their home planet is. Maybe their bioscience is ahead of ours. Maybe they know something about the Yuzhan Vong that we don't. Maybe their own weird metabolism gives them an insight into what the Yuzhan Vong can do. Weird metabolism? They're blue. That's a clue right there. Danny laughed. Jason looked at her. Do you know the nature of the discovery the bioscientists made? She nodded. It had to do with Yuzhan Vong genetics, which are generally like ours, by the way. Jason blinked. That's pretty odd, considering they're from another galaxy. There's one bit of their genetics that isn't like us, Danny said. There's a sequence that seems completely unique, and it's common to all Yuzhan Vong life. You're a coral Yamisks plant life, the Yuzhan Vong themselves. All of it. Is that what makes us unable to see them in the Force? Danny shrugged. Maybe. The geneticists didn't know or anyway they didn't when I last saw them. Silence fell. Jason gave a reluctant grin. We probably shouldn't even be talking like this, he said. Whatever Scour is doing with the Chiss, it's probably so deeply secret and off the map that our speculations are going to both be wrong and get us in trouble. Even speculating here? It wouldn't surprise me if I'm under some kind of casual observation, Jason said. I just came back from weeks of imprisonment at the hands of the Yuzhan Vong. Intelligence can't be sure I haven't switched sides. He looked up at the sky and gave a wave. Say hi to the satellites. Danny laughed and waved at any invisible observers, then turned back to Jason. That's enough danger for today, she said. I think I feel safer underwater. Me too. Danny and Jason flew in their craft a few kilometers farther down the reef and put on their equipment again. As soon as they descended to the reef, Jason drew again on his force awareness and let the life of the reef fill his spirit. He reached out again to Danny, and the two shared the swarming, intricate existence of the reef until it was time to return to Herkia. The next day, Jason went to the reef again with Danny, this time with her friend Thespar Trode, a female Ishitib, whose dive gear had been adapted to her giant head and eyes that thrust out on stalks. 
The two astrophysicists' conversation tended to be technical, but Jason didn't mind. He enjoyed the display of agile intelligence, even though he didn't understand it. And while he listened, he let his force sense descend to the reef and fill his mind with living glory. After the dive, he invited Thespar and Danny to the apartment for snacks, but when he opened the door, he saw Jaina standing in the front room, still in her pilot's coveralls, her military duffel partly opened on the floor. He and Jaina stared at each other for a long moment of exquisitely painful joy, and then their twin bond flared with a thousand shared emotions and memories, the rich harvest of lives shared since their first day in their mother's womb, and they rushed into an embrace. They pounded each other on the back and laughed until the tears came. Family was another thing that Jason had surrendered to the Yuzhan Vong. The sensation of finding his twin again took his breath away. When he found it, he looked at the insignia on Jaina's coveralls. You're a major now? I'm better than that. I'm a Holovid star, not to mention a goddess. Her eyes shifted to the two visitors standing near the door. She knew Danny Kui, of course, but had to be introduced to Danny's friend, Thespar. I have to change now and run, Jaina said. I've got dispatches to deliver to headquarters. She gave Jason a look, and I've got a personal message from Admiral Kreefe to Uncle Luke. He wants Jedi. Jason was pleasantly surprised. At least someone wants us. She took a more formal uniform out of her duffel, disappeared into a bedroom to change, and then returned only to head for the door. We'll talk later, right? She said, as she paused on the threshold. I want to hear everything. And then she was gone. Jason gazed at the closing door in surprise, as his mind tingled with the sensation of the fading twin bond. He had expected more from his first meeting with his sister, much more. She wasn't avoiding him, Jason thought. Not exactly. But she definitely needed some time to get her thoughts together before she could face him. He thought he knew why. Jason shared with his guests some jewel fruit he found in the refrigeration unit, and then the two astrophysicists said their goodbyes. Luke and Mara returned before Jaina did. When Jaina finally arrived, she was taut and high-strung, her neck and shoulder muscles rigid with tension. First, she delivered Kreefe's request for more Jedi pilots to Luke, who was pleased to hear that someone in the military was willing to take Jedi. He asked about Jaina's action at Obroa Sky, and from there gently drew her into a discussion of her activities since the fall of Coruscant. Particularly, the battles at Hapes, and the way she'd used the Yuzhan Vong's own Dovin basils against them, to sow confusion and destroy the invaders. And her state of mind at the time, the obsession, the fury, the darkness. Jaina looked at Jason with bleak eyes and said, I thought you were dead. You and Anakin both. It didn't matter to me how many others were sent to join you. I was ready to go myself. It was easier, Jason thought, for Jaina to speak to Luke and Mara than it would have been to speak to him alone. Luke had known that. More than through anger or lust for power, Luke said, the dark enters through despair through the belief that, in the end, there is nothing but pain and sorrow and death, and that nothing we do truly matters. He gave Jaina a look. I'm here to tell you that we do matter, and that despair is an illusion that the dark casts before our eyes. Jaina lowered her eyes. Thank you, Uncle Luke, she said. Jaina and her duffel moved in to share Jason's room. He wanted to talk to her before sleep, but she said she was exhausted from her long journey from Kashiik. She'd talk to him in the morning. Jason fell asleep at once and dreamed of the coral reef. He was awakened two hours before dawn with the arrival of his parents. Half awake, he stood in the door while his father howled his happiness like a wookie, picked Jason off the floor and whirled him around as if he were a two-year-old. Leia's emotion was less demonstrative, but no less powerful, and Jason felt it through the force, even as his father twirled him through the air. When Jason found his feet again, he embraced his mother, 
and he sensed the force of Leia's profound thankfulness. It was she whose faith had never faltered, he knew. Her husband had deserted her and returned a changed man. The new republic she had created had betrayed itself. One of her three children had been killed, another torn away into captivity, and she had watched the third slide toward the dark side. Leia alone held firm. Leia alone insisted that Jason was alive. And now Jason stood within the circle of his mother's arms, and let her know that her faith had not been in vain. The hours that followed were exuberant and very emotional. Han was almost bouncing off the walls in his joy, at least when he wasn't trying to conceal a tear in his eye. C-3PO moved Han and Leia's belongings into their bedroom, and Jaina and Jason's gear out. The twins sacked out on the floor of the front room. C-3PO, with nowhere to go, propped himself against a wall and shut himself down. No sooner had Jason closed his eyes than he heard a respectful tap at the door. Leia's Nogri bodyguards, who hadn't been taken to Bastion, were now reporting for duty. They were placed outside in the corridor, and an hour later knocked again, this time because Verger had been released from detention and had nowhere else to go. Jason was delighted to see her, but clearly the apartment was too crowded, even after Jaina volunteered to shift to bachelor officers' quarters. But fortunately, Jason had a mother, who was a princess and had connections. The Solo family, with C-3PO, moved to another apartment along with the Nogri. Jason hoped Verger might come along, but Luke rather firmly stated that she would remain as his guest. It was probably a good idea, Jason reflected later. When his parents found out what Verger had actually done to him when he was a prisoner, they wouldn't have looked at the little alien kindly. Jason would hate to have to get between Verger and Han's blaster. The move took much of the day, and as soon as it was over, Jaina had to report to Fleet Command to see if any decision had been made about Kreefe's request for Jedi. She wasn't back until very late. The next morning, Jason rose, seated himself at the foot of his bed, and began to do his Jedi meditations and exercises. Calling the Force, using it to help modify his bodily state, slowing or speeding his heartbeat, shifting blood flow to his muscles, as if for combat, to his internal organs, as if wounded or short on air, or to his skin, to help radiate excess heat and cool the body. He sensed Jaina waking as the force radiated from him, and likewise sensed her resentment. With a sigh, she climbed out of the bed, joined him on the floor, and merged her meditations with his. They synchronized breathing and heartbeat, lifted small objects, and then engaged in a mental lightsaber fight, sharing a mutual mental image of themselves in battle with one another, visualizing every move, every parry, the shuffle of their feet on the ground, the thrum of the lightsabers, the impact as the blades grated against each other. Jaina's fight was methodical and cool, utilizing minimal energy, content to back away until she saw an opening for an absolutely ruthless riposte. Jason permitted himself more freedom, making wild attacks and lunges, spinning in and out of range, striving to do the unexpected. As a result, he got nailed more often than not, and in the moment of his death, he sensed his sister's steely resolve. Afterward, as a calming exercise, Jason sent his force sense radiating outward, sensing his sleeping parents in their bed, the two Nogri, one on guard, the other asleep, the sparks of life in the adjacent apartments. Seeking the wondrous dynamic complexity he'd found on the reef, Jason sent his force sense floating even farther, down into the deep surrounding Herkia floating city, sensing the masses of microscopic life, the swarms of fish that had adopted the city as their home the deep-water pelagic fish that darted into the city's shadow to prey on the smaller fish. Jaina pulled away. Jason opened his eyes in surprise and saw her getting to her feet. Sorry, she said. I can't go there right now. He blinked at her. Why not? She reached into the closet and took out her uniform. I've got to stay focused on my job. I can't let my mind go floating around in the ocean. I've got to stick with what I can use. 
It's life, Jaina, Jason said. The Force is life. Jaina looked down at him. Anger smoldered in her eyes. Life isn't what I do anymore, she said. What I do is death. I kill and I try not to get killed myself. Anything else? She waved her hand. Is a luxury. Jaina, Jason began. Every second I spend floating around the ocean, Jaina said. I'm getting weaker and the Vong are getting stronger. So what I'm going to do, she opened the door, is take a shower, get into my uniform and go to headquarters to see if Admiral Sov has a message for me. And if he doesn't, I'm going to find some pilots and talk tactics, so that maybe I can learn a trick or two that will keep my squadron alive through another fight. I'll see you later. Maybe. It's all about balance, Jaina, Jason said. But she was gone, and the refresher door shut behind her. Jason rose and sadly began to change into his clothes. Later, after breakfast, he told his mother what Jaina had said. Lay aside. Jaina and I already had this argument at Hapes, she said. I begged her to get some leave, get away, get some perspective. But she wouldn't, and I know how far I'd get if I repeated my arguments now. Uncle Luke said that despair was access for the dark, Jason said. Leia shook her head. Jane has learned about the dark now, she said. She's been there, and I can't believe she'd go again. What I fear now is that she'll set herself one impossible task after another until she breaks. Jason looked at his mother. No one in the family's like that, I'm sure. She laughed. Of all the things Jaina could have inherited from me, she had to pick my work ethic. She reached out and took Jason's hand. Jaina's tough, you know. She'll get through this, and it will help that she has one less brother to mourn. Jason tried to smile. At least I've given her that, he said. Four days into his term of office, Cal Omas summoned Admiral Akbar and Winter to the former resort hotel that now housed the executive branch of government. The meeting was small. The only other guests were Luke, Idar Neely Kirka of Fleet Intelligence, New Republic Intelligence Chief Diff Scour, and Supreme Commander Sin Sov. YVH droids patrolled the corridor outside. Scour's people had thoroughly swept the room for listening devices, and so had Neely Kirka's who sneaked in later without Scour's knowledge. The room was small, with no viewports. A small white marble table, scalloped like a seashell, held indentations for each of the guests. On one wall, a little fountain tinkled and chimed, emitting a mild scent of brine. Akbar wore his old uniform. His skin was gray and his hands trembled, and Winter had to help him to his feet as Cal entered the room. But his voice was firm as he congratulated Cal on his appointment with none of the slurring that Luke had heard before. "'I would like to thank you all for agreeing to meet with me,' Akbar said. "'I know that you're all very busy trying to put the new government together.' "'We're never too busy to meet with one of the greatest heroes of the rebellion,' Calomus said. "'You were my commander for many years, so please don't think I'm going to start pulling rank on you now.' "'It was Borsk Felia who insisted on your retirement,' Sinsov said. Please understand that no one in the Defense Force wished you to go, and least of all myself. That's very kind, Akbar said. His trembling hands keyed a data pad on the table before him. Though the retirement was welcome in one sense, I now possess a great deal of time to think, and I have been thinking a great deal about the Yuzhan Vong, the greatest menace to the security of the galaxy since Palpatine. He splayed his huge hands on the marble table. My speculations aren't completely uninformed, because I have friends within the government who have provided data. He looked up at the others. Nothing secret has come my way, but some analyses have found their way to me. Luke glanced into the polished tabletop and viewed the reflections of Neely Kirka and Diff Scour, both of whom were being careful to maintain innocent expressions. Admiral Sov's jowled face was likewise bland. And, of course, I've been in the service a great many years, all at the highest level. 
Akbar continued, and I understand how the service works. Even the service under Borsk failure. He nodded his huge head. So let's open the survey with our military. We are growing stronger, he began. When the war started, contracts were awarded in order to increase in our force strength. More capital ships, more fighters, more transports, larger ground forces. The shipyards at Kuat, Talan, Karelia, and here at Mon Calamari have been disrupted by the war but not fatally injured, and now they are delivering new capital ships, while many contractors dispersed throughout friendly space are delivering large numbers of smaller craft. It took a while, Luke knew. First you built droids, and then the droids built a factory. Not for warships, but for more droids. Then the first set of droids, plus the new droids built by the factory, built another factory, and that built ships, while the first factory continued to build new droids to build new factories, to build new droids to build new factories to build ships. You could keep going forever building new factories, new droids, and new ships, provided supplies weren't interrupted and someone was willing to pay for it all. Once the cascade started, it just kept growing, and the only way to stop it was to destroy all the factories, ships, and droids, because if just one droid survived, that droid could start the cascade all over again by building another droid. What this meant was that new ships were coming into service, and they'd keep coming, in geometrically increasing numbers as the largely droid workforce brought new factories online. We also have many new recruits. Akbar went on. Despite the efforts of the Peace Brigade and others favoring surrender to the Yuzhan Vong, many idealistic citizens have volunteered for the military. Many of these have been drawn from refugee populations who prefer the hazards of battle to the tedium of refugee camps. And the refugees, who have seen their homeworlds destroyed or occupied, provide a highly motivated brand of recruit, who wish to win back their homes and take vengeance on the enemy. The bottleneck in making use of their volunteers hasn't so much been their numbers, but the necessity of building training camps in safe areas and staffing them with qualified instructors. But this has now been done. Luke knew that building training camps and training recruits ran along the same lines as building ships and droids, except that military instructors couldn't be built as easily as droids or turned out in a factory. Still, in addition to the instructors the military possessed at the beginning of the war, there were a great many veterans of the rebellion who had returned to the colors and were busy training the next generation in every tactic they knew. The drawback to so many new ships and personnel is that they are untried, Akbar continued. Successful actions against the Yuzhong Vong have been few, so there is no standard fleet doctrine based on consistent success in battle. Now that New Republic research groups have succeeded in at least temporarily cancelling the advantages given the Yuzhan Vong by their... He glanced at the data pad. Their Yamasks. His pink-whiskered lips working delicately at the alien word. We may take greater risks with our new forces, but still we will be putting raw recruits up against seasoned enemy veterans, and in the normal course of events may expect to take heavy casualties. Our problems have been compounded by failures in intelligence, Akbar continued. The two intelligence directors, Luke saw, received this judgment without surprise. We were invaded by an unknown enemy of unknown force, of a species unknown to us, and impelled by unknown motives. We could not infiltrate them, we could not scout their homeworlds. We could not even speak their language. Even the famous and highly regarded Boston Secret Services were unable to accomplish nothing. Small wonder that we could not predict their actions. That lack has, to a degree, been remedied, with better knowledge of the enemy and with agents now in place on enemy worlds. So much for our capabilities. Akbar paused and one large hand loosened his collar. I should like to continue with an analysis of the enemy. He paused, perhaps waiting for a question, then went on. The Yuzhan Vong invasion of our galaxy has a religious justification, he said. 
Perhaps the leadership cynically uses religion to camouflage other, less noble reasons for the assault, but there is no doubt that most Dujan Vong sincerely believe that their gods have given our worlds to them. Because they have no doubts on this score, they form a highly motivated, dedicated, tenacious, and ideologically unified core of invaders. While the experience of Jason and Anakin Solo suggests that the Yuzhan Vong have divisions among themselves and disagreements among their leadership, they nevertheless present a united front to all outsiders. Our attempts to divide or corrupt them have been fruitless. As far as I know, and my knowledge on this score is necessarily incomplete, we have been unable to turn a single Yuzhan Vong into an informer or spy. While it is possible that Yuzhan Vong religious faith and ideology may weaken as a result of contact with us, with occasional defeats and with a galaxy more complex than their ideas can sustain, we can't count on being able to divide one group of Yuzhan Vong from another as a means to our victory. While Akbar spoke, Winter quietly rose from her place, walked to the tinkling fountain set in the wall, and soaked a handkerchief in seawater. She returned to Akbar and efficiently swept moisture onto Akbar's graying skin. Diff Scour gave a ferocious sneeze. Akbar paused for a moment, then continued. The enemy's greatest successes have been in the realm of intelligence. The galaxy was thoroughly scouted before the first attack. Spies and informers were placed or recruited throughout all target areas. Our government was penetrated at its highest levels. Agents such as Nomanor had stirred civil conflict that distracted us from the real threat of invasion. Enemy agents, puppets, and collaborators were able to keep us thoroughly off balance throughout the critical early months of the assault. Even now we have no certain knowledge that our most closely guarded secrets are not in the possession of the enemy. The knowledge that the Yuzhan Vong may be fully aware of our movements has paralyzed our leadership and tended to make them overly cautious. Luke glanced at Sin Sov. His heavy-jowled face was expressionless, but Luke sensed no resentment of this analysis in the Solaston. Material losses are irrelevant to the Yuzhan Vong, Akbar continued. Apparently their ships are grown and harvested like interstellar fruit. They can have as many warships as they can find Vong and Vong collaborators to crew them. And as for crews, Akbar said, I have on my data pad some estimates of initial Yuzhan Vong strength and their casualties thus far in the war. These are approximations, since we really don't know the strength of any extragalactic reserves, nor do we have anything but estimates of Yuzhan Vong casualties, and these may be exaggerated. He cleared his throat. They often are. You may view these figures, if you like, on your own data pads. I am prepared to send them to you. Luke took out his data pad and set it to receive. Figures shimmered across its screens. Estimated total population, percentage of population estimated to consist of the warrior caste, an estimate of the number of casualties inflicted by New Republic forces, almost all members of the warrior caste. Casualties reflected as percentage of total warrior caste. Luke looked at Akbar in astonishment. We've killed almost a third of their warriors? he asked. So these figures imply, Akbar said. They're very approximate, Cal Omas pointed out. They're the best we have, Akbar said. I don't think they're far wrong. Our figures at New Republic Intelligence imply much the same thing, Tifskar said. Luke was always surprised that someone as pale and thin as Scour had such a strong voice. The Vong lost an entire battle group at Obroa Sky, Neely Kirka put in. They failed at Hapes, and Yuzhan Vong casualties at Fondor and Coruscant were heavy, even though both were victories for the Vong. They cannot afford any more such victories, Scour said. If these figures are correct, Cal said, I don't want to throw our fleets at the enemy on the basis of guesswork. There are ways of testing whether the figures are correct, Akbar said. 
if the Yuzhan Vongs stage another large offensive against a major target in the next two months, we'll know that they have warriors to spare. If instead they consolidate their gains, we'll know that their losses have taught them caution. Idar Nili Kirka and Sin Sov looked at each other uneasily. The thought of a massive attack on Corellia, Moon Calamari, or other important targets was never far from their thoughts. The Yuzhan Vong warriors are brave, Akbar went on. They are aggressive. They obey orders without hesitation, fight to the death, retreat reluctantly or never, and never surrender. He drew a long breath and sighed it out. Considering their other advantages, it is lucky for us that they possess these weaknesses. Luke stared at Akbar. Of course. Why hadn't he realized this before? Weaknesses? Scour's astonished cry filled the air. You call these weaknesses? Of course. Akbar said simply, We can count on the enemy to have these traits. That means they are predictable. And while each of these traits may be admirable in itself, together they add up to massive and systematic weaknesses. He held up one giant hand. Consider, he said, bravery and aggression result in foolhardy courage, and in any case are useful only with adequate direction. Unthinking obedience means a lack of flexibility. To fight to the death and never to surrender is to deny oneself useful alternatives. Together we can use these Yuzhan Vong traits to draw the enemy into a trap from which he will never escape. Akbar extended a single finger as far as the hand's webbing would permit. Foolhardy courage will bring the Yuzhan Vong into the trap. He held out a second finger. Unthinking obedience means that Vong subordinates won't dare to question their superiors, even if they have doubts. A third finger. Unthinking obedience also means that warriors can't exercise initiative and will continue to follow their superiors' plans even after a fluid combat situation has made them irrelevant. They won't change their plans without their superiors' permission, even if their superiors are out of touch or have an unrealistic idea of the situation. Akbar held up a fourth finger. Because the Yuzhan Vong consider death inevitable and never seek to prolong their lives, they will continue to fight on, even in a hopeless cause. Their superiors' courage and belief in their cause will make them reluctant to order a retreat until it's too late. These facts together, my friends, form a weapon with which we will destroy the Vong. He closed his hand into a fist and smashed it on the table. Cal Omus jumped. A trap, Luke said, implies bait. Akbar gasped agreement as Winter moistened his forehead. And the bait must be real. It must be something for which the Yuzhan Vong will commit all their available strength. And what is that? Cal asked. Us, I suppose, Difskara said, looking about the table. The government. His eyes in their hollow sockets turned to Akbar. What sort of timing are you considering? When should this trap be set? At the moment we have a great advantage, Akbar said. We can defeat their... their Yamasks. We can confuse their communications and cause them to fire at one another. We don't know if these advantages will last for long, so we should seek a decisive battle very soon. But most of our forces are inexperienced, Sinsov said quickly. You have said this yourself. Dare we fight a decisive battle with so many raw troops? No. Akbar said, we daren't. Our forces must be seasoned in battle before we attempt a major engagement. How do we season them without a major engagement? Difskar asked. Through many small engagements. Akbar said, the Yuzhan Vong now have the same disadvantage that we had at the beginning. They have too many worlds to defend, too many trade lanes, too many resources. We should let the fleet loose on these targets, on all of them. He held up a hand. But we should never attack where we know the Yuzhan Vong to be strong. Never engage where we do not possess an advantage. Our military must be seasoned, but seasoned only in victory. Through one success after another, they will learn to trust their commanders. 
and will grow in confidence to the point where they expect only victory. His huge pop eyes turned toward Admiral Sov. You must give your commanders a great deal of initiative in choosing their targets. You must give them permission to take risks, and occasionally to fail. Raid, skirmish, pounce on isolated detachments, disrupt lines of communication, isolate enemy worlds from one another, establish hidden bases from which you can mount raids. But you must never engage the enemy where he is strong, only where he is weak. The rebellion all over again, Calomus said. That's how we fought the Empire for the first years. That's correct. But when we fought the Empire, Cal continued, we didn't have so many places to defend. Our government was small and able to move to places like Yavin or Hoth. We didn't have millions of refugees to feed and resettle, or hundreds of senators demanding special protection for their worlds. We must defend only those places that are vital to the war. Akbar said, they must be defended, as we defended Coruscant and Borlias, to the point where even a victory would cost the enemy too much. And what places are those? Cal asked. Places where the new fleet elements are coming into being. Moon Calamari, Kuat, Karelia. Akbar sighed again. That's all. That's all? Cal said. Anything else? Akbar waved a hand. Give away when the enemy attacks. It will stretch Yuzhan Vong resources and make them weaker everywhere else. And the refugees? Luke asked. Those huge convoys that we've tried to protect? Those millions of people we've had to resettle? Akbar turned to Luke. His eyes were cold. We must not defend these huge targets. Tying our forces to them only makes us weak. Luke felt a chill settle into his spine. I've sworn to defend the weak, he said. Who is weak? Akbar asked. We are weak. The government. The military. While we are weak, the enemy thrives, and the refugees are doomed no matter what we do. Once we are strong, the enemy will have more important things to do than to attack convoys. Luke turned away. I understand, he said but all his instincts warred against Akbar's bitter logic. Difskaur put his thin, knobby-jointed hands on the table. His skin was so pale that the hands seemed to fade into the white marble. I ask again for your timetable, he said. You propose to put our untried forces into a kind of live-fire exercise against a real enemy in order to season them. How long before you think the fleet will be ready for a major action— or for this decisive battle your plan calls for. Akbar's response was swift. Three months, he said. Three months of continuous, low-level engagement with the enemy should give us a battle-tested force able to hold their own against the Yuzhan Vong. Three months. A cold smile played about Scour's cadaverous face. The timing is expedient. The timing for what, Luke wondered. There was something highly significant about that three months, but Luke and Akbar were two, at least, who weren't meant to know what it was. Akbar slumped into his chair. Presenting the plan had exhausted him, and now he was finished, he permitted himself to show that exhaustion. Winter stroked more brine onto his head. I only regret that my health doesn't permit me to serve the New Republic in a more active way, Akbar said. Your contribution has always been fundamental, Cal said. I can only wish myself and these others as useful a retirement as yours has been. He turned to Sinsov. Admiral, do you have any comments on Admiral Akbar's plan? Other than to admire it? No. Sov said. I'm ready to put the plan into action immediately, or I can resign in favor of Admiral Akbar, and he can carry out his proposals without any interference from me. Akbar waved a weary hand. No, my friend. I'm not in condition to command the defense force, and everyone here knows it. 
Cal gave Akbar a thoughtful look. Can you take a consultative role? he asked. We can invent a title for you. Fleet Director of Strategy or some such. The glabrous head nodded. I'm willing to perform this task to the best of my powers. His powers are very limited at present, Winter said. These were the first words she'd spoken since the meeting had begun, and they were in tones of quiet admonishment, like a governess, bringing her charge under control. She looked at Cal Omus. It won't be possible for the Admiral to be kept on a schedule, running to meetings and inspecting fleet units. Akbar waved a hand in protest, but Winter was firm. No, none of that. And no parades of visitors asking for advice or campaigning for promotion either. She looked at Admiral Sov. Some reliable staff officers would be useful to do the paperwork and take care of communications. But we can't have meetings like this all the time. We won't. Cal's voice was firm. If I need to speak to the Admiral again, I'll call for an appointment and I'll visit him myself. He looked at Sov. You'll make the other arrangements? The Sulliston nodded. I will. Cal turned to Luke. Is there any way the Jedi can aid this plan? Luke hesitated. I'd like to suggest that we place the matter on the agenda of the first Jedi Council meeting. Very well. Cal looked at the two intelligence directors, Scar in his civilian suit and Neelia Kirka in his military uniform. Any other comments? I work for Admiral Sov, Neelia Kirka said. At his direction, we can assist in formulating assessments of enemy strength and suggest possible targets. Diff Scar nodded his long head at Cal. We can do much the same, of course, at the direction of the Chief of State. Luke detected the very slightest degree of condescension in Scour's tone, as if he were humoring the others in the room with a show of cooperation, and again he wondered what it was that Scour knew that he didn't. It was almost as though Scour thought that Akbar's plan was irrelevant somehow, but he was willing to pretend it mattered. He had been very careful to question Akbar concerning exactly when his plan for trapping and destroying the Yuzhan Vong would become operational and had been satisfied when he'd learned it would take three months. What was going to happen within three months that would change Akbar's plans? Did Scour have some other plan that would win the war? Or, a chill wafted up Luke's neck, did Scour know that the enemy would render Akbar's plan ineffective, perhaps by staging an unstoppable offensive within the three-month period? Luke would have to watch Diff Scour very carefully, he thought. Perhaps, very quietly, Mara should watch him, too. Two hours after the end of the meeting, the signal Akbar is back was broadcast to all New Republic military units. In some of the larger ships, the cheering went on for an hour. Chapter 20 I would like to welcome everyone, Luke said, to this first meeting of the... He hesitated, then looked to Cal Omus. What is it, anyway? We're not the Jedi Council, with half of us not being Jedi. Cal hesitated, too. Let's just call it the High Council, for now, he said. It wasn't the most auspicious of beginnings. The hotel room that had been given to the council was oddly shaped and, like many of the rooms requisitioned by the hastily formed government, smelled of fresh paint. The oval table, shiny mother of pearl from a huge seashell, was too large for the room and there was crowding at either end of the table. At the table's thick waist, Luke faced Cal Omus. It would have seemed too suggestive of division to have all the Jedi at one side of the table facing the non-Jedi, almost as if he were asking the Council to split into two parties right from the beginning. So he'd alternated Jedi with others along the table's circumference. To Luke's right was the Wookiee Senator, Trebach, large and hairy and snarling with vigor. 
To the right of Tribak sat the Jedi healer Silgal, her protuberant moon calamari eyes able to scan the entire room. At the end of the table was Intelligence Director Diff Scour, whose thin human frame withstood the crowding at the table better than most. To Scour's right sat Kent Hamner, a human Jedi retired from the military, who sat rigidly upright and wore his well-tailored civilian suit as if it were a uniform. To Hamner's right was the soft-spoken Talam Ranth, the Gotal senator, whose support had given Cal his majority in the Senate, and who had demanded a seat on the council as a reward for his loyalty. To Talam's right was Cal, and to Cal's right was Kip Duran. At the moment, Kip looked uncomfortable. He and his squadron had been ordered to Moon Calamari on very short notice, and no sooner had he arrived than he'd been told he'd become a council member and taken to the first meeting. He had been on the planet for less than three hours, and his disorientation showed. To Kip's right was the golden-furred Minister of State, Reliki Akla, daughter of the late Alegos Akla the Kamasi senator who had been ritually sacrificed by the Yuzhan Vong on Dubrillion. Reliki had absorbed many of her father's memories through the Kamasi Memni, and possessed the knowledge, demeanor, and political skill of someone years older than her chronological age. To Reliki's right, at the cramped far end of the table, sat the erect figure of Saba Sebatine, who regarded the others with bright, intent reptilian eyes. She was used to hunting Yuzhan Vong with packs of other barabels, and Luke hoped she would come to regard the Jedi Council as a pack of a different order. To Saba's right was Sin Sov, the Supreme Commander, and between Sov and Luke bulked the wrinkled gray frame of the chief Jedi Knight, Trusina Lobi, whose long snout was partly unrolled on the surface of the table. To these was added C-3PO, whom Luke had borrowed from Leia, in order to act as secretary, transcriber of the minutes, and, if necessary, translator. The droid stood out of the way in the corner and regarded the meeting with his glowing gold eyes. Luke looked at the data pad and the notes he'd made to himself about the meeting. I'd like to start the meeting by finding out if any committee members have anything to bring before the council. Cal Omas cleared his throat. This is a momentous occasion, Master Skywalker. And you're not going to make a speech? I hadn't been planning one, Luke said. But if I know Jedi, I think I can promise you speeches in plenty as the meeting goes on. And then he looked at Cal and said, Would you like to make a speech? My throat's a bit tired from the speeches I have been making, Cal said but I can give you some of the applause lines from my acceptance speech. Some of them were real corkers. I think we all heard that speech the first time. Luke smiled. I'd like to think so, Cal said. He waved a hand. Never mind, then. Sorry for the interruption. Luke looked at the others. Does anyone wish to offer a report? Master Skywalker. Kip raised a hand. Master Duran. Kip's discomfort showed plainly on his face. Can you explain to me why I'm here? Saba Sabatine gave a brief hiss of amusement. What do you mean? Luke replied. Kip twisted in his seat. I'm not sure that I belong on the council. Not really. I've been a lot of trouble to you, and I hardly think I've earned a place here. Well, that may be true, Luke said. That doesn't mean you haven't earned a seat. You're one of our most experienced Jedi, particularly in fighting the Yuzhan Vong. No one questions your dedication or your talent or your mastery of the Force. You always supported the formation of a Jedi Council. I surrendered pride on Ithor, Kip said, and while I haven't always lived up to that vow, I've tried my best. I disbanded the dozen and placed myself under Jaina Solo's command. And though I ended up reforming the dozen at Admiral Creefay's request, I've been trying to keep my head down and do my job and keep out of the kind of trouble I seem to get into. And now, he struggled for words, now you've put me on the governing body of the Jedi. That's a temptation to the pride I've renounced. 
I think I might be happier flying at the head of my squadron. The happiness of one is not the issue, Saba hissed. The issue is where one may best serve. I think your voice on the council is necessary and welcome, Luke told Kip, though I won't keep you here if you insist on resigning. Kip was exasperated. I don't want to go against your wishes yet again, Master Skywalker. In that case, stay. Besides, Caloma said, if you're worried about your overweening pride, I think everyone here can work out ways to keep you humble. Even Kip laughed at this. He waved a hand. As you wish, Master Skywalker, but I hope I won't make you regret this. So do we all, Luke thought. Since you asked for news, Kip went on, I have information from Kashi Eek, from Lobaka, and the team of Wookiees who are investigating Yuzhan Vong biotechnology. Go ahead, Luke said, and was aware of Tribak on his right, leaning forward with great interest. They've been working with the Dovin Basils from the captured frigate Trickster, Kip said. They're now able to use our own interdiction technology to duplicate the effects of Dovin Basil space mines. Since the war began, the Vong have used their mines to yank our ships out of hyperspace and ambush them with fighter craft. And now it looks as if we'll be able to do the same to them. Wonderful, C-3PO said, translating for Tribak. Well done. Sinsov was pleased. Splendid. That will fit in well with Admiral Akbar's plan. Perhaps Admiral Sov should explain Akbar's plan for those of us who haven't heard it, Cal said. Perhaps only the first part, Divskour cautioned. The plan's ultimate objective is perhaps beyond the scope of this meeting. In other words, Luke thought, let's not tell too many people that Akbar hopes to lure the Yuzhan Vong into a trap. If only a few people knew, maybe the Vong could actually be surprised. Luke had been watching Divskour with care, through the force as well as visually. He still wasn't certain how much he trusted Scour. In this case, however, he sensed only a genuine concern for keeping Akbar's ultimate goals secret. Solve obliged Scour by explaining Akbar's plan to season the Republic's raw recruits through a series of skirmishes and small engagements, rather than risking a large battle. Admiral Crefe, he finished, has requested as many Jedi pilots as possible. He hopes to merge many elements of his fleet into what he calls the Jedi Meld, so that all may maneuver together as one. He reports that he's had limited success with this tactic at Obroa Sky, but needs more Jedi to make it more effective. I've also received a message from Kreefe requesting Jedi, Luke said. I have no objection to sending any who wish to go. I hope the Council can see its way to helping Kreefe, Cal said. The military's reeling and needs all the help we can give. They're on their heels with one defeat after another. They rightly blame the political leadership, and some are on the verge of mutiny. I'd really hate to have to give an order to Garmbel Iblis right now. Who knows what kind of answer I'd get. If the defense forces don't think we're going to stand behind them, I'd hate to think what might happen. Kip cleared his throat and half-heartedly raised a hand. Yes, Luke said. I'm sorry to have to say this after everything the President has just said, but we may have a potential problem with Admiral Crefe. He's a good commander, I guess, but the Bothan clans have... Well, they've declared genocide against the Vong, and Crefe's taken it to heart. It's called Arkry. I don't think I want the Council to declare its support for mass murder, even the mass murder of Yuzhan Vong. Luke turned to Cal Omis. Cal, have you heard of this? Cal shook his head. If the Bothan government has made any such declaration, they certainly haven't informed me. Speak to Admiral Crefe, Kip said. He's a happy warrior these days. I'm sure he'd be glad to explain it to you. Diffscour's pale, skeletal fingers fingered his jaw. Cold intelligence worked behind his deep-set eyes, and Luke sensed that he found this development highly intriguing. Bothans are rather secretive, he said. It's possible that they consider this a private decision. 
a private decision with galactic consequences, Cal said. He seemed unsettled and angry. It's not the Bothan's decision anyway, blast it. What do we do with Admiral Crefe's request? Kent Hamner asked. He already has Jedi serving under him, Trisina Lobi said, including Master Duron. What is his opinion? Kip hesitated, then shrugged. He's an effective commander. Not a genius like Akbar or a master of tactics like Wedge Antilles, but a problem solver and dedicated to victory. Our cry is a new policy. I don't know what he plans to do, but I know that I'm worried. From the Gotal senator, Talam Ranth, Luke sensed a wave of wry amusement. Gotals were thought unemotional and hyperlogical by those who could not detect the emotions radiating from the twin cones on their heads. Though Luke wasn't as good at reading Talam as another Gotal would be, he nevertheless received an indication of the senator's disposition through the force. Crefe may wish to eliminate the Vong, Talam said. I may wish to eliminate the Vong. Most of the people in this galaxy doubtless wish to eliminate the Vong. But may I remind the Council that neither Crefe nor anyone else can do it. We are losing the war. The issue isn't whether we destroy the Yuzhan Vong. The issue is whether they destroy us. His scarlet eyes glimmered in their deep sockets. Moral conundrums make an entertaining mental exercise, but I suggest we keep this discussion within the realm of the possible. I agree, Scour said. He had been watching Talam narrowly, and Luke sensed that he was agreeing, not because he cared about the senator's position, but for secret reasons of his own. Luke wished he knew what these reasons were. Reliki nodded her golden head in agreement with Scour and Talam. Perhaps that is best, she said. Very well, Luke said. The issue is whether we should send Jedi to Admiral Crefe. Saba Sabatine put an elegant, scaled hand onto the table. I and my kindred are highly experienced in the kind of force-melding that Admiral Crefe desires for his Jedi. Perhaps... I should point out something that others may not have realized. If Crefe succeeds in building this meld in his forces, it will not be Crefe who commands his fleet. It will be us. The last sibilant hiss floated down the table to Saba's startled audience. Tribak, vastly amused, gave an untranslatable roar. The fleet will be conditioned to obey the orders of the Jedi, Saba went on. They will fight at our direction and under our leadership. Should Crefe attempt any sort of, shall we call them, illegal actions, he will need both our permission and cooperation. It would be within our power to withhold them. The others watched the bear bell for a long, silent moment. Then Luke said, I think we should send Jedi. Kip raised a hand in half-hearted protest, then dropped it. Very well, but they should be warned about the Bothans declaring our cry. Agreed, and while training with this meld, they should consider what to do if the meld is ever misused. Master Skywalker, Silgal said, you have throughout the war warned us of the dangers of aggression. But now you send Jedi to war under a commander who will use them aggressively. Have you changed your mind? Silgal had been watching him with those bulging eyes, Luke thought, and had sensed his mind within the Force. She was never less than acute. I have changed my policy, yes, he answered. At once he had kept Duran's full attention. How? Kip asked. I'm willing to give my blessing to those Jedi who wish to act offensively against the Yuzhan Vong, provided that they can find their objectives to military ones. Kip's eyes flashed. You could have saved us both a lot of grief if you'd told us that a couple of years ago. He waved his arms. For years you've been warning me about aggression leading to the dark side. 
I didn't listen, and over and over and over again, reality whacked me on the side of the head. Finally, I decided you were right. I watched someone else go to the dark, and it was worse than I could have imagined. He pointed a finger at Luke. You finally convinced me. I've been a good little Jedi for, for months now. I've been telling everyone who would listen that Master Skywalker's been right all along. And now you tell me that you've changed your mind? Now this was the Kip that Luke knew. How dare you? Kip demanded. How dare you? It was all Luke could do to keep from laughing out loud. At the beginning of the war, I didn't have the same information that I have now, Luke said. Perhaps you did, however. What information? Kip crossed his arms and glared at Luke with grudging patience. At the beginning, I was deeply disturbed by the fact that the Yuzhan Vong couldn't be found in the Force. It seemed to me that they might be a mockery of the Force, a deliberate profanation of life, and that I would be destined to lead a dark crusade against them. He looked along the table, meeting every pair of eyes. It would have been a dreadful thing, he said. So many Jedi would have turned against the light in a war like that. I might not have been able to resist the darkness myself. What changed your mind? Kip's gaze was wary. New information. Luke looked up. From Jason Solo and from Verger. It's now possible to understand that the Yuzhan Vong aren't some exception to the rules of creation. If we can't see them in the Force, it's our fault, not theirs. We can fight them without wanting to wipe them from existence. We can fight them without hate and without darkness. Luke looked across the table at Kip. If you knew this two years ago, I apologize for doubting you. But in the meantime, I'm not sorry that I was cautious. I couldn't have known any of that, Kip said. You know I couldn't have known it. There was so much at stake. I didn't want anyone to turn to the dark side because I misread the situation. You! Kip accused, pointing. You! He banged his hand on the table in frustration and looked at the others. Am I the only one here who simply wants to punch Master Skywalker in the nose? Again Luke concealed laughter, and he sensed that he wasn't the only one. Cal Omis looked from Luke to Kip and grinned. I won't throw any punches, he said, but I'm willing to be entertained. Kip threw up his hands in frustration. I think Skywalker does this for his own entertainment. If you want the practical argument, Kip, Luke said, the Chief of State has now given us his full support and made a place for the Jedi in the government. It seems only polite to support the government that is supporting us. That's all very well, Kip said. But your warnings about aggression weren't without foundation. It's still possible for the darkness to take our people. I know. I've been there. He looked at Luke, pain in his eyes. And very recently I've watched it happen to someone else. Now you know what it's like, Luke thought. He had watched Kip fall into darkness without being able to stop him. Now Kip understood, when Jaina let the dark take her, what it was to feel that helplessness. The Jedi Code is made confusing by the fact that aggression is never defined, Luke said. So I'm going to define it right now. Aggression is making an unprovoked attack, or taking something that doesn't belong to you, or aiding someone else in doing one of these things. Kip nodded thoughtfully. That definition could have prevented a lot of misunderstanding between the two of us. It could have, Luke said. I'm sorry for that. The dangers are still very real, Kip said. They'll become even more real when we start sending our people into combat. Luke shook his head. We have to trust them. They're Jedi. We trained them. Let them all go, he thought. Verger had shown him what he knew. He needed to trust that his training and his example would bring the Jedi through this crisis. Let them all go. 
There is no great danger with the meld, Saba said. The others were startled by her complete certainty. All Jedi together, and of one mind, should one fall into darkness, others would draw her back to the light. Luke hoped this was true. We have to trust the Jedi and their training, he said. We've given all the warnings we can. The meld is another tool we can try to use. What about the Great River? Silgal asked. She seemed in genuine distress. We have painfully set up this conduit for refugees, agents, and information. Are we all to engage in warfare now, and let the Great River dry up at its source? Of course not, Luke said. Each Jedi must decide how he or she wishes to help defeat the Yuzhan Vong, and unless there's some pressing need, I intend myself to continue my work with the Great River. Silgal seemed reassured. Luke turned to Cal. Have you had enough speeches for today? It's been enlightening. Cal looked around the table. Somehow I expected that Jedi would have more certainty and less discussion. I always hope for that, Luke said. I hardly ever get it. Other members of the Council made reports concerning the Great River or other projects. Diff Scour made a brief presentation concerning what he understood of current Yuzhan Vong goals. And Trebach spoke about the Senate, which seemed alarmed with itself at its boldness in electing Cal as Chief of State, but was otherwise fairly quiet. Is that all, then? Luke asked. Tresina rolled up her snout to allow herself to speak without being muffled. I'd like to ask about the Jedi apprentices just arrived, with a refugee convoy, here on Moon Calamari. She said, They have no masters or current duties. What are we to do with them? Send them to... She hesitated on the verge of letting a secret slip. To join the other apprentices at the Hidden Academy? Who are we talking about? asked Silgal. Zek and Tahiri Vela. All were with my son Tisar on the strike at Mirkur, Saba said. All watched Anakin die, Luke thought. They're being looked after by Alima Rar, Trisina said. But Alima doesn't feel ready to take an apprentice, let alone two of them, so she's asked me to query the council. Alima was right, Luke thought. Alima had lost her sister Jedi Knight horribly to a Voxen, and was very vulnerable even before the Mirkur strike, probably too vulnerable to spend her days looking after apprentices who had problems of their own. They're all warriors, then, Kent Hamner said. Veterans. They'll all be needed. He turned to Luke. Perhaps we should promote them to Jedi Knight? Then they can decide for themselves where they'll be most useful. Luke hesitated, then spoke. Tahiri is very young, not even sixteen, and she was a special friend to Anakin. I don't know if she's gotten over his death. He shook his head. Knighting her and sending her against the Yuzhan Vong might be sending her straight to the dark side. Send them to Kashiik, Saba said. Send them to Tisar and to the Meld. Send Alima Rar as well. The Force Meld will save them from the dark side. Her yellow eyes flicked over the group. Just as melding with the Bear Bells saved me when Tisar's hatchmates, Krasov and Bela, were lost. Saba's sincerity was convincing. Luke nodded. Very well. There are other apprentices who are with Anakin's strike force. Kent reminded, Jaina, Jason, and Lobaka, and of course Silgal's apprentice, Tekli. Shouldn't we promote them as well? Luke felt embarrassment that he hadn't realized this himself. Of course. Don't forget Tenel Ka, Kip added. Cal's eyes lit up. They'll be the first Jedi Knights of the New Order, he said. Shouldn't you do something special when you knight them? A ceremony or... The Jedi have never engaged much in ceremony, Kip said. Jedi do. 
Jedi don't play act. Luke laughed. Do you want to make a speech so badly, Cal? There's never been any ceremony in the past. Cal flushed a little, but said, Why not have one? They're heroes, and people should know it. Bring them all here, and I'll pin medals on them and talk until their ears turn blue. Tisar and Lobaka are on Kashi'ik, Trisina reminded. They're in the military, aren't they? Cal said. Jaina's squadron? Reassign the squadron to Mon Calamari. Sir, Sinsov spoke tactfully. Admiral Crefe will hardly appreciate losing three Jedi just when he's asked us to send more. Then tell him he'll get more, Cal said. Tell him that he'll send us apprentices, but he'll get Jedi Knights in return. Tenelka has already been promoted, Reliki pointed out. To Queen Mother, in fact. I don't know if we can persuade the Hapens to let her go just because we want to hold a ceremony. Cal's enthusiasm was undimmed. Why should the Hapens object if we want to honor their queen? Besides, I'm sure she'll want to be present when her friends are knighted. Luke found himself grinning at Cal's zeal. Perhaps a ceremony was in order, just to show everyone, the Jedi not least of all, that things had changed, that the Jedi now had a place in the galaxy and were in the forefront of the struggle against the Yuzhan Vong. Champions again of the New Republic, and of the billions of lives for which it fought. The brilliant leadership of Anakin Solo. Cal's voice, unusually formal and ringing and solemn, filled the darkened auditorium. As we honor these young warriors, let us never forget the others who shared their mission but never returned. Yulaha Kor, Errol Besa, Joven Drark, Reynar Thule, Bela and Kosov Hara, Ganar Isod, who returned from Mirkur only to die later in defense of a comrade. As each name was called, an image of each Jedi was projected above the stage, floating as a kind of ghostly presence. In the orchestra pit before the stage, drums thudded out slowly like a heart beating its last. And their leader, Anakin Solo. Anakin's image appeared. Luke, standing at stage right with the rest of the High Council, looked up at the grinning boyish face and felt a lump rising in his throat. It had been Cal who had planned the whole knighting ceremony. Luke had objected to its theatrics, but had been overruled. Most people will never see a Jedi Knight in their whole lives, Cal had said. I want them to see Jedi Knights now, and I want them to see the Jedi Knights doing something meaningful. Cal had been right. The slow invocation of the dead was effective and moving. Cal turned toward Luke. Master Skywalker will now take the podium. Cal left the podium and rejoined the High Council at stage right, his feet falling into the solemn rhythm of the drums. Luke, dressed simply in his Jedi robes, marched in the opposite direction and passed Cal along the way. Mirkir's dead floated overhead like stars in a lost constellation. Luke reached the podium. The drums fell silent. Luke could sense the crowd before him. The auditorium was filled. But he couldn't hear them. The silence was profound. Then a lone trumpet sounded three rising notes the last held just an instant longer than the others. The notes were played again, in a different order. Again, the last held for the slightest bit longer than the others. And then the three notes repeated, again in a different order, again with the last drawn out. The sound was heartbreakingly pure, and somehow heartbreakingly sad. The drums rattled once, then stilled. The trumpet repeated the three basic notes in varying order, then built on them and took flight, rising high and swooping low, but overall climbing higher and higher until the instrument finally sang out one last high note that rang high and perfect and seemed to sing in the mind forever. The images of the dead faded with the last echo of the trumpet. Luke looked at the invisible audience. 
He wanted to be anonymous. He didn't want to be Luke Skywalker, hero and Jedi Master. He wanted it to seem as if any Jedi could be speaking these words. The roll call of the Jedi goes back for many millennia, he said. Luke spoke of the first who had realized the existence of the Force, and who had discovered and used its vitality, and who, realizing their power and its dangers, had devised a code for its use. The first Jedi Knights sworn to serve, not to rule. He spoke of those who had driven the menace of the Sith from the galaxy, and then guarded the Republic against all dangers until betrayed from within. He spoke of those new Jedi who had risen with the New Republic, and who even now were standing against the invading Yuzhan Vong, a thin bright line of fiery lightsabers directed against the enemy. We are here to welcome nine new members into the Order, Luke said. Each has felt the Force grow within him or her. Each has felt the sting of combat and the pain of a comrade's loss. Each has searched his or her heart, and now stands ready to make the commitment to serve the New Republic for as long as life lasts. Luke turned to the apprentices, standing in their line at stage left. Each was dressed simply in a jacket, trousers, and boots. As I name you, Luke said, may you step forward and be garbed in the robes of a Jedi Knight. Tenel Ka. The queen of sixty-three worlds, for good or ill, took formal precedence over the others. As the drums began a solemn march, she stepped from the line of apprentices and came to stand by the podium. Remove your lightsaber, please, Luke said. Two Jedi Masters, Kent Hamner and Kip Duran, stepped forward from the group of the Jedi Council, carrying Tennel's new robe. They pulled the robe around her, then buckled her lightsaber over it. Luke stepped away from the microphone. He hadn't told Cal that he was going to do this, but he wanted a part of the ceremony to be a private thing for the Jedi alone. He put his hands on Tennel's shoulders and looked at her closely. "'Yours is perhaps the most difficult task of all,' he said. "'The path of a queen is different from that of a Jedi. "'Your duty as queen of hapes will inevitably come into conflict "'with the simpler values of the Jedi.' "'He looked into her shadowed gray eyes. "'I don't tell you to choose one path over another. "'I only hope that you choose with your heart and choose wisely.' Luke reached over Tennel's shoulders, took her cowl, and drew it over her head. Tennel Ka returned to her place. Luke stepped back to the podium. Tisar Sabatin The Barabel came forward, and it was his mother, Saba, assisted by Kent Hamner, who clothed him in his robes. Luke once again stepped away from the microphone. To Tisar he said, the flame of a warrior burns bright in you, Tisar. You have shown you will never falter or abandon a stricken comrade. May the Force guide you in all you do. Tisar, yellow eyes burning with pride, returned to his place in the line. Alima Rar. Alima stepped from the rank of her comrades. Through the Force, Luke could perceive her aura of sadness. While she was garbed by Tresina and Kip, Luke considered the Twi'lek, what he knew of her savage childhood in the real dens, and of the sister who had died in her arms, her flesh afire with the acid of a voxen. Alima had also loved Anakin and suffered at his loss. Luke touched her gently, careful not to contact the sensitive headtails. Fate robbed you of your childhood and your only family, he said, though the Jedi can't replace either. I hope you will look to us for the love and friendship we can give you, and the strength we can lend you in times of need. Now go to Kashi'ik, join your mind with the others, and heal. As he raised Alima's cowl over her head, he saw tears glimmer in the Twi'lek's eyes. Lobaka! The ginger-haired Wookiee towered over Luke and looked down at him with a fanged grin 
Luke couldn't help but grin back. "'You're the one I've never doubted,' he said. "'Your path has never veered from the right, and you've shown that it never will.' Robaka had to bow deeply in order for Luke to reach high enough to draw the cowl over his head. A murmur of laughter ran through the audience. "'Jason Solo!' Jason stepped out in silence, and Luke could sense his readiness in the force. He took Jason by the shoulders. The young man looked at him from his startlingly bearded face. He had trimmed the whiskers that had grown in captivity, but not gotten rid of them entirely. Luke could sense his utter openness, his honesty, all the Jedi virtues he had maintained despite the trials and terrors of the last few years. Jason, Luke said, never stop asking questions. Jason seemed stunned. I never thought I'd hear you say that. I never thought I'd say it either, Luke said, and hugged him. Jason returned to the line, radiating bemusement. Zack. Zack was robed by Kip and by Luke himself. All were Jedi who knew darkness firsthand. Zack, Luke said, you are a Jedi who created himself in the image of the Jedi Knight you wanted to be. Once the Shadow Academy called you its darkest night, but all the forces of darkness couldn't keep you from seeking the light. Now that you have found it, may you live always in its radiance. Zek returned to the line, his pride a brilliant fire in the Force. Tahiri Vela On bare feet, the little blonde girl stepped forward, brave and pale in the darkness. She was another orphan whose childhood had been cut short, another who had been captured and ill-treated by the Yuzhan Vaughn, another who loved Anakin and who had been loved in turn by him. Silgal and Saba robed her. Luke looked down into the small, serious face and touched her thin shoulders lightly. Life has torn much from you that you loved, he said, but your courage has been equal to everything. Never forget that the Jedi will always be here for you. Never forget that the Force begets life as well as death. He touched her cheek. And never forget that here you are loved. Go to Kashi Ik, join your mind to that of others, and heal. Tahiri's chin trembled, and she swallowed tears as Luke drew the hood over her bright hair. Tekli. Silgal and Tersina robed her. Luke thought it was too ridiculous for him to tower over the one-meter-high Chadrathon as he spoke, so he hitched up his robes and sat cross-legged on the ground in front of her. Your mastery of the Force is not as strong as some of us, Luke said, but your devotion is second to none. You've taken upon yourself the role of healer. While others may garner more fame and glory, remember that yours is the noblest art, and that the preservation of life is the greatest gift a Jedi can bestow upon another. Luke drew the hood over her snouted face and rose easily to his feet from his cross-legged position. Without, he was pleased to note, using either the force or his hand, Jaina Solo Jaina stepped forward, and Luke could feel her cool presence in the Force. The precise way her footsteps matched the drumbeat that still thudded up from the orchestra pit. She wore her military uniform. Cal Omas had asked her to, in order to show her commitment to the New Republic. Kip and Kent Hamner, the two pilots, robed her. Luke put his hands on her shoulders and looked into her dark eyes, and a chill suddenly seized him, flooding his nerves with cold fire. "'I name you the Sword of the Jedi,' he said. "'You are like tempered steel, purposeful and razor-keen. Always you shall be in the front rank, a burning brand to your enemies, a brilliant fire to your friends. Yours is a restless life.' and never shall you know peace, though you shall be blessed for the peace that you bring to others. 
Take comfort in the fact that, though you stand tall and alone, others take shelter in the shadow that you cast. Luke fell silent, and for a long, horrified moment, he stared into Jaina's wide-eyed face. He hadn't meant to say that. He hadn't meant to say anything like it. Yet the words had poured forth from him like the ringing sound of a giant bell, a bell that was being tolled not by Luke, but by someone else. He sensed the other Jedi staring at him. Had he actually spoken loudly enough for them to hear? Luke's hands trembled as he drew the cowl over Jaina's head. When he returned to the podium, he had to fumble for the microphone switch. "'Draw your lightsabers,' he said, "'for the first time as Jedi Knights.' The click swoosh of nine igniting lightsabers hissed through the air. He turned to the newly minted Jedi Knights and drew his own lightsaber, as the Jedi members of the Council drew theirs. We salute you for the first time as colleagues, he said. And he and the council members performed a ritual salute with their lightsabers. Face front, he said, turning toward the audience, and recite with me the Jedi Code. There is no emotion, there is peace, they all said. There is no ignorance, there is knowledge. There is no passion, there is serenity. There is no death, there is the Force. As they chanted the words, the lone trumpet rose again, the three rising notes calling them to their destiny. Illuminated by their lightsabers, the Jedi Knights stood erect and silent in the darkness. The trumpet rose again to its last high note and died. As its echo faded, the lights died away. The audience burst into applause. But when the lights came up again, the stage was empty. Chapter 21 Technically speaking, Jason said, I'm still on vacation. For how long? Zek asked. For as long as Master Skywalker tells me I'm on vacation. Zek shrugged. Enjoy it while it lasts. I plan to. I just feel a little... odd seeing the rest of you shipping out to kashi Eek while I'm getting bronzed out on the reef. You've earned your leave, Zek said. You earned your leave in ways I don't even want to think about. Don't worry about it. Jason, Zek, and the other newly made Jedi Knights were at the reception thrown in their honor by Cal Omus. The room was huge and marble-lined and featured a pair of tinkling fountains ornamented by frolicking bronze fish, the freshly minted Jedi Knights still wore their Jedi robes and lightsabers and carried drinks in their hands. Older Jedi and politicians and military stood about and made polite conversation. Zek looked around the gathering. This is really strange, he said. What are all these people doing here? Jason smiled. I was the son of the Chief of State, he said. For me, this is an ordinary night at home. Zek shook his head. Diplomacy wasn't something the Shadow Academy cared much about. I guess not. Han loomed up at Jason's shoulder. A broad grin spread across his face. He put an armor on Jason's shoulders. Now let me tell you about my graduation night, he began. It was lovely, Leia said. I had tears in my eyes. The ceremony was mostly cow's work, Luke said. He's got a flair for dramatics that I didn't know existed. My children, Leia sighed, all grown up, and the Jedi have them now. Luke looked at her. Does that bother you? A little. Sometimes I wish they'd grown up to be something other than Jedi. Something safe. But, she sighed again, that's not going to happen in our family, is it? Luke tried to picture Ben grown up, sitting at a desk cluttered with actuarial tables. I guess not. Leia looked at him narrowly. What happened when you talked to Jaina? I could feel it in the Force, but I don't know what it was I felt. Luke hesitated. I'd rather not say. It's for Jaina to tell you. Hmm. 
Leia looked at him suspiciously, then decided not to pursue it. She gave a sidelong glance toward Lando Calrissian, who stood nearby chatting with Trebak. She leaned close to Luke and lowered her voice. How did Lando and Talon Card get Cal elected? she asked. Do you know? I don't, but we can make a highly educated guess. Leia bit her lip. I hate to just ask, but we should know. We're going to have to try to protect Cal when it all comes out. You think it'll become public knowledge? I know it will. Her eyes hardened. Right now we've got smugglers controlling a swing vote in the Senate. That's not a good thing, and the New Republic is going to pay for it. Luke looked at Lando appraisingly. We should have a talk with Captain Calrissian. Leia nodded. Yes, and soon. Jason patiently listened to his father's reminiscences until Han was approached by Kent Hamner, who wanted to find out about what fighter pilots were already calling the Solo Slingshot, the dive toward a Dovin basil that could be used to loop a combat craft in an unexpected direction to take the enemy by surprise. While Han was describing his encounter with the Yuzhan Vong battle group, Jason, who had already heard the story, slipped away to find his sister. Jaina stood with her back against one of the room's side columns, a plate of food held out in front of her like a shield. She gave Jason a dark look as he approached. If this is about what Uncle Luke said, I don't want to talk about it. Then let's not. He took a fruit-filled pastry from her plate. I thought we should congratulate each other. She gave a skeptical tilt to her head. Congratulations. Congratulations, sis. Jason popped the pastry into his mouth. The filling oozed onto his tongue as he bit down. It tasted like the product of an extractive industry specializing in fossilized hydrocarbons, and he coughed. Jana grinned as she pounded him on the back. Vile, aren't they? I think the caterer must be a Vratix. He's in the pay of the Yuzhan Vong, Jason coughed. He's trying to poison all the Jedi along with the High Command. He took a swig of geyser ale to wash the foul-tasting pastry down. That's better. He looked at her again. The inadvertent comedy had broken the tension between them. Can we do this congratulations thing again? he asked. I have a feeling we wrong-footed it the first time. She smiled. Sure. My fault. She put the tray on a nearby table, then embraced him and kissed his cheek. Congratulations. Congratulations. He held Jaina against him for a moment, feeling in the force the twin bond that united them, and then stepped back. You've always been my best friend, you know, and you've been mine. She looked over his shoulder at someone in the crowd. I see Danny Quee is here. Have you talked to her yet tonight? Not yet. She gave a little smile. Are you and Danny seeing each other? He blinked in surprise. No, not that way. Or anyway, I don't think so. Jaina laughed. You don't think so? Don't you think you'd know? We don't see each other that way. I don't think. I mean, she's five years older than I am. Dad's older than Mom. What does that matter? And Danny's so accomplished. She's brilliant. She's got all those science degrees. I don't see why she'd be interested in me. All I know how to do is be a Jedi. Jaina found this hilarious. She tried to strangle her laughter, but all that did was turn her red and send tears popping from her eyes. She's so accomplished. I'm just a Jedi. Laughter choked the words. And from Jason Solo. Jason tried to gather the shreds of his dignity. I don't see what's so funny. She patted him on the shoulder and wiped the tears from her eyes. That's fine, brother. I'm hardly the one to advise anybody on romance. Suddenly, Jason was very interested. Oh, yes? And what does that mean? She looked at him in the dawning knowledge that she'd just made a mistake. It means 
What it means, she said. Who does it mean? Jason asked. She looked away, then sighed. Jagged fell, she said. Jason was astonished. You must be joking. That stuck-up fighter pilot? Jana scowled. You don't know anything about him. He's not really like that. If you say so. There was a moment of silence. Jason thought it might be an apt time to move off this topic. What are you doing tomorrow? he asked. I don't know how much of this planet you've seen, but we could go. She shook her head. I'm shipping out with the rest. Back to Kashi Eek. He looked at her in surprise. Why are you leaving now? Her defiant look was back. I was on a special mission from Crefe. It's over. I'm bringing his Jedi back, and I'm going back with them. You're on a two-week furlough. I've seen the data pads. They're on the table in the room we're sharing. Jaina sighed. I've learned some new tactics since I've been here. One of them Dad's slingshot maneuver. We've got a bunch of new Jedi to integrate into the command system. I'm needed back on Kashi Eek, drilling all this new material into the fleet. Every moment you're here, the Yuzhan Vong are getting stronger. Jason half quoted. That's right. Besides, she added, you heard Uncle Luke. I'm the sword of the Jedi. I'm always in the front rank. Peace is not my job. Jason tried to navigate through the thorns he sensed springing up around his sister. The Yuzhan Vong may be getting stronger while you're here, but if you don't get some time to relax, I don't see you getting stronger at all. It's not just me. I've got eleven other pilots in my squadron to look after, and half of them are rookies. And if I don't beat them to pieces in training, the Vong are going to blow them to pieces in combat. She shook her head, then looked at him. It's all right, you know, she said. I've accepted my own death. Jason looked at her in surprise and horror. You haven't, he stammered. You haven't felt your death in the Force? No. Her eyes were strangely without animation, as if these were words she'd spoken a thousand times before. But I can count. I can count the enemy, and I can count the number of friends who have been killed, and I can count the number of battles before we can hope to end the war, and the number of shots that are going to be fired in my direction in those battles. I don't have to do anything wrong to be killed. I don't have to make a mistake. All that I need to do is be there long enough, and it'll happen. She looked at him, and with a half-smile reached out to touch his shoulder. But it's all right. It's what I've sworn to do. All that will happen is that I'll join the Force, and I'm part of the Force already, so with luck, I'll hardly even notice the change. All life is precious. Jason urged. All life is unique. You shouldn't just throw yours away. Any capstan was precious and unique, Jaina said. So was Yulaha Kor. So was Anakin. Uniqueness isn't a protection. She looked at him. And I'm not throwing anything away. I'm just looking at the odds. And I'm not arrogant enough to believe that I'm an exception when so many of our friends aren't. She looked at him. There is no death. There is the Force. Didn't we all just say that? I'm not just saying it, I'm living it. Don't cut us off from you, Jason said. We need you too. Jaina's look softened. When you need me, I'll do my best to be there. That's a promise. That's being a Jedi too. She walked away quickly, leaving Jason looking after her. Then he turned and gazed blindly into the crowd. It was only then that he saw, amid taller figures, the small figure of Verger. At any other time he would have been delighted to see her, but now he felt too troubled to talk to anyone. But she saw him and came toward him, and he tried to put a smile on his face as she arrived. "'You are now a Jedi Knight.' 
she said. Felicitations. Did you see the ceremony? I did not. Her wide mouth drew down in disapproval. The ceremony was a piece of political theater. Jedi should have nothing to do with such things. When I was made a Jedi Knight, it was simple. A Jedi Knight you are, Yoda said, and that was that. What more should we need? But you're here. Jason looked at the assembled dignitaries. This gathering is political as well. I came for personal reasons. To see you and wish you well. Jason looked at her. Thank you. I wonder, now that you are a Jedi Knight, if you have made any plans. Jason shrugged. I'm on vacation until Uncle Luke says I'm not. And then, unless Uncle Luke has other ideas, I'll join the fleet like the rest. Roger made a churring noise. Why? Your nature is not that of a military man. Jason nodded. No, it's not. But the Yuzhan Vong have to be defeated, and I can help. And I'll be with my friends. And your sister. Roger's eyes were almost accusing. And my sister. Jason nodded. Her expression grew severe. A Jedi Knight must not decide as a child decides. Jason looked at the avian in surprise. Are you trying to tell me something? I cannot speak to those whose ears are blocked. Jason took a sip of his drink and glanced around the room. Then let's talk about the weather. Sunny. Light clouds. Small chance of rain. Brugere's tone was acid. Jason smiled. Sounds like a good day to visit the reef. Brugere huffed again. Jason glanced again over the room and saw Luke talking seriously to Calumas and Relikiakla. You can't tell me that in the old days your Jedi masters didn't consult with politicians. You served the Supreme Chancellor after all. Chancellors came and went, Berger said. We served the Republic. Master Skywalker, Jason said, is on his fourth chief of state. That is as it should be. For once, Jason sensed grudging respect in Berger's words. Jason's eyes traveled the room, and he saw the gaunt figure of Diff Scour speaking with Silgal. He remembered Danny's telling him about Scour's project, the one involving Yuzhan Vong bioscience. Some of our biogeneticists may have found the genes that keep the Yuzhan Vong isolated from the Force, he said. He could sense for Jer's hyper-alertness through the Force. Tell me, she said. Jason told the little avian about the Yuzhan Vong's genetics, which had proven to be largely compatible with the human the exception being a unique strand that seemed common to all Vong-formed life. I suppose that could be responsible for the Yuzhan Vong not being discernible in the Force, Jason said. But he fell silent when he became aware that Verger had ceased to pay attention. Her crest had fluffed forward, as had her antennae, and she radiated intense concentration. When she finally spoke, it was as if she was speaking to herself. It is as I feared, she said. Urgency rang in Verger's voice. Who else knows this? Who? It's been kept very secret, Jason said. You and I and Danny know. And the scientists themselves, but they've been placed in seclusion. Who has them? Jason nodded his head toward Diff's scour. New Republic intelligence, he said. Verger looked at Scour's cadaverous figure. Jason could feel the intensity of Roger's gaze through the Force, and was glad she wasn't turning this scrutiny on him. Roger's crest swept back, and she gave a little ominous hiss. I can imagine what happens next, she judged. And there is another evil. What? Jason was bewildered. What evil? Roger swung back to him. You cannot guess, young Jedi she asked. She gave a dry little laugh. Despite all your adventures, I fear that you possess insufficient experience of depravity. 
Chapter 22 Jaina came out of her role right onto the tail of an enemy TIE fighter. She launched a missile by pure reflex, and the fighter blossomed into a brief scarlet flower. In another two seconds, she'd vaped the first TIE's wingmate, and the rest of her squadron accounted for three more. Through the force, she could sense enemy pilots engaged with Kip's dozen and completely unaware of her existence. "'Starboard, sixty degrees, twin squadron,' she said. Three, two, mark.' Her three four-fighter flights rolled over and through one another in a perfect crossover turn. "'Accelerating now,' Jaina warned, and pushed the throttles forward. She had already marked out a target, and she pushed her mind into the force meld to tell Kip she was coming. Kip sent a series of thoughts and impressions that translated to something like, "'You're welcome to a piece of this sorry bunch if you want one.' The force meld was powerful here, with so many Jedi present. It was almost like being a party to a large, private conversation. Though Kip's squadron— was tangled up with superior numbers, he didn't seem terribly threatened. It was strange to feel the enemy in the force again. The Yuzhan Vong were defending their convoys and rear areas in part with mercenary and peace brigade forces. These enemy pilots defending Duro were still present in the force, and often Jaina knew what the enemy pilots were going to do before they knew themselves. Jaina hadn't felt the enemy in the force since the fleet had raided Elysia a few weeks before. The Peace Brigade headquarters had also been defended by natives of the galaxy, which made them easy to fight, but the raid had gone wrong for other reasons. Bad intelligence, inadequate operational plan, bad luck. This raid was going to go right if Jaina had anything to do with it. Jaina's targets were howl runners, which partly explained Kip's lack of urgency. Jaina told each of her pilots to pick a target, slam it, then rendezvous on the other side of the furball in order to regroup for another slash. Her attack left a howl runner trailing flame and the panic of its pilot a distant shriek in the force. Her other pilots succeeded in damaging or destroying their targets, and as Jaina told her fighters to regroup, she heard Kip's laconic voice in the force suggesting that she go find someone else to shoot at. At that instant, Jason's presence blossomed in the force, and somehow Jaina knew exactly where he wanted her to go, and that he wanted her to use her shadow bombs. On my way, Jaina said. Jason was on the bridge of Admiral Crefe's flagship, the Bothan assault cruiser Rol Roost. His vacation on Moon Calamari had lasted three weeks. After that, Luke had told him he had the choice of working with the Great River or of joining Jaina and the fleet at Kashi Eek. Perhaps Luke had been a little surprised by Jason's choice. He left his life on Moon Calamari with small regret. He had enjoyed his brief respite from the war, enjoyed the company of his parents, of Luke and Mara and Danny Kui. But he as well as Luke knew that it was time to move on. Once he'd joined Crefe, Jason's experience with the Jedi meld on Mirker had helped him rise above the weeks of training that he'd missed. And in time, it had become obvious that his talents were less tactical than spatial and holistic. Through the Force and through the combined minds and perceptions of the Jedi, he seemed to gain a sense of the entire battlefield. He could sense where to move tactical elements and when to press an attack and when to hold back or withdraw. With the other Jedi as his eyes and ears, he felt the necessity of moving a squadron here, of pulling back the main body there, of maintaining a hovering threat elsewhere. He couldn't have said why he knew this. He only knew that he knew. If he narrowed his focus to the individuals who made up the meld, he could sense their distinct personalities. Corn Horn with his stubborn resolve. Kip Duran flying with controlled fury. Jaina, with her machine-like tactics, brain abuzz with calculation. Everything was calculation with Jaina these days. She had fashioned herself into a weapon, the Sword of the Jedi, and there was room for nothing else. If he tried to talk to her about anything but her job, anything but the daily necessities of fighting and survival, she simply would not respond. It was as if much of her personality had simply ceased to exist. 
It was painful to watch. Jason might have been hurt by Jaina's attitude if he weren't so concerned over the damage that she must be doing to her own spirit. Now, he almost heard the force speaking in his ear, and he ordered Saba Sabatin and the Wild Knights into a slashing run on an enemy cruiser. Two months of constant raids and skirmishing had demonstrated that Jason's chief value wasn't in the cockpit of a starfighter, but on the bridge of a flagship, where he could help direct an entire armada. Crefe had happily taken him aboard the Raw Roost. And now, as turbo lasers flared and missiles erupted against shields, he sensed a place for Jaina and her squadron. And then, in the whirling movement of the squadrons that blazed in the night, Jason sensed something else hovering in the darkness. Weapons ready. Scimitar squadron, he said in response to this sudden knowledge. Please stand by. Twin squadron, Jaina said. Turn toward Duro on my mark. Three, two, mark. Twin Sun Squadron performed another perfect crossover turn, placing the disk of Duro directly ahead. It was the first time Jaina had seen the planet since its loss to the enemy. She had been in a field hospital here after being wounded. She'd been blind, dependent on others, embroiled in conspiracy, and with a major Vong offensive in the offing. Her memories of the planet weren't happy ones. But Duro was now a different world. She remembered Duro as a gray-brown waste of desert and slag. But the disk was green now, bright with vegetation. The Yuzhan Vong had converted the poisoned planet to their own purposes, but in so doing so had taken a near-dead world and made it thrive. As Jaina neared Duro, she could see the fires of deadly energies flashing across the green disk of the planet. Three Yuzhan Vong cruisers were fighting to hold Krife's main body from a cluster of huge transport craft, and though outnumbered two to one, the enemy cruisers were fighting hard. Their starfighter pilots weren't Peace Brigade draftees in motley craft either, but first rank Yuzhan Vong warriors and coral skippers. That was obvious enough from the way they fought, using a high degree of tactical intelligence, even though their Yamask had been jammed. As Jaina watched, one of the enemy cruisers broke apart in flame and ruin and she sensed the satisfaction of Saba Sebatine with the part her wild knights had played in the attack. Go for the next cruiser, Jason sent, and Jaina pulsed a silent acknowledgment. First flight goes in now, she said. Second flight follows. Third flight watches our tails until we're clear, and then you can make your run. Lobaka and Tisar acknowledged. Dropping shadow bombs now, Jaina said. The missiles, packed with explosives instead of propellant, dropped from her X-wing's racks. With the force, Jaina shoved them on ahead, breaking her own X-wing slightly so as to increase their separation. She set them on a trajectory for the aftmost enemy cruiser, then concentrated on leading her flight's run with standard missiles and laser fire, bringing them to the target at a slightly different angle so as to fool the enemy Dovin basils which might snatch her concussion missiles without noticing the less visible shadow bombs as they approached. Space lit up ahead. A brilliant display of turbolaser fire, plasma cannon projectiles, magma missiles, concussion missiles, and burning craft. This was the most dangerous part of her approach, Jane and you, flying in between the big capital ships pounding each other at point-blank range. She could be flamed by her own side without their even noticing her presence. Yet she knew somehow that she was in no real danger. More tangible than the missile and turbolaser fire, she could sense the force, and this time the force wouldn't let her fail. Her laser fire raked the enemy hull. Dovin basils sucked down her concussion missiles and one of the shadow bombs, but she saw a geyser of brilliant fire as the two other shadow bombs struck the enemy and she pulled up and away as more bombs dropped into the inferno. Lobaka's second flight, six seconds behind, scored another series of hits. Though the cruiser wasn't destroyed, it was no longer able to defend itself effectively, and the New Republic cruisers began to strike home with one attack after another. The Yuzhan Vong ship was doomed. First flight, second flight, skips on your tail, Tisar's voice called, not through the force, but over Jaina's headphones. Scissors, Loie, 
Jaina called. I'll break right. One flight would go right, the other left, and then they would interweave to shoot the enemy off each other's tails. Negative twin one, another stern voice called. It was a voice that Jaina had learned to trust. Behind her, burning coral skippers lit the night. Thank you, Colonel Harona, she called as scimitar squadron flashed past her cockpit, their colossal iron engines speeding them past. Don't thank me, Harona said. Jason told us you might need help about now. Sometimes, Dana thought, her brother was positively eerie. The second enemy cruiser was a burning wreck, unable to fire and unable to defend itself, leaving only one functional enemy cruiser against six of Crethes. Three concentrated on the lone enemy, while the others and most of the smaller ships dived after the transports. About a third of the transports tried to land on Duro, but were blown out of the atmosphere before they could put down. The rest scattered and were picked off one by one by the New Republic forces. After the transports and the single cruiser were destroyed, Crefe's cruisers settled into low orbit over Duro and pounded anything on the ground that looked like a warrior Damotech. Warehouse, command center, factory, or spaceport. Jaina didn't know if she liked the idea of bombardment from orbit, and she could sense Jason's stern disapproval through the force. Though she could understand the advantage of hitting an enemy from a position of safety, a bombardment was contrary to her Jedi instincts and training, which focused on actions that were more precise and far less random. Despite the Jedi's attitude, bombardment of the enemy was part of Admiral Crefe's standard orders. Crefe's question number one, how can I hurt the Vong today, was best answered by blowing up things. Remember, Crefe had said, they destroy entire worlds by seeding alien life forms from orbit. Just think what they did to Ithor. What we're doing is merciful by comparison. True, Jaina supposed, as far as it went. Regroup, twin squadron, she called. Prepare for recall. Her fighters slotted neatly into their assigned formations. Through the force, she could feel their pride, their sense of accomplishment. Her relentless insistence on drills and practice sessions had paid off. In the nearly three months since her visit to Moon Calamari, months filled with raids and skirmishes and alarms, she hadn't lost a single pilot. Three X-wings had been destroyed or so badly damaged they were scrapped, but the pilots had always ejected before their craft were wrecked and were recovered afterward. Her six rookies were now proud veterans, all with kills to their credit. A few weeks ago, Jaina had astonished her Nemoidian wingmate, Vale, by sitting with her at the breakfast table and engaging in a conversation that had nothing to do with tactics or with Vale's deficiencies as a pilot. Vale and the other rookies had proved themselves. They were worth knowing. But though Jaina was friendlier than she'd been, she was careful to avoid actual friendship. Her determination hadn't lessened over the months. She knew that the raids on Yuzhan Vong territory had been carefully planned to take advantage of temporary enemy weaknesses. The attacks had been made only against outnumbered or ambushed forces, and were aborted if the enemy proved stronger than anticipated. Often, the enemy were second-rate troops, peace brigade or mercenaries or Yuzhan Vong workers, with scant warrior training who fell apart into a confused muddle once their yamisks were jammed. Jaina's own rookies had been blooded, but they'd been blooded in battles where great pains had been taken to assure only victory. Jaina knew that Twin Sun's squadron couldn't expect battle on such favorable terms forever. Sooner or later, the enemy would launch another offensive, and then her squadron would be up against first-line Vong warriors, attacking from a position of overwhelming strength. It would make every fight her new pilots had experienced look like a playground skirmish between children. The knowledge that the enemy offensive would inevitably come kept Jaina on edge. Just because things had been going well was no reason to relax. In fact, she had to be harder than ever in order to keep her pilots from slacking off due to overconfidence. Fortunately, a few things kept Jaina from exploding with tension. Kip's powerful and strangely stabilizing presence. Jason's otherworldly calm. Regular messages from her parents, from Luke and Mara. 
and from Jag Fell. His squadron was still hunting Yuzhan Vong on the Hidian Way, and with her he shared the frustrations of a veteran pilot training a large number of rookies. She was confused about what she should allow Jag to mean to her. She feared he was a distraction, that if she let him into her life, she'd lose her edge. But then moments would come in which she yearned for his embrace, felt the press of his phantom lips on hers. It was lucky they were apart, she decided. If they were together, the turmoil of her own thoughts and desires might overwhelm her. But a part of her very much wanted to be overwhelmed. Her heart lurched as her cockpit displays flashed. A Yuzhan Vong task force had just left hyperspace. Seven capital ships of varying sizes, all of them now venting squadrons of coral skippers. The Yuzhan Vong defending Duro had called for help, but it had arrived too late. For a moment Jaina waited in suspense. The two forces were nearly evenly matched. Crefe's cruisers had taken little damage in their lopsided fight, and few fighters had been lost. The Jedi force meld was an advantage the enemy couldn't match. A nearly bloodless victory had been won, and the New Republic forces were exultant. Morale was as high as it was ever going to get. If Crefe gave the word, his task force would fling itself on the enemy in absolute confidence of victory. Crefe could win this, win two battles in a single day. He had to know that. Cruisers, regroup, came the order on the command channel. Starfighters, stand by for recovery and transit to hyperspace. Jaina felt the tension drain out of her, and the exultation, too. Crefe was playing it safe. He was probably right, she thought. This might not be the only enemy force on its way to help Duro. But Jaina felt disappointment. She knew the force was with her today, and might not be on the day of the next battle. I believe I've found the trap I've been looking for, Akbar said, the trap that will spell doom for the Yuzhan Vong. He floated in his pool, at home, with Luke, Cal Omas, and Admiral Sov sitting in plush chairs on the rim. The room smelled pleasantly of the sea. Winter stood by with a hollow projector. She switched on the projector, and a star map floated in the air over Akbar's head. Luke knew from the star density that it had to be somewhere in the core, but otherwise the configurations of the stars were unfamiliar to him. This is Treskov 115W, Akbar said, as one of the stars blinked against the background. It's an old main-sequence star on the outermost fringe of the deep core, completely unexceptionable. As you can see from the overlay of our official hyperspace route charts, a narrow golden ribbon appeared on the display, a hyperspace route leading to the blinking star. Treskov is a dead end. But if we add the secret imperial core routes that Princess Leia brought back from Bastion... Four other routes appeared on the display, marked in red and radiating from Treskov. You see that unmarked routes from Treskov lead farther into the core. One of these, another blinking light, leads to an Imperial star base codenamed Tarkin's Fang. The base was sealed and evacuated at the end of the Galactic Civil War, but otherwise remains intact and usable. There is also a large cache of supplies stored at Tarkin's Fang that the Empire intended to use in the event of renewed hostilities. Even Tarkin's Fang is a dead end, Admiral Sov pointed out. If we put forces there, they could be blockaded by any enemy who sealed the route to Treskov. I agree, Akbar said, and I intend the enemy to agree as well. Perspective shifted on the hollow, the display zooming to display Treskov and its system. The fifth planet out, a gas giant striped in white and several shades of green, began to wink. This is Ebak, a gas giant with eleven moons. Of these, Ebak-9 was once exploited by the Deep Core Mining Corporation for its deposits of bronzium. The moon was opened up shortly after the rise of Palpatine. 
During the war years, the Empire maintained an observation post there and used EBAC-9 as an emergency resupply point. But the moon is now empty. Akbar ducked his head beneath the water, refreshing himself, then shook stray drops from his massive head. I propose we reoccupy the moon and use it as bait in a trap. We must make it an irresistible target for the Yuzhan Vong. And then, once the enemy begin their assault, we seal off the end and turn the Treskov system into a killing ground in which the enemy forces are hunted down and destroyed. Akbar turned to Sin Sov. Admiral, it is you who must commit the forces necessary to destroy the Yuzhan Vong. And then Akbar turned to Luke, and Luke felt a chill run down his spine. Master Skywalker, the Admiral said, it is for you and the Jedi to provide the bait. I'm calling this meeting of the High Council for two reasons, Kalomas said. First, we must discuss Admiral Akbar's plan for a renewed attack against the Yuzhan Vong. Second, Intelligence Director Discar has an announcement of critical importance. Cal looked abnormally grim. He was usually relaxed at meetings, joking as he slouched his lanky body into its seat. Today he was erect and businesslike. Clearly something important was at hand. The council members weren't as crowded as they had been at their first meeting, even though they met in the same room with the same overlarge table. The crowding had eased because fewer were present. Kipduron and Sabasebatine were at Kashiik, fighting with their squadrons, and had given their proxy votes to Silgal and to Luke, respectively. I have no intention of communicating the details of Admiral Akbar's plan to this council, Cal said. Its usefulness depends on secrecy, and in any case it's irrelevant to the case I wish to put. Akbar's plan requires detaching large forces from their current deployments and using them against the Yuzhan Vong. This will mean that many of our squadrons now engaged in the defense of our worlds won't be available in case the Yuzhan Vong choose to attack. If our fleets are on the offensive, Tribak proclaimed, the Vong will have more urgent things to do than to... than to attack our planets. Sir... Our briefings have indicated that many more ships will be available in six standard months or so, said the soft voice of Talam Ranth. Would it not be possible to delay our offensive until we can both defend our planets and attack the enemy? My Gotal colleague has a point, Reliki Akla said. It may be possible to delay any offensive until we have greater numbers. There's a time limit on the Admiral's plan. Luke said. We currently have a technological advantage over the enemy. We don't know how long this advantage will last, so the Admiral wants to move now. Delaying six months, Sinsov said, means the war goes on six months longer than it would otherwise. Six more months of killing and uncertainty and expense. He looked at Tolum Ranth. Thousands of worlds are under threat. The fleet can't defend them all even with six months' worth of reinforcements. My colleagues' arguments are logical, the Gotal said. I concede that an attack is logical. If I may interrupt, Difskar said, I'd like to bring my own business before the Council. It may have a direct bearing on whether the New Republic wishes to go on the offensive or not. Luke looked at the thin man with care. When Akbar had first presented his plan, Scour had been meticulous about discovering Akbar's timing. This had made Luke suspicious, and Luke's suspicions had been confirmed at council meetings. Scour clearly had an agenda of his own, and it was an agenda with a timetable. Scour looked from one council member to the next. I am now able to reveal the existence of a secret unit in New Republic intelligence called Alpha Red. It is headed by Joy Eikroth, a xenobiologist, formerly belonging to Alpha Blue, another secret unit charged with Yuzhan Vong affairs. 
Since the beginning of the war, Alpha Red has undertaken covert research on Yuzhan Vong biology with the assistance of a team of scientists supplied by the Chiss. Here it is, Luke thought. Something big, something very quiet that had gone on for at least two years without a breath of it getting out. In a government as porous as Borsk Felia's, that was a major accomplishment. Unless Felia himself didn't know, Luke thought. Why Chiss? Seensov asked, bewildered. The Chiss come from a hidden, remote section of the galaxy far from the Yuzhan Vong invasion routes, Scour said. It was highly unlikely that the enemy would have infiltrated them. Which means, Luke thought, that Scour's had contact with the Chiss for some time. He knew in advance that he could count on them to deliver. Our xenobiologists and geneticists have investigated Yuzhan Vong genetics, Scour continued. He placed his pale, thin hands on the table before him. They have located a unique genetic signature in Yuzhan Vong DNA, something common to all Yuzhan Vong species. The plants, the living buildings and ships, the animals, the Vong themselves. This genetic signature is unknown in any plant, animal, bacterial or viral life within our own galaxy. You've developed a weapon, Tolum Ranth said. Luke could feel surprise among the other council members, followed by apprehension and dread. Yes, Cal's face was grim. We have a weapon. A biological weapon, Diffscour said. An airborne weapon that will attack only those plants or animals that possess the genetic signature of the extragalactic Vong. If the weapon is dispersed efficiently on enemy worlds, we calculate that the menace of the Yuzhan Vong will be ended within four weeks at the most, probably three. What do you mean, ended? asked Silgal. I mean the Vong will be dead, Scour said, and everything the Yuzhan Vong brought with them, all the plants, all the buildings, all the ships. He shrugged. There may be some survivors in remote areas but they'll be infected if they travel to Vong worlds, and if they don't, they can be hunted down. He glanced briefly at each of the council members. Biological weapons are notoriously capricious, he continued. Normally I would never recommend their use on a dispersed population like the Vong, but this weapon will be so effective that I consider it an exception to my usual rule. The Vong can't escape it, it will attach to their genetics. There is a latency period of four or five days in which they will feel no effects, but will be infectious and contaminate everyone and everything they contact. After that, they will begin to break down on the cellular level. Their living tissue will dissolve into a fluid, and even that fluid will be infectious. They will be infected by their ships, their weapons, their armor, their homes, their food. Everything in their environment will carry the disease. Once the breakdown starts, the Vong will be dead within three or four days. Luke let the horror sink in. The horror was followed by anger. Anger is a useful emotion, he remembered Verger telling him. And he turned to Cal Omis. How long have you known about this? he asked. Since I was sworn in, Cal said. Almost three months. Cal turned his own eyes to Luke. Master Skywalker, I'm extremely sorry. But you understand that the secrecy of this project was paramount. I understand your reasoning, Luke said. And I disagree, he thought coldly. Because if I'd known in advance, I could have prepared arguments against this. As it is, I can only make the arguments that occur to me and hope the Force will be with me. He looked at Diff Scour. You want to use the Great River to distribute this weapon, don't you? He said. Scour nodded. That would be convenient. Luke shook his head. Jedi won't touch this. I ask you not to require it of us. Scour seemed unsurprised. The Great River isn't vital to the project. Our own intelligence networks now extend into Vong space. The fleet can deliver the weapon on missiles to enemy fleet targets, to space facilities, or to planets. And the Bothans made Alpha Red 
much more convenient when they declared Arkry on the Vong. The Bothan Spinet is famously efficient, and Alpha Red will settle all their goals for this war. He shrugged his thin shoulders. The Yuzhan Vong themselves will do most of the distribution on our behalf, as their infected personnel and ships travel from world to world. Tolum Ranth turned his red eyes to Luke. Master Skywalker obviously objects to this plan, he said. I wish he'd explain his protests. Luke looked at the others. The Jedi exist to preserve life. This slaughter of entire species runs contrary to our principles. He took a breath and summoned the Force and hoped that it would make his arguments as brilliant as they needed to be. Let me point out that the Yuzhan Vong are not so completely unlike us, he said. They are intelligent and educable. If you took one of their young and raised it, the child wouldn't be unlike one of ours. Their evil isn't innate to the species. It's their government and their religion that have made them aggressive, and it should be our task to defeat that government and religion, not to wipe out the common people who have had no choice but to follow their leaders. The Yuzhan Vong have done this to our worlds, Idar Neely Kirka pointed out. They've sown our worlds with life forms that have killed everyone on the planet. Which is simply another point against the use of this weapon. Tolum Rant's declaration surprised everyone at the table. If we unleash this weapon against them, they could retaliate against us. We could lose worlds to Vong Biologicals. Alpha Red is a defense against such an attack, Scara said. Alpha Red would destroy any biological assault the Vong could launch. Tribak gave a roar that brought silence to the table. I know something of science, he said finally through translation. I know the word blowback. He glanced at the others. For those who don't know this term, it describes a weapon's unanticipated side effects turning on the user. He looked at Diff Scour. You're planning to distribute Alpha Red throughout Vong space. Billions upon billions upon billions of live bacteria, or viruses or whatever Alpha Red is, cast loose on viable ecosystems. He shook his shaggy head. You can't tell me that Alpha Red won't mutate, not in all those replications. And you can't assure me that one of those mutations won't be harmful to us. Blowback could kill all of us. The Chess assure me this is highly unlikely, Scour said. Unlikely, Luke said. Not impossible. Scour shrugged. If this is a worry, we could quarantine Vong worlds until we can assure they're safe. Refugees will be upset at not being able to move home immediately, but once victory is achieved, we should be able to pacify them. Scour had anticipated every argument. He'd had months to prepare this. Luke had only this moment. You haven't spoken of Yuzhan Vong biological capabilities, Luke said. Scour raised an eyebrow. I don't understand, Master Skywalker. The Yuzhan Vong have formidable biological knowledge, Luke said. They do everything through biotech. Can you tell me they haven't anticipated this form of attack? How do you know they aren't ready for it? How do you know that once they see we're ready to commit genocide and ecocide both, they won't retaliate in kind? For the first time, Scour seemed at a loss. We see no sign of it. You don't understand everything about the Vong, Trebox said. My guess is that you have at best a cursory knowledge of their immune systems. What if they're ready for you? Scour hesitated. A corner of his eye twitched. We have no evidence to show anything of the sort. Have you looked? Luke asked. Scour seemed nettled. Of course. We've captured and examined Shaper facilities. We have a decent knowledge of the weapons they've used against us. We've captured their ships and examined them. Our knowledge of the enemy is deficient, Tolum Ranth said. His double-horned head turned slowly left and right, scanning the table. Clearly it would be illogical to proceed with this plan. Diffscour's face tautened, 
only increasing the death mask effect. The weapon is fully tested, he said, and that includes on live subjects. He raised a hand to cut off Luke's explosion of protest. Warrior prisoners, he said. We have to keep the warriors unconscious after we capture them, because the second they wake, they try to commit suicide. We infected a small number of these with the weapon. The weapon... He took a breath. The weapon works. I regretted extremely the necessity of having to do this, but a test was required, and their deaths were as painless and humane as we could make them. He put his hands on the table before him. I assure everyone here that Alpha Red will work, and will do everything that is promised. This is unconscionable, Luke said. Never had he felt such cold rage. This is something Palpatine might have done. Difscar gave him a furious glance. No, this is not what Palpatine would have done, he said. Palpatine would have tested the weapon on the population of an entire world, and used it as a terror weapon to keep other worlds in subjugation. I ask Master Skywalker to avoid such odious comparisons. There was a long moment of silence, broken by Cal. Perhaps we should vote them, Cal said. Those in favor? Difscour's hand went up first, then Neely Kirkus, then with hesitation the hand of Sinsov. Luke kept his hands on the table. So did all the Jedi. I cast Sabasebatine's proxy against the motion, he said. And I cast Kip Duran's. Silgal echoed. The motion fails. Reliki Akla said. Then Cal Umas turned to Luke. There was regret in his eyes. I'm sorry, Luke, he said. But in a war that we're losing, we can't afford to throw away any weapons, particularly one that will end so much suffering and heartache for our people. He turned to Diffscour. This council is advisory, not legislative. As chief of state... I ordered Difscar to continue the Alpha Red project. Luke sat, stunned. Difscar looked at his hands in order to hide the cold triumph in his eyes. Sorrow dug deep furrows into Cal's brows. This is a tragedy in every way, he said. But our only choice is between one tragedy and another. And I prefer to make the Vong's story a tragedy and not ours. He looked at Difscour. When can you have your weapon ready? There is only a small sample of the material at present, Scour said. We'll need to produce much more. Tons, at least. The secure Alpha Red facility is unsuited for producing such quantities. He turned to Cal. There's an old Nebulon B frigate in orbit above Moon Calamari, used as a hospital ship. If we could shift the patients to the surface... Alpha Red could take advantage of the ship's isolation and sterile environment. Once we get there, I anticipate enough product can be made to begin distribution within two weeks. Cal turned to the others. In that case, he said, we'll postpone implementation of Admiral Akbar's offensive plans. We may as well stay on the defensive until Alpha Red wins the war. He looked at the others. Of course, no one is to speak of this matter until the end of the war. If then. He brought the council meeting to a swift end. He cast one regretful glance at Luke, then stood and made his rapid way out, followed with equal rapidity by Diffscour. Feeling a hundred years old, Luke rose slowly from the table. Trebach and the Jedi came to stand beside him. What can we do? Silgal asked. Luke forced a casual shrug. Try to change Cal's mind. We have a couple of weeks at least. If there is more that you wish to do... Trebach left the thought unfinished. Luke shook his head. Thank you for the offer, but no. If Luke did anything, he would do it himself and take the responsibility on himself alone. But he knew that if he did... He would throw away everything he'd worked for in the course of his long, exacting life. 
Luke returned home after the meeting of the High Council with dread and anger worrying in his mind. Nothing could be done as long as he was in this state, so he sat on the floor and began to apply relaxing techniques to get his thoughts and emotions under control. He felt Mara in the forest before she entered the apartment. She paused for a moment in the doorway, her own force awareness gently enfolding him, and then she closed the door, put down the briefcase she was carrying, and joined him on the floor. She sat behind him, her hands on his shoulders, and began working at the taut shoulder and neck muscles. Luke surrendered to the touch, let her fingers turn his muscles to liquid. His breath fell into rhythm with hers. Mara worked herself closer until she was pressed against his back. Her arms went around him, and she rested her chin on his shoulder. "'What's the bad news?' she said. Luke hesitated, but he knew Mara could be trusted, and besides the horror was too vast to keep to himself. He told her about Alpha Red. Mara drew back slightly as she considered the problem. "'What can we do?' Try to change Cal's mind. Her chin dropped onto his shoulder again. Her voice was a breath on his ear. And if his mind doesn't change? Luke took a long breath. I don't know. We could try to wreck the project, but unless we killed the scientists, they'd be able to duplicate their work. And even if we killed the scientists or managed to kidnap them and hold them somewhere, other scientists would be able to duplicate the project. The problem is that once this weapon is known to be possible, anyone with the proper facilities can create it. He shook his head. I worked all my life to rebuild the Jedi. Now we have a government that's willing to work with us, that we've helped into office, that's re-established the Council, and which we've sworn to uphold. How can I turn on the New Republic at the very first crisis? He took Mar's hand in his own. That would finish the Jedi. We'd be outlaws. We'd be everything that people like Fior Rodan said we were. She looked at him with sad concern. What you're saying is that we really can't stop Alpha Red. At best we can only delay... But can we really stand by and let this thing happen? We can protest. We can refuse to have anything to do with it. That's all I can think of. Protest, yes. But how publicly? Again, Luke shook his head. Too public and the Yuzhan Vong find out. Then they could hit us with bioweapons first, and it would be catastrophe. You say that Tribok knows... And that Talam Ranth voted with you. Yes. You need to contact them. See if they can change the minds of others on the High Council. Luke nodded. A quiet lobbying campaign, then. Discour caught me by surprise, and I didn't have my arguments in order. He nodded and kissed Mara's cheek. Thank you. You're welcome. She rose to her feet and helped him to rise. Cam Solisar sent new hollows of Ben. Would you like to see them? Of course. Seeing Ben speeding over the carpet on hands and knees gave Luke the usual mixture of sadness and joy, but served to shift his mood. He walked to the back of the apartment to change and wash before helping with dinner, and then froze as he saw a bundle of feathers in the spare room. Verger. She had been in the apartment all along. She was crouched in a meditation posture, her knees high, her head tucked in. Horrified, Luke returned to Mara. Verger's in her room. I didn't sense her when I came in. Mara's green eyes widened. I didn't either. She was making herself invisible again. Do you think she heard us? Mara considered. It isn't as if we were shouting. We were centimeters from each other, practically whispering. How could she have heard? I wouldn't put anything past her. Mara's look hardened. Neither would I. We're going to have to watch her carefully. Unless... Do you think we should have Neely Kirka put her in detention again? And give her a chance to stage a spectacular escape? 
And what if she doesn't want to go? Do we fight her? Watch, then, Luke decided, and watch very carefully. Chapter 23 Verger was a model of innocence for the next eight days, during which time Luke and Mara kept track of her when she wasn't with Silgal or other Jedi. During that time, Luke's lobbying efforts were nothing but frustration. Cal listened politely to his arguments, but didn't change his mind. On the morning of the ninth day, New Republic security burst down the door and swept through the apartment. Diff Scour had come in person, flinty eyes hard in his gaunt face. "'The Chief of State wants to see you,' he told Luke. His eyes flicked to Mara. "'And Mara may come as well.' Cal Umus was in his office. He was unshaven and disheveled and had clearly just risen from bed. As Diff Scour marched Luke and Mara into the office, Cal stared for a moment at a fragrant fruit-filled pastry that had been provided for his breakfast— and then, with a look of disgust, swept it from his desk. He looked at Luke with eyes of stone. "'Where's Verger?' "'We saw her tonight in her room,' Luke said, just before bed. "'She's not in her room now,' Cal said. "'We don't know where she is.' Luke took a deep breath. "'What has she done?' "'As if you didn't know?' Discour breathed from behind Luke's shoulder. Verger has sabotaged Alpha Red, Cal said. Luke's mouth went dry. Sabotaged it how? The Alpha Red team was in the process of moving to the Nebulon B cruiser in orbit. Somehow Verger got on board in the confusion. She's wiped the records, and somehow she's... altered... the weapon. Altered? Luke echoed. Rendered it ineffective. We don't know how. Through her tears, Luke thought. She could modify the weapon at the molecular level. And she's rendered three of my security guards unconscious, Diffscour added. Mara turned to him. They're all right? They will be. Cal's eyes bored into Luke. So where is she? I don't know. Truthfully. Where would she run to? Back to the Vong, of course, Diffscour said. She's been working for them all along. I... I don't think so, Luke said. I think Verger is entirely on her own. She doesn't owe the Yuzhan Vong her allegiance any more than we do, Mara added. She's a servant of the Old Republic, not the New. So tell us why the Old Republic wants the Yuzhan Vong to win the war, Diffscour shouted. She doesn't. Luke said. She just doesn't want an atrocity like Alpha Red to be unleashed. And who told her about the atrocity then? Cal's voice was cold. Who broke security? Luke gathered himself for the admission, but Mara forestalled him. We didn't tell her, she said. If she found out, she found out on her own. True enough, Luke decided. But how? Scour demanded. You had no documents to take home, no recordings, unless— His voice turned suspicious. You surreptitiously made one. I didn't, Luke said. Cal looked at him for a long moment, then looked down at his desk. That's what Verger herself confirmed. He scratched his bristly chin. She left a note saying that something a scientist said made her suspicious, and that she followed up her suspicions. She specifically exonerated you. But then she would, Scour said, especially if she did this under your orders. I gave no orders, Luke said. He felt helpless under this kind of suspicion. There was no way to prove himself innocent. He looked at Cal. I haven't given up trying to talk you out of it. Sir, Diffscour spoke to Cal, if she goes back to the Vong with Alpha Red, then the New Republic is in jeopardy. The enemy will know our capabilities, and they'll have to do whatever they can to destroy us before we can revive the Alpha Red project. The Skywalkers think she won't go to the Yuzhan Vong, 
Cal said. They've been wrong up until now, Scour said, and in any case we can't afford to take the chance. True. Cal's eyes moved restlessly over his desk. All right, then. He looked at Scour. You need to reestablish Alpha Red at a safer location, and have the team duplicate their original work. That will take how long? At least three months, probably four. Cal nodded. He turned to Luke. We'll move on Akbar's plan immediately. If the Vong are responding to Akbar's moves, then maybe they won't have time to kill the rest of us. Yes, sir, Luke said. His mind buzzed with calculation. It would be three or four months before Alpha Red was unleashed. That meant Luke had three months to win the war. If the enemy were on the edge of defeat, then perhaps Cal wouldn't feel it necessary to wipe the Yuzhan Vong from existence. The Jedi were his eyes and ears. Formations hovered in Jason's mind, lumbering transports, weapon-studded capital ships, racing squadrons of starfighters. It was a fleet exercise, featuring a force aided by the Jedi meld against a superior force unaided by the Jedi. The force glowed in Jason like a flame, and he maneuvered the friendly squadrons like elements in a gigantic puzzle, trying to sense what would happen many moves in advance. The opposing fleet made its move. As the fleets clashed, powered down lasers flashing as computers launched simulated missiles, the picture in Jason's head seemed to expand, information arriving in larger and larger bundles until he strained to keep up with it all. He felt sweat trickle down the bridge of his nose. The picture deteriorated into frantic, busy hash, punctuated only rarely by moments of clarity. The meld always broke down when the situation grew too complex. Jason could contain and control a large number of Jedi, like those engaged on the raid at Duro, but beyond that his abilities faded. This was frustrating because he always sensed that comprehension was possible, if just beyond his reach. If only there were more Jedi in the Link. If only he were more clever. Still, his preliminary maneuvering had put the fleet in good shape, and as the battle went on he was able to achieve some flashes of insight that made sense out of the chaos. When the exercise ended, the opposition's advantage in numbers had been annulled, and the exchange of simulated casualties had favored Jason's force. "'Try not to get me killed next time, Solo,' Corrin Horn, whose commitment to the fight had been mistimed, sent a dour message over the comlink. Jason sent an apology. He had to get better at this. Next time the missiles wouldn't be simulated. Splendid work, Jason. Out of the force and on Raw Roost's tactical command center, Admiral Crefe's cream-colored body bounced on the balls of his feet. Next battle we're going to hammer them. The Bothan punched his palm by way of emphasis. I hope so, Jason said. He had to get better at this. Too many people were counting on him. It had become a custom for the Jedi to dine together after the exercise. They reviewed the maneuvers, the way the meld had worked or failed to work, and suggested improvements. After the group broke up, Jason sought out to hear Vela. You're doing well? he asked. She frowned. I'm working hard. It was the truth. Since Anakin's death, she had grown serious, almost grim in the way that she pursued her goals, a considerable change from the impetuous, fiery girl Jason remembered from the Jedi Academy. I wonder if I might ask you a question, Jason said. Of course. I wonder if, since you came back from capture, whether you've ever felt the ability to, uh, sense the Yuzhan Vaughn? Tahiri was startled. No. Why do you ask? She brushed the blonde hair from her face. Jason explained about his own capture, and how the implanted slave seed had given him the ability to connect telepathically with the Yuzhan Vong. Tahiri shivered. No, 
I've never experienced that, and I'm glad. That must be awful. It's all right. It's helped me understand them. He looked at her. And it can be useful in detecting the enemy and in controlling their bioweapons. Jason hesitated. The truth is, I was wondering if it might be possible to teach the Vong sense to someone else. Tahiri took a step back, her eyes widening. And you want to see if I can contact the Yuzhan Vong through the Force? No, not through the Force. It's a different sort of bond. Through their... Her face twisted. Slave implants. Yes, you know that I hate them. Her eyes burned fiercely into Jason's. I hate them. I know I'm a Jedi and I'm not supposed to hate anyone, but I can't help it. Not after what they've done. Jason nodded. I understand. I don't want to put you through anything that will make you uncomfortable or that will bring back bad memories. All right, then. She nodded. I'm sorry, Jason. That's fine. Tahiri began to walk away, and then she hesitated and turned. Is it important? She asked. I can't say, Jason said, but it will help you understand the Yuzhan Vong, and perhaps when you understand them, you won't hate them so much. I want to hate them. Her lips pressed together in a firm, defiant line. It takes a lot of energy to hate, Jason said. You might have other uses for that energy, Tahiri. Again she hesitated. All right, she said finally. I'll give it a try. They went to Jason's small cabin, sat in meditation posture on the floor, and touched hands. He sensed Tahiri's expanding force awareness, and he said, no, not the Force. This power comes from somewhere else. Tahiri's mouth curled in annoyance. What do I do, then? Try to look into... into an empty place where the slave implants were. I'll try to guide you. Jason could find the empty place himself, and he could feel, at the edge of his awareness, the world brain he had left behind on Coruscant. He tried to build a bridge between Tahiri and the Duryam, but he couldn't seem to bring the two closer together. And he could sense Tahiri's growing frustration. The problem was that there weren't any Yuzhan Vong nearby. If there were, perhaps Tahiri wouldn't have such a hard time. I'm sort of glad it didn't work, Tahiri said afterward. Would you mind trying again later? She grimaced. I suppose we could try, but I'm not looking forward to it. After she'd left, Jason had begun to record a holovid letter to his parents when he realized he wasn't alone, not even in his own mind. Verger, he probed. In return, Jason received impressions, pictures of a green treetop landscape that he had recognized as Kashi'ik, and a strong non-verbal command to come to the planet. And this was followed by an equally powerful compulsion to silence. Secret meeting, Jason sent. There was no reply. Jason received permission to leave Rall Roost from the officer of the deck and took his X-wing to the surface, homing on Verger's presence in the force. She had chosen a small remote island for the meeting place. No Wookiees lived there but the lower depths of the Roshir forest was filled with the usual deadly native life forms. The meeting place was marked by an old four-passenger Trilon shuttle perched at a dangerous angle in the uppermost branches of one of the Roshir trees. Jason floated the X-wing toward it on his repulsor lifts and carefully dropped the starfighter onto an interwoven net of branches. As he shut off the repulsor lifts and let the branches take the fighter's weight, he was surprised by the sight of a four-meter-long, many-toothed serpent flying past his canopy. Their instinct is to eat birds, Verger explained as Jason climbed out of the cockpit and lowered himself to one of the massive Rochere limbs. I try to discourage them, but they are unintelligent and thus persistent. 
As Regier spoke, another larger snake was torn free in a shower of green foliage from an overhanging limb and went whipping through the air and over the green horizon. If I throw them into the sea, Regier said, it delays their return, but they do come back. The branch swayed under Jason's feet. It was wide as a highway, but the motion was unsettling. Can't you make yourself small, he asked. They don't detect me in the force. I think they smell me. I'm good with animals. Let me try. He expanded his awareness of the force to include the fauna of the treetops and detected the primitive, purposeful minds of several of the snakes, all of them stalking through the foliage toward Verger. Jason tried turning off the instinct to hunt, but the compulsion was hardwired into them, and he failed. Then he suggested to them that better... More appetizing food was to be found elsewhere, and they turned away in search of it. Nicely done, Verger said, and it is a tactic that can be applied to species other than snakes. Jason looked at her. Why are you here? Verger's feathery antennae crooked forward and back, as if scanning the air for invaders. I sense no other presence, she said. Did you run away? Is Neely Kirka after you? Neely Kirka and many others. Your master Skywalker among them, I think. Jason took a deep breath. He squatted on his heels on the wide branch and said, You'd better tell me. Verger told her story. Jason was horrified. Not simply because Alpha Red was a weapon for mass murder but because, thanks to the slave seed tendrils coiled about his nerves, he now possessed an empathy for the Yuzhan Vong. It was not only the human part of his mind that quailed at this revelation, but the part that understood the enemy. Roger looked at him. I have given the Jedi only a few months to respond to this horror, she said. They can rebuild the weapon? Of course. He shrugged helplessly. What should I do? I can't advise you. Should I tell people? We could put pressure on the government, but that would tell the Yuzhan Vong, and... He shrank before the consequences of that decision, the Yuzhan Vong realizing that they were in a war of extinction rather than a war of conquest. Her dark, tilted eyes gazed into his. Since I first met you, I have had an intuition that you were in some way bound up with the fate of the Yuzhan Vong. Perhaps this is the moment I have been anticipating. Jason looked at her in surprise. The fate of the Yuzhan Vong? Is that why you've taken such an interest in me? Her eyes narrowed. Beyond any other interest I would have taken in a Jedi in distress, yes. He rose to his feet. The huge branch swayed beneath him as a breeze ruffled the leaves. "'What are you going to do?' he asked. Her wide mouth twisted in thought. "'There isn't a general search for me, or you'd have heard. That means that only the intelligence people will be looking for me, which will make it easier to evade them.' She craned her long neck to look at her shuttle. My craft came to Moon Calamari with a family of refugees, who sold it to buy food. Sooner or later the dealer to whom they sold it will notice that it's missing from its orbit, and then there'll be a search. But that won't matter. The hyperdrive engines are ready to give up the ghost, and I'll be lucky to get out of the kashi Eek system. She turned to Jason. Can you give me a ride in your fighter? Certainly, but to where? To your ship, perhaps? He blinked at her. It's an assault cruiser, he said. It's got over a thousand crew. It's easy to pass as one among thousands, yes? Verger smiled. And I would be less conspicuous in a uniform, no? No, Jason said. He decided to pass over the unlikely chance that he'd find a uniform that would fit Verger. Most of the crew are Bothans. The starfighter pilots are from all over, but there aren't that many of them, and no doubt there are supply vessels coming on and off the ship all the time, Verger said. Cargo 
coming on and off, and being placed in storage, and dispatch boats and shuttles to other ships, hundreds of escape pods. With all that confusion, surely one single individual could find a way off the ship and to safety? She smiled. I am very good at being invisible. Jason sighed. He sensed an inevitability in the offing. Let's hope there aren't any big snakes aboard, he said. I'm glad to know that creepy little bird is gone, Han said. It was all I could do, not to wring her neck for what she did to Jason. He looked around. Where did Verger go to anyway? I'm not sure, Luke said. He quelled the uneasiness in his mind and asked Han and Leia to sit. The pair took the seats offered and then the drinks that Mara brought into the room. Mara took her own drink and sat on the sofa next to Luke. He put his arm around her. I wanted to tell you that I'll be leaving for a while, Luke said. I'm going across the galaxy to Fondor, and I'm not sure when I'll be back. Leia looked at him. Is it something you can talk about? I'm going to Garm Beliblis, Luke said. He commands at Fondor, and since the fall of Coruscant he's been operating independently of Sinsov and the military. Just like he did in the Rebellion, Han said. Beliblis likes running his own show. When he was given orders, at first he responded that the situation in his sector was different than the Supreme Commander thought and therefore he declined to carry them out. Lately he hasn't been responding to orders at all. You brought him into the fold once before, Leia said. I guess Cal thinks you can do it again. It hasn't been important until now, Luke said. Beliblis has been doing more or less what he should have been doing anyway, defending his sector and harassing the enemy. But now Akbar has a plan to win the war, and we need to know whether Beliblis will be in at the finish. Leia considered the question. He'll be in. He's headstrong and independent, but he'll be on the right side when it counts. I hope so, Mara said. I'd hate for Luke to make that long trip for nothing. Leia gave Luke a curious look. This mission is taking you away from the Jedi... I mean, the High Council. Can you be absent for such a long time? I'll give my proxy to Silgal. Luke said. She'll speak and vote for me and for Saba, who gave me her proxy when she joined. The strain between Luke and Cal hadn't affected the running of the High Council. Cal seemed perfectly friendly, if a bit reserved. But he no longer shared confidential information with Luke. If there were military or political secrets that Luke wasn't already a part of, then they were never mentioned in Luke's presence. The trust was gone. Luke didn't know whether he would ever win it back. Luke, for his part, still had hopes of convincing Cal not to use Alpha Red at all. But if necessary, Luke would poll the other Jedi members privately. The influence of the Council as a whole might tip the balance against Diff Scour and his plan. Together they might be able to take a principled stand against the use of the weapon. But that was for the future. For now, Luke was dedicated to making sure that Akbar's plan was carried out. If the Yuzhan Vong were defeated, then the arguments against Alpha Red would bear all that much more weight. Luke turned to Han. Speaking of Akbar, he said, he asked me if you'd do him a favor. Ice rang in Han's glass as he drained it. Anything, he said. He'd like you to resume your military rank and take command of a squadron. Han placed his glass firmly on the table next to his seat. You know, I never did take to the military, he said, and the military never took to me. If Akbar just wants to make both me and the fleet miserable, he'd like you to take command of the squadron contributed by the Smugglers' Alliance, Luke said. Talon Card, Booster Tarek, and the Errant Venture. They're a hard bunch, anarchic and rebellious and undisciplined. The ships are a heterogeneous jumble, and any tactics would have to be improvised by the squadron commander. Leia, a little grim, turned to her husband. I'd use the word never if I were you. 
Lando's part of it, too, Luke added. You know he'd make mincemeat out of a regular fleet officer. Anyone who could control that bunch would have to be as rough as they are, and as experienced. The commander would have to be able to fly the pants off any of them and... And whip fifty times his weight in angry crate dragons. Leia finished. She looked at Han. You see what my brother's trying to do, don't you? she said. He's trying to flatter you into taking this job. He's trying to tell you that only Han Solo could possibly be tough enough for this assignment. Han smiled. He's right, of course, he said. But the word never is still on the tip of my tongue. Luke sighed. You're going to force me to fight dirty, he said. I really didn't want to do this. Han laughed. Hit me with your best shot. Luke made an apologetic gesture. During the upcoming operation, the Smugglers' Alliance Squadron will be in support of Admiral Crefe's fleet, which includes your children. Sorry. Han looked stricken. Leia narrowed her eyes and glared at her brother. That is really underhanded, Luke, she said. I know, Luke said. We had both gotten out. We were going to have time together. We were going to be happy, sorry. And now... She clenched her fists. Now it's all up to us again, isn't it? Luke smiled. The fate of the galaxy may well rest in your hands. Yes. It's unfair, but that's the way it is. Leia raised a fist. When this is over, she said, remind me to hit you. Luke raised his hands peaceably. Kip's first in line, he said. But when this is over, take all the shots you want. Jason was returning from Kashi Eek to the Raw Roost when he was calmed by Kip Duran. I need all Jedi on Moon Atapine for a meeting. It's urgent. Can I wash and change first? Jason asked. I've been down on Kashi Eek and I'm kind of a mess. I said urgent, Kip snapped. We need you now. Jason considered the small figure of Verger, who was crammed into the cockpit on his lap. Better make yourself very small, he thought. Acknowledged, he said. Verger managed to avoid discovery when Jason landed his X-wing in the cruiser's capacious docking bays. She remained in the cockpit, ducking down out of sight as he dropped to the deck and went in search of his fellow Jedi. Kip, seated at the end of one of the mess tables, had assembled the other Jedi in a corner of the officer's mess. Jason entered cautiously and saw Corrin Horn, along with Jaina, Tisar, Lobaka, and the other newly made Jedi. As he entered, Saba and her squadron of wild knights turned to stare at him with glittering reptilian eyes. Jason tried to calm the panic that fluttered in his ribcage and said, "'What's going on?' Kip looked at him. I have an urgent message from Master Skywalker. He said that Verger has run away from Mon Calamari, and if we see her, we're to detain her and take her to Mon Calamari or to New Republic Intelligence. Even though he'd known approximately what the message would contain, still Jason felt an unpleasant surge of emotion at Kip's words. In the last few months, Jason had become an expert at deception. He'd lied to the Yuzhan Vong, and he'd lied to Ganner Rysod in order to capture him for the enemy. But lying to an entire room of Jedi, Jedi alongside of whom he'd been fighting for the last months, was a new ordeal. Verger, he said, calming himself. What's she done? Master Skywalker didn't say. But it has to be important, because Verger is now our number one priority. If we have any notion where she might be, we're to drop everything and go in search of her but we're not to search alone. Verger is to be considered dangerous and should be apprehended by Jedi working as teams. Saba Sebatine raised a hand. We are not to break into Pax and search the galaxy now, are we? No, we're to stay with the fleet until we hear from Verger or until we hear of her. And then we're to get her secured and back where she belongs. He turned his eyes to Jason, and Jason felt a cold hand brush his spine. 
You're closer to her than anyone here, Kip said. Master Skywalker thought she might try to contact you. She'd have to be out of her mind to come to Kashiyik, Jason said with perfect truth. There are too many Jedi here. Right, Kip said, though Jason still sensed his suspicion. Kip rose from the table. It's unlikely that we'll see her. We're all moving out anyway. Jason stood quietly, motionless on the deck. Moving out? Right, brother, Jaina said. We're on continual alert. Something big's happening. The whole fleet's getting ready to move. Rumor says it's the Corps, Cornhorn said. But we know how accurate rumor's been in this war. Jaina, on her way out of the meeting, slapped Jason on the shoulder. See you when we get there, she said. Wherever there is, Jason thought. And wondered, now that the whole fleet was on alert, how he was going to get Verger off his ship. Chapter 24 We're installing blast-proof doors here, the engineer said. Once you get your people inside, you can drop the doors and be perfectly safe for, ooh, several hours at least. Several hours at least, Jaina repeated. In the frigid air, her breath misted out in front of her as she spoke. She looked at the busy droids, which were lifting huge, clattering pneumatic hammers to widen the old mine shaft. What no one had yet explained to her was why she would have to seek safety from the enemy in tunnels of Ebac 9, which seemed to be a perfectly useless moonlit at the end of a twisty hyperspace passage into the deep core. But that seemed a part of the plan, whatever the plan was. Ebac 9 was abuzz with military engineers modifying the docking bays that once held mining shuttles, installing shields and a modern communications system bringing the old life-support and artificial gravity systems up to current specs. The engineers were protected by a reinforced squadron under General Farlander, forty capital ships in all, far larger than the force he'd led at Obroa Sky. Farlander, with Jaina under his command, was supposed to defend this useless moon. But the moon was also being turned into a giant bunker, and Jaina and the others were being given instruction in how to hide there. Why hide? Why defend Ebac 9 in the first place? The plan didn't make any sense. Nor did Jaina know where the rest of Triast Crefe's fleet had gone. Crefe, Jason, and most of the other Jedi hadn't come to Ebac 9 with Jaina and Farlander. They were off on some other mission. Jaina didn't know where. All she knew were the drills. Maneuvers aimed at readying Farlander's squadron for defending the mined-out moon then more maneuvers aimed at breaking off combat, landing on the moon, and hiding deep underground. We'll have power packs, life suits, blasters, and ammunition stored here, the engineer went on. We'll also have dried rations and water. Blasters, Gina repeated. Ammunition. She shivered in her heavy jacket, and the movement almost lifted her from the deck in the moonlit's light gravity. Her inner ear trembled on the edge of vertigo. According to rumor, this plan was Akbar's work. Gina hoped not, because that meant that Akbar, as well as his plan, was insane. Time to give them their first hint, Mara said, the first hint of the final redoubt in the deep core. Neely Kirka's eyes brightened. How much should we tell them? Just give them a hint at first, Mara advised. We don't want to hand them the whole thing. If they put the pieces together themselves, they'll believe even more in what they're learning. Very well, Neely Kirka said. Perhaps the office of Senator Kral Project could hear about an emergency appropriation for a base in the Deep Corps, and you could combine that with a leak concerning an evacuation drill for the Chief of State and the Advisory Council. Neely Kirka's air sac throbbed thoughtfully. Yes, he said. Yes, I think that might do the job. Stars blossomed around Jason as Ralroost fell out of hyperspace. 
He sat in front of Admiral Crefe on the assault cruiser's bridge, with tactical displays laid out around him. They were as deep in the deep core as he'd ever ventured. The stars packed so tightly around them that it was never quite night. E back nine, Crefe said meditatively, as the moon and its giant primary appeared on the navigation arrays. He turned to the communications officer. Send my compliments to General Farlander, and request that he report aboard at his earliest convenience. He turned to Jason. If you wish to see your sister, he said, you have my permission. Thank you, sir. Jason rose from his seat and withdrew from Ralroost's bridge. Crefe's fleet had reached the end of their long, erratic journey. While Farlander's squadron had flown directly to Ebak, Ralroost and the rest of Crefe's fleet had been engaged in a series of raids against the enemy. On every occasion the Jedi wove their force meld to coordinate the attacking forces. Wayland, Bimisari, Gindine, and even Nalhutta had been hit. Gindine had been defended by a larger force than Crefe wanted to tackle, but elsewhere the defenders, fighting bravely but at hopeless odds, had been destroyed. Diversionary raids, Crefe had explained after they were over. They were designed to show the enemy that Crefe and his fleet were anywhere but where they were going, Ebak Nine and the Deep Core. Being continually in action meant that Jason had been unable to smuggle Verger off the flagship. After two days of hiding her in the cockpit of his X-Wing, he'd managed to smuggle her to his quarters. There she'd taken up residence in the storage area under his bunk. He'd told the droid that cleaned his quarters to keep out. Fortunately, he was in officer's quarters and had a room to himself. The worst part was getting food to her, especially as she had a more than healthy appetite. Another problem concerned Tahiri, who gamely continued with Jason to try to find out if she could discover in herself a long sense. Jason couldn't have her in his cabin while Verger was there and produced various excuses why their practice had to be somewhere else less convenient. Not all of the excuses were convincing, but Tahiri seemed to accept them. They failed in their attempt to develop any Vong sense in Tahiri, though Jason privately thought this might be because there were no Yuzhan Vong in the vicinity. And if there were Yuzhan Vong around, the Jedi would be fighting them and have no time for meditations. The only compensation for the perilous situation was that he and Verger, in the privacy of his cabin, were able to share their meditations. Leaving Rall Roost, Jason took his X-Wing to the moonlit and met Gina in the docking bay that had been modified to fly and arm military craft. Twin Suns Squadron's X-Wings were neatly parked there, ready to launch on a moment's notice. Jaina looked tired. Her skin was pasty, her hair limp and she looked as if she hadn't been out of her jumpsuit in days. Jason didn't need the force to sense her discouragement. "'I don't know what we're doing here,' she said, after giving him a weary embrace. "'Half the time we're drilling on launching to defend the system, and the rest of the exercises have us running for bunkers.' "'We've got dozens of capital ships here,' Jason said. "'We have all the Jedi we need to form a meld. "'We can start joint exercises.' "'You all can't run for bunkers,' Jaina said. "'She shook her head. "'This is worse than anything I've ever seen. "'I hate this. "'I'm just nailed to this rock. "'It's like we have a huge target sign pasted on us. "'I'm best if I'm given freedom of action, "'freedom to be the trickster. "'That's the role that works for me.' "'The trickster,' Jason thought. I must inform you that you possess insufficient experience of depravity. Roger's words floated to the front of Jason's mind. He stared at Jaina in horror. I just realized what's happening, he said. Jaina looked at him, and apprehension dawned in her brown eyes. You're the bait, Jason told her. You're the bait that will bring the Yuzhan Vong here. He paused and then nodded as he followed the thought to its inevitable conclusion. And I'm the bait, too. The bait must be real.
Akbar said, and the bait must be seen by the enemy. If necessary, Mara said, we'll have one of our senators ask whether it's true that the chief of state has hidden himself in a redoubt along with his twin Jedi bodyguards. But I think we can do it more subtly than that. The tinkling of fountains and the scent of brine filled the air. Mara and Winter sat by the edge of Akbar's pool, swirling their legs in the water. Idar Neely Kirka had unbent to the point of taking off his boots and dipping his hairy toes. Mara reviewed her mental checklist. The plans for the final redoubt, she said. Who's going to glimpse them? We've already used the Sullustin and Senator Project's office, Neely Kirka said. Perhaps this time we should try the Peace Brigade contractor working in the shipyards. He can be given a moment alone with the plans in his supervisor's office. We know the Vong gave him a holocam. Mara, Neely Kirka, and the mouse droids had located a third Yuzhan Vong spy network operating in the new capital. She and Fleet Intelligence were keeping all three happy by feeding them information that was perfectly accurate, but either out of date irrelevant or useless. The Yuzhan Vong wouldn't suspect a spy who delivered no false information, even if the information wasn't completely useful. The government needs to disappear, Winter said. Cal will say he's on a tour of military facilities with the heads of the Senate councils, Mara said, and then no one will hear from him for a while. And the Soto twins need to disappear as well. Perhaps Senator Project can be indignant about it, Neely Kirkus suggested. He was an opponent of Leo Organa Solo. There's no reason why he can't dislike her children as well. Mara laughed. That's right. He can complain that Jason and Jaina are hiding in some secret fortress just when the New Republic needs them most. Bait, Akbar said. He lifted one hand and let a stream of seawater pour from his palm into the pool. The bait must be real, and it must be seen to be real. The Sword of the Jedi, Jaina thought. A sword that's about to be beaten into iron filings between the hammer of the Vong and the anvil of Ebak. Twin squadron, prepare to withdraw on my mark. Three, two, mark. Jaina rotated her fighter's nose and triggered the ion engines. Deep in her gut, she absorbed the tug of shifting momentum. Now that she understood Akbar's plan better, she had to admit it made sense. Lure the enemy into an attack on a supposedly hidden base guarded by Jedi elites, trap them in a starry dead end, annihilate them. The problem was the Yuzhan Vong would have every chance to annihilate Jaina and her squadron first. Request a shield drop on Sector 17, Jaina called to EBAC control. Shields dropping in five seconds. Four. Three. The shields dropped as Twin Sun's squadron raced through the gap. Jaina triggered the Starfighter's repulsor lifts and maneuvered into the docking bay space. Twin Sun's squadron abandoned fighters and rendezvous at the entrance to Tunnel 12C. Jaina popped the canopy before the X-Wing quite touched down cleared her webbing, and used the force to lift herself clear of the cockpit and drop onto the docking bay deck. She led the squadron in sprinting for the head of the giant main shaft that ran clean through the moonlit. As she ran, she kept thinking how tired she was. Tired of the war. Of constant drills. Tired of having so many others who depended on her. She was losing her edge. I'm worried, Jason told Verger. She's exhausted. She has too many responsibilities. She's on the edge of darkness, Verger asked. Jason shook his head. No, of despair. He hesitated, then spoke. She doesn't think she'll survive the war. They spoke in hushed tones in Jason's cabin. Jason on his bunk, Verger perched on his desk chair. Most of the warship's crews were asleep. After two days of joint exercises, Rawl Roost and most of Crefe's fleet hung motionless around the old Imperial starbase called Tarkin's Fang, just a few minutes' hyperspace jump from Ebak-9. 
To despair of life is to despair of the Force, Verger said. How do I help her? Verger's head thrust forward on its angular neck, peculiarly insistent. The chair creaked at the shift in weight. You are responsible for your own choices alone. But if I choose to help my sister, she rejects your help, does she not? Maybe I haven't gone about it right. If I can find the right way to get to her, from here you can do nothing. Verger's tone was unusually harsh. Think of your own choices only. Jason looked at her as a warning sang in his nerves. What do you know, he asked. Verger's eyes were opaque. Of your sister? Nothing. And of me? I know, young Jedi, that you must choose wisely. She turned away from him toward the wall. I will meditate now. You're hiding something. She looked at him over her shoulder. Always, she said. And that was all he got out of her. The door shivered open and Nomanor's heart lurched at the sight of a grotesque face grinning at him like some demon's parody of a Yuzhan Vong. He controlled himself as he realized it was only Onimi, who broke into a slash-mouthed grin and ushered him into the room with a bow. The shamed one sat in the shadows before Shimra's feet and declaimed, What one-eyed lurker skulks outside my door? Behold the furtive agent, Nomanor. Nomanor imagined kicking Onimi out of his way as he stepped into the shadowed room. In the dim light he made out the huge form of Supreme Overlord Shimra, reclining on a dais of pulsing red howl polyps. Nomanor prostrated himself, all too aware of the relentless scrutiny of Shimra's rainbow eyes. He tried not to think of what he knew about the Eighth Cortex Project, about Shimra's cynical manipulation of religion, about the dreadful hollowness of all the Supreme Overlord stood for. The Overlord's deep voice rolled out of the darkness. You have news of the infidels? I have, Supreme One. He rose to his feet and tried to control the excitement in his voice. I believe that I have the information that will bring about the decisive battle. The battle that you need, he thought. The victory that will give the Eighth Cortex Project time to succeed. Shimmer's voice was deadly calm. Very well, Executor. We shall await the War Master. As you wish, Dread One. Nomanor repressed a shiver of fear as he stood alone before the Supreme Overlord. This was Shimra's private audience chamber, not the great reception hall, and Nomanor was without support here, unable to hide behind Yugskel and a deputation of intendants. He remembered the way the Supreme Overlord's mind had overborne his own, the way his thoughts had been squeezed as if between two giant fingers. Onimi opened the door before Savong La could touch its membrane. Behold the great soldier, commander of Kor, great Savong La, the master of war. Savong La padded balefully into the room on his clawed Uwasa foot, his eyes glaring hatred at Nomanor. The War Master lowered himself to the floor before the Supreme Overlord. At your command, Supreme One. Stand, War Master. Savong La rose heavily to his feet, the Vuasa claws scrabbling for traction. Even though he was large for a Yuzhan Vong, the massive form of Shimra outweighed him by at least half. May I congratulate the War Master on his mating? Numanor said. You may, Savonwa said, looking at Nomanor with more than his usual suspicion. Savonwa, in obedience to Shimra's order that all warriors mate, had been seen with a subaltern, a beauty, too, known for the sublime blue of the pouches beneath her eyes. I hope that Domain La will soon have another addition to its ranks, Nomanor said. That, Savonwa said, is none of your business. Shimra vented a basso chuckle. To business, he said. Report, War Master. The fleets are ready, Dreadlord. 
Our auxiliaries have been trained and stand ready to guard our conquests. We continue to recruit mercenaries. None of these elements have distinguished themselves thus far. Shimmer pointed out. The enemy raid us, that is true, Savangla said. But they flee whenever we face them with anything approaching equal numbers. And in any case, the raids will cease once we resume the offensive. He formed a fist on the end of the rod ank leg he had in place of an arm. We are ready for conquest, Supreme One. With your permission, I am ready to take Corellia. Five planets in the system. Lord, shipyards in the center point weapon. They are isolated, and I believe I can take them at small cost. They will try to defend all five planets, but that will stretch them too thin, and I will defeat them in detail. Eagerness contorted his scarred face. May I have your permission to advance, Supreme One? A giggle escaped Onimi's slash of a mouth. I believe Nomanor has another suggestion. Nomanor felt the Warmaster's anger as Savangla glowered at him. This one, the Warmaster said. I have followed his advice before, to my cost. The Supreme Overlord's eyes shimmered from a bloody red to a sulfurous yellow. The how polyps, shifting beneath his weight, gave a squelching sound and an acid stench. Speak, Executor, Shimmer said. Numanor ignored Savangla and turned to face Shimra. My spies inform me that the New Republic government has fled Moon Calamari and is hiding in the deep core. The War Master and his forces may trap them there and crush them. Without a central government, the enemy will fall apart. He deigned to glance at Savangla. The War Master may then be able to take Corellia without fighting. Savong La's expression hesitated between triumph and scorn. What spies? he demanded finally. What evidence? How do we know this isn't a trap? Numanor turned once again to Shimra. I have correlated the evidence from different independent networks operating on Mon Calamari. The plans for what the enemy calls the final redoubt came from one source. Its location came from another agent. News of an emergency appropriation to pay for it came from a third. The government's absence from Moon Calamari is public knowledge, though it is presented as a kind of tour of the military. He smiled. And the fact that the final redoubt is guarded by Jedi, in fact by the Solo Twins, came from my most reliable agent. He sensed Savong La straightening at the mention of the Solo Twins. Numanor swept one hand triumphantly across his chest. After this one battle, the War Master may sacrifice Cal Omus, the heads of the Senate Councils, the Solo Twins, and many other Jedi. My life in payment, if I am wrong, Supreme One. As you say, Executor, Shimmer rumbled, if you are wrong, it shall be your life in payment. Numanor heard the words without fear. He knew that he was right, that the victory was within their grasp. Shimmer leaned forward on the trembling bed of polyps. Now, let us examine this evidence and make our plans. Chapter 25 Alarms blasted Jaina from sleep. She slept in her pilot's coveralls because it was warmer that way. The techs had never quite got the heating system to work in the pilot's quarters, though strangely enough the engineer's own heaters seemed to work perfectly well. So frequent had been the drills that she drew on her boots and grabbed her pilot's helmet without even opening her eyes. She managed to pry open her gummed lids as she sprinted down the corridor that led to the docking bays. Five strides later the artificial gravity snapped off as the moonlit's defense shields went on. Power supply problems had been continuous, and judging by present evidence, were unresolved. There had been a rumor that someone had dropped a decimal point in a requisition, and that EBAC 9's power supply was one-tenth the size it was supposed to be. 
Jaina used the force to push herself forward, snagging Veil on the way as her wingmate floundered in the reduced gravity, unable to get traction for her boots. In the docking bay, Jaina flung Veil toward her starfighter, then jumped for her own X-wing. R2-B3, which had never left the bay, was already in the second seat and had the electronics switched on, the repulsor lifts glowing and the quad-ion engines warming. The astromech tweedled a greeting as Jaina buckled herself into her seat and watched the last of her squadron's pilots race, float, or flop their way through the reduced gravity to their craft. When the last one had checked in over the comlink, Jaina opened a channel to EBAC control. This is Twin One, Twin Sun's squadron, ready for launch. Launch immediately, Twin One. The shield in Sector 12 is down for you. EBAC control seemed a little overexcited this morning. Acknowledged. She switched to her intership channel. We have clearance, people. Let's go. Jaina's X-Wing swung aloft on its repulsor lifts and floated toward the docking bay doors. As the massive doors parted for her, she triggered the ion engines and launched herself into the star-strewn half-night beyond. In space, as she waited for the others to launch and form on her starfighter, she looked at her displays and saw Farlander's capital ships hovering eight light minutes out, all of them launching starfighters. And beyond Farlander, bright starbursts blossomed onto the displays, squadrons of enemy ships in their hundreds and thousands. Suddenly, electricity snarled through her nerves, and the sleep that clung to her was burned away. This was not a drill. This was a force of a size that hadn't been seen since the attack on Coruscant. And then Jaina felt a surge through the force, a sense that a powerful mind had just focused on her, like a searchlight on a helpless insect. Horror shivered through her bones as she recognized the sensation. Voxen. The howls of the Voxen rose around Savongla, and he felt triumph rise in him like a glorious wind. He raised his arms, hands clawed as if to tear the sky asunder. Jedi. The Jedi were here. That skulking coward Numanor had been right. Above him, blazebugs rose into the air, hovering in place to form a three-dimensional representation of the battle. The pitch of their wings and the flashing of their scarlet abdomens identifying the size and status of all ships in the area, friend and enemy alike. The Voxen howled again. Wild joy rose in Savongla. By Yun Yu Zhang, he shouted. The stinking intendant was right. The New Republic forces were completely outnumbered. No doubt if it were possible to flee, the enemy would be doing so. But Ebak was in a dead end, and no retreat was possible. They had to fight. And should the Jedi attempt to hide on Ebak 9 or any other body in this system, Savong Law had the Voxen. Six of the Jedi hunting beasts had been off Mirker when the rest of their species was destroyed. The Voxen had very short lifespans, and these were near the end of theirs, their green scales yellowed, their eyes filmed and weary. But as soon as they'd sensed Jedi in the system, they'd thrown off their lethargy, and their tails lashed eagerly back and forth. The embracing tendrils of the cognition throne writhed atop his head, feeding him tactical data and keeping him in contact with blood sacrifices Yamask, which wordlessly directed the thousands of ships, coral skippers, and transports at the War Master's command. In a circle around the cognition throne, were a group of subalterns, apprentices, and readers, the former with villops that kept Savong La in touch with his squadrons. Savong La felt sudden confusion from the Yamask. The enemy were jamming its signals. This hardly mattered. The odds were so great. Savong La called out orders that would be transmitted by the subalterns around him with their villops. The battle group of Yun Yamka will advance and engage the enemy. The battle groups of Yun Xin and Yun Ka will advance on the flanks of the enemy and envelop him. The battle groups of Yun Yuzhan and Yun Harla will remain in reserve. The battle group named for the slayer would engage the enemy, and then the battle groups named for the lovers would converge on the enemy in a true lover's embrace and destroy them. Two more battle groups would remain in reserve, including the War Master's own 
to follow the enemy through hyperspace should they manage to escape. Though it was unlikely that the infidels would manage an escape, pinned as they were against the gravity well of a huge gas giant. Acknowledgments poured in from the commanders in the different battle groups. The blaze bugs overhead swarmed and flashed as dispositions shifted. The enemy were maneuvering cautiously, trying to keep between the advancing battle group of Yun Yamka and Ebak 9. This suited the Warmaster perfectly. The defenders were a slow, easy target against which he could hurl his overwhelming strength. Savong La's satisfaction grew as he watched the enemy plod toward destruction. The battle group of Yunyamka began to maneuver into extended order to lay itself alongside the enemy. Two capital ships to the enemy's one. And then Savong La sensed a shift in the infidels' dispositions. The blaze bugs began to move, their whirs and patterns swinging subtly to a new configuration. The war master watched in growing unease as the enemy squadron shifted swiftly from a long, extended line into a compact, pointed blade. A spearhead pointed into the Yuzhan Vong battle group. In a flare of intense fire, the New Republic squadron pierced the Yuzhan Vong extended line, shattering the invaders' formation. Eight of the largest Yuzhan Vong ships, hit by the combined power of the entire enemy squadron, were left disabled or dead. The claws of the Wuasa at the end of Savong La's leg clutched at the frame of his throne in anger. But his words, as he gave his next order, were calm. The battle group of Yun Yamka would engage the infidels as closely as possible. The Yuzhan Vong would take more losses as the dispersed ships closed with the compact enemy. But then superior numbers would begin to tell, and so would the battle groups of Yun Qin and Yun Ka, which would soon be in a position to envelop the enemy and finish them off. The battle was still his. It would take a little more time. That was all. And time the War Master had in plenty. In a room that smelled of protein and blood deep within the Damutek of the Intendant Snomanor, stood before his superior Yuxkel, a villip in his hands. The villip had formed into the face of an executor on Savong La's flagship, one of the few members of the intendant class on the expeditionary force. The enemy is maneuvering well, the executor said, but still we will crush him. Our numbers are overwhelming. Yugskel growled as he paced back and forth. We've been surprised, he muttered. I don't like surprises and neither does Supreme Overlord Shimra. When the call came, Mara was alone in the Skywalker apartment, looking at hollows of Ben. She went to the calm and saw Winter, gazing calmly back at her. It's begun, Winter said. Akbar and I are going up to Fleet Command. You may join us if you wish. Mara felt a sudden dryness in her mouth. Of course, she said. I'll be right there. It's not working. The faint thought floated toward Jaina from Madurin, in position on General Farlander's bridge. What's not working? The trickster jammers. The ones that would identify enemy ships as belonging to the wrong side and cause their friends to shoot at them. Another piece of bad luck, but Jaina was too frantic to feel badly about it now. Her own target was coming up. Shadow bomb away. Jaina shoved the dumb weapon ahead with a push of the force and drew back on the stick to bring her X-wing to a slightly different trajectory. Ahead, the target enemy cruiser lay in a blaze of fire as Key and Farlander's entire squadron swept past it, turbo lasers churning out fire while missiles corkscrewed through the void between ships. Bomb away came Tisar's hissing voice, followed by Lobaka's howl as he, too, flung a shadow bomb at the enemy. General Farlander hadn't been content to punch through the enemy formation only once. He had spun his entire squadron around and done it a second time before the enemy could concentrate against him. Jaina felt Tisar and Lowy through the force. As well as the dumb shadow bombs, they were all shoving at the enemy, while Madurin was a presence from her place on General Farlander's ship. 
As the only Jedi in the system, they were too few to create a proper force meld, but the three Jedi who led the flights of Twin Suns' squadron were so close, and by now so experienced in their work, that the meld was hardly necessary. Skips at point two, Major, Vale's voice was calm. Getting set to bounce us. Turn to engage. Now. Jaina rotated and fired the X-Wing's quad engines. Engaging the enemy head-on was a lot safer than letting them jump on Twin Sun's tails. Ahead, flashes marked oncoming enemy fire, a steady pulse of projectiles. Leapfrog, even and odd, Jaina said, and extended her forward shields as she was aware of Twin Three pulling up even with her, the overlapping shields of the two X-Wings covering her entire four-fighter flight. She began stuttering laser fire at the enemy, though she doubted it would have much effect. Doubtless the enemy would have their own Dovin basils deployed forward against her fire. Enemy fire began to hammer her shields. Flying by instinct and the force, she blinked against the brilliant flashes and tried to read her instruments to know when the shield's power situation grew critical. In the event, it was R2-B3 who chittered the warning at her. Leapfrog now! she called, and throttled back. Twins one and three fell back, while twins two and four surged into their place, their fresh shields covering the entire flight. It was a precision maneuver, all four starfighters maneuvering within a tolerance of mere centimeters. Thanks to endless drills and practice in battle, Twin Sun's squadron had come a long way since the battle over Far Thunder, when all Jaina could do was arrange them in a long line and have them play follow the leader. The coral skippers flashed by, no more than blurs on their converging course. Normally, she'd call for the squadron to split and drop on them, but maneuvering and combat took too much time. She needed to stick with Farlander and his compact group, not get caught away from support. Turning left sixty degrees, Jaina said, a course that would bring them toward Farlander and the main body. As her flight performed a perfect crossover turn, the maneuver turned her cockpit toward the enemy cruiser just in time to see the brilliant explosions of three shadow bombs planting themselves along its flank. She could see the ship tremble with each hit. Over her calm, she could hear the hissing of Barabel amusement. She was glad Tisar could find something funny in all this. Then Tisar's tone turned serious. Skips a stern twin leader. Maximum acceleration, Jaina said, and punched throttles. Her displays showed more enemy than she could properly comprehend, but her sense of the battle suggested the enemy were finally coordinating a response to General Farlander's maneuver. He had cut twice through the enemy's squadron, wrecking ships both times, but it was clear the Yuzhan Vong weren't going to let him do it again. Those ships nearby were keeping their distance, while those farther away were scrambling to catch up. Swarms of coral skippers were pouring in from all directions— Soon Farlander would find himself swamped by superior numbers and held in place for destruction, like a bantamweight fighter grappled by a 160-kilo wrestler. Not to mention the two huge squadrons looming on his flanks, or the other two squadrons hanging in the rear. Enemy fire boomed on Jaina's aft shields as she fled, a surprising number of shots. The pursuing coral skippers were throwing everything they had— Shana did a little jinking, but it didn't seem to help. The sheer volume of fire was disturbing. The pursuers broke off when Jaina's squadron entered the overlapping fields of fire of Farlander's capital ships, but by that point it hardly seemed to matter. So much fire was coming from so many directions that Jaina still found her shields getting slammed, even though it didn't seem as if anyone was taking the trouble to aim specifically at her. "'Friendly cruiser on our left,' she said." Let's take some of the pressure off it. She led twin sons on a high-speed slash against the coral skippers that had just made their attack runs on the cruiser, and were now perfect targets as they maneuvered in preparation for another attack. One burst into flame at the touch of her quad lasers, and she thought she killed another with a missile. Rolling right, she began to call, and then there was a brilliant flash on her canopy matched by a wail in the force, a mental keen that brought tears to Jaina's dazzled eyes. What was that? she demanded. Twin two, 
said Twin Three. She's gone. What do you mean, gone? Jaina demanded. She didn't get out. Twin Three sounded stunned. A huge projectile hit her fighter. It was vaporized. Who hit her? Jaina's hand suddenly got busy on the controls, ready to jink if the squadron was under attack. No one, just random fire. There's a lot of it out here. No kidding, someone said. Vale, Jaina thought. Another wingmate had gone, like Annie Capstan. The first casualty since the battle over Far Thunder. The first since she'd built Twin Sun's squadron into its highly drilled, perfected form. The first casualty, she thought with a sick certainty, but not the last. She fought away the tears and the grief. She had to be in control now. Twin three, twin four, keep close to me, she said. Rolling right. The rolling maneuver put her in an inverted position with regard to the New Republic squadron, able to view the fight through her canopy. She saw a Republic-class cruiser hit with a lance of fire saw compartments venting ice crystals that had once been air. The space between the heavy ships was thick with fighters, both friendly and enemy. A furball, she saw, was now forming around the damaged Republic-class cruiser, a horde of arriving coral skippers tangling with a couple of squadrons of E-wings. Starfighter battle at zero three zero, she said. Each flight form echelon. Each pilot pick your target. Reform on the other side. Look for your wingmate first, and then for me. Understood? They understood. She had drilled them well. This is for Vale, she said, and had to blink back tears again as she punched the throttle. She felt Loey, Tisar, and Madurin sending her strength through the force, and she radiated her thanks. For her first target, she picked a coral skipper that was lining up for a shot at an E-wing. Hers was a deflection shot— but she synced perfectly with her ship, slewed the nose of the X-wing around just slightly, and touched the quad triggers. The coral skipper blew with the second shot, and then she whipped past the debris, triggering a missile onto the tail of another skip that presented itself. She had the satisfaction of seeing the coral skipper shatter before she was through the fur ball and pulling into the clear. Clear, being a relative term. The void was still filled with beams and missiles and cannonades, all of it once aimed at something, but now possessed by a dreadful randomness. Reform on me, Jaina called, frantically scanning her displays. Tisar's hissing voice came over the comm. We're being bounced, twin leader. This one requests assistance. You got it. She cast a glance at her displays, saw Tisar's blip behind her. Twins three and four with me. Streak, take your flight and... A roar from Lobaka confirmed Jaina's order before she finished giving it. Jaina hauled back on the stick, hoping she wouldn't get smacked out of space while her maneuvering killed her velocity. She half-rolled through the turn to keep herself out of enemy sights. When she'd completed her maneuver, the sight took her breath away. An enemy frigate had laid itself alongside the Republic-class cruiser. The space between them a blaze of furious energies as the two huge vessels slammed into each other at point-blank range. Around both capital ships were at least two hundred smaller craft, darting and weaving and blasting each other. She could see at least a dozen craft on fire. Most of the smaller craft were Yuzhan Vong. More enemy were appearing every second. General Farlander was getting swamped by the enemy. Stay with me, three and four she told her remaining flight. Now let's go. As she shoved the throttles forward, she felt Tisar's predatory presence through the force, and she sent him a burst of strength. And then she sent through the force a simple message to Madurin. We need help. Madurin sent breeze of calm through the force, and with it the knowledge of help already on the way. The sending was followed immediately by bright splashes on Jaina's cockpit displays as more ships appeared out of hyperspace. Jaina's heart leapt as she felt her mental horizons expand. Personalities crowded into her mind. Kip Duran, Saba in the Wild Nights, Zek, Corin Horn, Alima Rar, and Jason. Jason in his place on the bridge of the Bothan assault cruiser, Rol Roost. We're here. The force message was a masked shout. Glad to hear it. 
Jane assent as she got a coral skipper in her sights, but right now she had to get some Vaughn off Tisar's tail. She triggered her lasers. A new howl chorused from the Voxen, and Savong La watched in amazement and rising anger as more blaze bugs rose from the floor to form a new enemy squadron in the overhead display. A large force, he saw, a match for any of his five. Perhaps not so large. He saw now that a number of the enemy ships were big transports, which promptly vanished into hyperspace, leaving the rest behind to fight. Apparently the new enemy were a supply convoy and its escort. It wasn't so inexplicable they should be here then. The new arrivals had appeared just as he was about to order the battle groups of Yun Xin and Yun Ka to complete their envelopment of the enemy, the lover's embrace that would destroy the infidels. But the new enemy force hung off to one flank, near the battle group of Yun Xin, and he ordered the enveloping movement now. The new arrivals could pounce on Yun Xin's rear. The battle group of Yun Xin will engage the newcomers, he said. The battle group of Yun Hala will move to support, but will not engage without my command. The battle group of Yun Ka will reinforce the battle group of Yun Yamka and destroy the original defenders. That left his own battle group of Yun Yuzhan still in reserve against any further surprises. With his group were the troop ships that would be used to secure Ebak 9 once the enemy fleet was dealt with. He still had overwhelming numbers. And since the Voxen had howled again, there were more Jedi among the newcomers. More sacrifices for the gods, he thought with satisfaction, and sat back in the cognition throne to watch his forces complete his victory. Through the Jedi force melt, Jason could feel Jaina in her cockpit, feel her determination, her cool analysis, and the edges of panic that sometimes broke through her composure. Skip on my six, breaking right. This one has destroyed it. This from Tisar. Thanks. They weren't words, really, these bursts of image and intensity from the Force, but that's how they translated. Jaina, Twin Sons, and all of Farlander's Force were heavily engaged at great odds. His own new arrivals, with most of the fleet's Jedi, were moving against one of the huge battle groups that loomed like an overhanging cliff on Farlander's flank. The Jedi meld was skating on the edge of Jason's ability to comprehend. There were too many ships in the picture for him to absorb. Fortunately, three-fifths of the enemy were unengaged, and he could safely leave them out of his mental picture. He called out coordinates, maneuvering Crefe's force so as to provide maximum effectiveness at the moment of collision. Fire Dovin missile, Admiral Crefe ordered. He was too excited to sit in the grand chair reserved for a full admiral, and instead paced back and forth just behind Jason. Jason was going to find this annoying if Crefe kept it up for long. Dovin missile fired, sir. Transmit coordinates of the space mine to General Farlander. Coordinates transmitted, Admiral. Wonderful. Jason heard Crefe clap his hands. This is working well, don't you think? But Jason's mind really wasn't on what was occurring on the Admiral's bridge. Instead, he kept his focus on Twin Sun's squadron and the desperate battle Jaina was fighting. Missed. Louis, look out. Jason considered summoning his Vong sense, his ability to empathize with and sometimes influence the enemy. But that would mean losing the force and the ability to help his comrades. He decided that remaining in the meld was his best option. I've lost my rear shields. That was my last missile. Go with the force, Jason sent. He closed his eyes and pushed out as much care, strength, and support as he could. And behind him, dim in the force, he felt another presence, powerful but cloaked, that radiated strength, but to Jason alone. Verger. Thirty light years from the battle at a narrow point of the long hyperspace route that led to Ebak and its moons, a small New Republic task force dropped out of hyperspace. Most of the ships were unarmed. This was not a fighting force, but even so, its mission was vital. The squadron commander first fired a single missile, 
one containing an interdictor modeled after a Eugen von Doven basil. The interdictor would serve as a space mine. Once the mine had been set in the center of the hyperspace lane, the other ships began to drop more conventional mines, mines with detection gear, explosive cores, and maneuvering thrusters. The mines immediately took up station around the Doven basil mine. The unarmed ships continued to lay mines. Dozens of mines. Hundreds. Thousands. Tens of thousands. Got it! Twin Six shouted. She'd just shot a skip off Louie's tail, and the Wookiee gave a roar of thanks. Jaina blinked sweat from her eyes and hauled her X-wing right, away from a stream of plasma cannon fire. That enabled her to get a deflection shot at a coral skipper speeding by. But the Vong's Doven basil sucked the laser bolts, and suddenly Jaina was dancing away from more fire coming at her from her starboard quarter. It was friendly fire. Laser bolts from a B-wing. But it was deadly for all that, and Jaina didn't want any part of it. All ships, came an announcement on the command comm. This is General Farlander. All ships to alter course simultaneously on the following coordinates. Jaina tried to absorb the coordinates and failed. She'd have to just get a visual and follow. That is, if she could ever get free of this fur ball composed of friendly and enemy craft, debris, and random deadly fire. What was that coordinate? From Twin Nine. I didn't get it either, Twin Four. Change course on my mark, Farlander continued. Five... Four, three, two, mark. Jaina saw the capital ships around her suddenly swing massively to a new heading and ignite their engines. The Yuzhan Vong took a moment to respond, but soon they, too, were matching Farlander's maneuver. Except for the ships that couldn't. Trailing behind were the casualties, the dead ships, the wounded, and the out-of-control, both friendly and enemy. And Jaina was too tangled up with the Yuzhan Vong to follow. If she straightened her course to pursue Farlander, she'd be blasted by a dozen enemy. Squadron to form into single line ahead, came the order from Farlander. Slagged him, from Twin Three. Enemy fire banged on Jaina's rear shields, and she jerked the fighter into a roll as her astromech chittered angrily at the attackers. Rolling left, she said, as if anyone were keeping track of her movements. As far as she could tell, the members of Twin Sun's squadron were all on their own, so separated in the melee they could no longer guard one another's backs. There was a flash. Debris thundered on Jaina's shields. Who was that? Twin Seven's voice. Twin Nine. Tisar's voice was calm, but Jaina could feel his anger in the force. Did she get out? Negative. Anger ripped into Jaina. She'd lost another pilot, and she hadn't even known Twin Nine was in danger. Time to kill some Vong, she decided. It was what she was here for. She looked for a coral skipper and put it in her sights. Sabong La watched with pleasure as Farlander's squadron fled the battle. The sudden maneuver had caught the Yuzhan Vong by surprise, but the battle group of Yun Yamka had corrected quickly and were now hanging tenaciously onto the enemy. The battle group of Yun Ka had altered course to intercept and would soon join the fight and finish the infidels. The War Master's pleasure was increased as the battle group of Yun Xin slammed into the newly arrived squadron with proper headlong Yuzhan Vong spirit. The blaze bugs overhead began to moderate their pitch as missiles and projectile weapons began to inflict damage. A sudden whine from the blaze bugs caught his attention, and his eyes widened in surprise. Farlander's squadron was in the process of another course change, a radical one this time. Sabong La couldn't believe how rapidly the New Republic capital ships were turning. They were whipping around a full 270 degrees, and without losing velocity. It was a clear impossibility, yet they were doing it, and leaving the battle group of Yun Yamka behind. And then his nerves turned chill, as he realized that the infidel's new course was sending them straight into the battle between the battle group of Yun Xin and the newly arrived force. The battle group of Yun Xin would be caught between the two forces and hammered. The battle group of Yun Hala 
We'll engage the enemy immediately, he ordered. That would reinforce the battle group of Yunxin and repair some of the damage the enemy maneuver had created. The battle group of Yun Yamka will regroup and prepare to re-enter combat. The battle group of Yun Ka will... He paused as more blaze bugs began to whine, a whole host of them rising from the floor to hover in the air and form something new. What now? he thought. Jason watched as Kian Farlander's entire squadron of capital ships performed the solo slingshot around the Dovin Basil space mine analog, the modified interdictor missile that Kreefe's Raw Roost had fired on its arrival on the field of battle. The enemy fighting them continued on their previous course, unable to claw their way after Farlander without performing a conventional turn and losing most of their speed. A few of the enemy by guesswork or luck, managed to work out what was happening and make the turn along with Farlander, but these were outnumbered and quickly blasted out of existence. The rest would be out of the battle for some time as the capital ships lumbered into their turns and tried to maneuver into some kind of appropriate formation. Nice work, Jason sent to Madurin. Thanks. While Roost shuddered to a hit, and Jason was reminded that a Bothan assault cruiser was so named because it concentrated most of its power on attack, not two shields or defense. Breach between frames M and N, someone said. Frame seals are holding, damage control is responding. Hammer them, hammer them, Admiral Crefe shouting, swung his fists dangerously in the air over Jason's head. Crefe's ships were engaged in a furious close-range action with the enemy. Jason could feel Kip and his dozen, Corrin Horn and Rogue Squadron, and the all-Jedi Wild Knights flying in frantic combat. The Knights in particular were tearing through the enemy, their predatory reflexes in perfect synchronization with the Force. An all-Jedi squadron was a terrible thing indeed. Then Jason felt another surge in the Force, and he felt a new mind enter the Jedi meld— a mind uncertain and only half-trained. Hello, Mom, he sent. The full power of the force meld took Leia by surprise. She was in the co chair of the Millennium Falcon, which was echeloned with the rest of the Smugglers' Alliance ships around the bright red Star Destroyer errant venture. No sooner had she fallen out of hyperspace than the meld reached for her, and part of her mind was viewing a burning enemy frigate with Corrin Horn, fighting a jaw-clenching combat with Kip Duran, or engaging in vicious, efficient pack behavior with the Barabel Wild Knights. The intensity of it took her breath away. Hello, Mom. Jason's presence was clear in the force. Hello, Jason, she sent uncertainly. Unlike the others in the fight, her force training had been haphazard, and she hadn't had the opportunity to practice the meld with others. But the power of the meld was so strong that she felt her uncertainty fade as soon as she received her first order from Jason. She received another message from Jason, felt the coordinates burning in her mind. She looked at the Falcon's navigation displays and saw the point indicated. She translated the coordinates and keyed them in. Hun, Jason wants us here. What Jason wants, Jason gets, Han said, and switched his comm unit to the command channel. Han, Captain Solo again with his insignia pinned to his otherwise civilian vest, commanded the Smugglers Alliance Squadron from the Millennium Falcon. I'm happier in a smaller ship, he said when Booster Tarek offered errant venture, and besides a Star Destroyer is too big a target. The Motley Smugglers Alliance Squadron began its change of course. Leia's Nogri bodyguards in the turbolaser turrets chuckled in their whispery voices and fired practice shots into the void. And then Leia felt a shard of terror clear through the force meld, and she knew Jaina was in trouble. This is the critical moment, Akbar said. He, Winter, and Mara sat in a gallery above the Fleet Command Operations Room, where Sin Sov stood amid a bustle of aids, screens, and constantly flowing data. A hollow of the battle at Ebak 9 floated in the air above the busy room. 
The Smugglers' Alliance squadron under Han Solo had just appeared in the display, the ships picked out in brilliant orange. It was a massive contrast to the last time Mara had watched Seen Sov in action. Then the Supreme Commander had been forced to conduct his defense of Coruscant in front of a full session of the Senate, with the Senator shouting advice and hurling threats, and Chief of State Borsk Felia countermanding Sov's orders from the Speaker's podium. The Supreme Commander seemed a lot more comfortable in his current situation, and no wonder. It is at this point that the enemy might begin to suspect a trap, Akbar said. He slumped in his chair and his voice was slurred with weariness. Being on dry land again was taking its toll. Alas, that we needed to send this squadron to prevent Farlander and Crefe from becoming overwhelmed. Fortunately, it is small and innocuous. He sighed heavily. Perhaps they will not take alarm. Perhaps not. Rolling left, Jaina shouted, but a stream of plasma cannon projectiles met her as she rolled, one stunning impact after another on her shields, and she knew there was a second enemy behind her. If she broke right, she'd run into the first enemy. Fortunately, space is three-dimensional. She went up. An enemy missile shot past her canopy, and then she was free. She rolled again and went after her pursuers. She found one, and was on the verge of attempting a deflection shot when R2B3 chittered a warning, and she jerked the stick away from the flaming projectiles that soared past her. Twin three and four, I'm in a crossfire here. Where are you? she demanded. Three's hit, four's voice. I saw him eject. Where are you? Jaina demanded. I don't know. Jaina jinked away from a line of fire only to have her shields slammed by a missile. Her astromech droid squealed at the state of the shields, which were near collapse. Jaina blinked sweat from her eyes and jinked again, and by chance found a coral skipper floating across her sights. She fired the quad lasers and felt satisfaction at the sight of fire burning along the enemy hull. If she hadn't killed it, she'd at least hurt it. A howl came over the comm, and Jaina's force-impelled reflexes jerked at the controls. The howl was followed by another, this one of satisfaction, as Loey scragged the coral skipper that had been on Jaina's tail. Between the two of them, Jaina and Loey hunted down and blew apart a third coral skipper, and then she found a moment to raise her faceplate and mop sweat from her face with a gloved hand. They were on the edge of the furball that had originally surrounded Farlander's squadron, but which had now become a separate flight, starfighters and coral skippers circling and hunting each other in a remarkably small area. She felt Tisar's urgency through the force. This one has lost shields and an engine, he called. The force told her where Tisar was before her displays did. Streak, she told Loey, stay on my wing. And she dived back into the fight. Savong La gazed in furious concentration at the small squadron that had appeared on the flank of the battle group of Yun Ka. It was built around a single, very large, wedge-shaped ship, with a modest number of medium-sized vessels and a lot of small ones. By itself it wasn't very menacing, except that it could attack the rear of the Yun Ka battle group if he committed it to battle. Better to squash this small group first, he decided. Even though this little squadron wasn't large enough to turn the tide of battle, it was better to be safe than not. The battle group of Yun Ka is to engage the small squadron on its flank and destroy it. A subaltern relayed the order. There was a moment in which the subaltern communed with his villip, after which he turned and saluted with crossed arms. Commander Drugan begs to ask whether we have been led into an ambush, War Master. For a moment Savangla's lip curled at the insolence of Drugan, but then he stopped to consider the question. Had all the information of the final redoubt been nothing but an attempt to lure him here into the deep core? Had that schemer Nomanor been out-schemed? The appearance of two enemy squadrons was suspicious, but one of them seemed to be a convoy escort, and the other was under strength and composed of such a heterogeneous array of vessels that it was barely military at all. 
If he, Sabang La, had planned an ambush, he would have used overwhelming force and pounced from all directions. He wouldn't have fed in two squadrons piecemeal, neither of them large enough to do anything more than delay the outcome. No, it had to be a coincidence that a convoy arrived at just this moment. The second squadron was probably a scratch force summoned by a distress call. "'Tell Commander Drugan there is no ambush,' Savon La said. "'Order him to engage immediately. "'At once, War Master.' Leia could see that Han was impressed by the size and strength of the enemy battle group that suddenly swerved to engage him. He blew a long breath, then cast a glance over his shoulder at Leia and said, "'I don't suppose the United Jedi Cluster Mind has any suggestions about how to handle this one?' "'I'm afraid not,' Leia said." The meld knew an engagement had to occur, but its tactical advice was a little unclear. Well, then, Han breathed. He looked at the displays again, then flicked on the comm. This is Captain Solo, he told the squadron. We can't hope to match the enemy with numbers or firepower, so we'll have to make use of speed, flexibility, and— his brow creased in worry. Tactical brilliance, he finished hopefully. Leia reached out and squeezed his shoulder. "'Go get him, Slick,' she said. Ralroost shuddered to another hit, but Jason's mind was in the Force, seeing through the eyes of the Jedi meld. His mind strained to keep up with all the information flowing through the Force. Through Leia's eyes he saw Han's slashing attack on the larger enemy battle group, a hit-and-run assault that the enemy was too large and slow to counter. Through Maduran's perceptions, he felt Farlander's battered squadron slam into the enemy, taking Kreefe's enemies in the rear and inflicting damage beyond their numbers. Through the eyes of Kip and Corrin and Saba, he saw the flash of fire, coral skippers burning, enemy frigates and cruisers trembling to the force of shadow bombs. And he felt Jaina's desperation and Lobaka's ferocity as they aided Tisar's grim fight for survival. Jason's fingers twitched with the impulse to run to Raul Roost's fighter bays, to jump into his X-wing and fly to Jaina's assistance. But he knew he served the cause better on Raul Roost, where he was able to keep the other Jedi focused, help them sense each other's locations, and coordinate their actions with one another. Jason jumped as Kreefe's white-furred hand dropped onto his shoulder. Now, Jason, the Admiral said, our minefield is complete. Now you'll see the destruction of the enemy. Kreefe gave an order on the comm. And then, mere minutes later, as the squadrons leapt from their hiding places in the deep core hyperspace lanes, more New Republic ships began to appear, one squadron after another. A host of Jedi minds rose into the meld. Tahiri, Zek, Olima, and the burning power of Luke Skywalker. All here at the finish. The Voxen cried again as they detected one new Jedi after another, their weary howls now more akin to whimpers. The blaze bugs that flew into the air to mark the new infidel squadrons provided a strange dissonance in Savong La, for the picture that rose to Savong La's brain, fed by the tendrils of the cognition throne, showed the enemy in even greater numbers, vast numbers of infidels all around him. It took a moment for him to realize why he was receiving two different impressions— so many were the infidels that the War Master had run out of blaze bugs to represent them in the display. Fury possessed him. What did it matter that he was now outnumbered? That his forces had been drawn out of position and were about to be engulfed? The Yuzhan Vong were conquerors. The gods had promised them victory. Swiftly he reordered his forces. The battle groups of Yunhala and Yunxin were heavily engaged against the original enemy squadron and the first set of reinforcements. They had local superiority in numbers, though both sides had lost all formation, and the battle had dissolved into a general melee. Savong La ordered these forces to redouble their efforts and destroy their foes before more infidel battle groups could intervene. The battle group of Yun Yamka, which had opened the battle and been left on its own since the original enemy squadron had made its unexpected turning maneuver, had regrouped. Savong La decided to sacrifice it. He ordered the battle group to hurl itself against the enemy reinforcements in order to keep them occupied while he tried to win the fight with his other forces. Doroic Vong Prat, 
the group commander replied when he heard the order. The battle cry of the warrior cast. Sabong La swelled with pride at the unquestioning spirit of the doomed commander. He knew he, his ships, and his warriors were going to their deaths, but still he gladly accepted the clash of battle. The battle group of Yun Ka, which had been in pursuit of the small agile force that had appeared as the second group of reinforcements, was ordered to break off its pursuit and maneuver against several of the infidel squadrons. If Commander Drugan maneuvered cleverly enough, he could occupy a large group of the enemy without committing himself against overwhelming numbers, thus buying time for the rest. That left the reserve battle group of Yun Yuzhan, under Savong La's personal command. It was the only force that hadn't been engaged with the enemy, that hadn't suffered casualties, and that still had complete freedom of maneuver. Savong La hesitated for a moment, then decided to take his battle group straight into battle alongside the battle groups of Yun Hala and Yun Xin. If he could force a victory there, it might create other opportunities. He gave the orders, and his forces screamed toward the battle. Savong La had been led into a trap by Numa Nor's information. You have betrayed us, Yugskel said. You must pay with your life. Nomanor calmly reached into his pocket for the blorash jelly that he then flung at Yugskel's feet. The high prefect waved his arms, trying not to topple, as the jelly pinned his feet to the floor. He gave Nomanor a wild look. What are you doing, executor? he demanded. Giving Shimra an itch. Numanor surprised himself with how calmly he was behaving. He slashed his amphistaff down on Yukskel's head. The high prefect folded into unconsciousness, his feet still pinned by the semi-sentient jelly tendrils. Numanor looked at the sprawled body of his superior and hoped he wasn't dead. He'd always rather liked Yukskel. Numanor knew, of course, what had happened— his spies had been identified and fed false information designed to lead the Yuzhan Vong fleet into this trap. Whoever had done this had been brilliant, setting out a series of clues and letting Numanor himself draw the conclusions. But there would be little use explaining to his superiors how brilliantly he had been played by the enemy, not in the wake of a military disaster of this magnitude. They would want Numanor's head, not his explanations. It was time for Numanor to vanish to don an Uglyph masker to disguise his appearance, and then to disappear among the anonymous worker caste. After the search died down, he could create further identities and credentials that would get him off the planet. But where would he go? He would be hunted throughout Yuzhan Vong-controlled territory, and if he escaped into the New Republic, he would have to live forever in disguise, an object of suspicion wherever he went. He decided to think about all that later. Right now, he needed to concentrate on escape. Twin Sun's squadron was down to eight starfighters, and of these only Lobaka's was intact. Tisar had lost an engine and half his shields. Jaina had lost her rear shields and her upper right foil along with its laser, and her cockpit smelled of fear and sour sweat. Others suffered light to heavy damage. They had expended all their missiles and bombs. Fortunately, they were no longer engaged with the enemy. The larger battles had passed them by, and the fighter-versus-fighter battle seemed to be over. The coral skippers had either been killed or gone somewhere else, and only scattered B and E wings were near them. Through the Jedi meld, Jaina could still feel others experiencing the shock of combat. Wearily, she turned the nose of her craft toward the huge battle nearby, where Jason and Kip and the Wild Knights were engaged— but from Jason she felt a cool touch of the mind, followed by his voice on calm. "'Don't, you're too shot up. I can feel the others fighting. I can't stand by. You must. The others would only endanger themselves protecting you.' The meld was in agreement with Jason. She felt their unanimity, but still she felt the urge not to abandon her friends. "'You have acquitted yourself honorably, Jaina Solo.' This was Saba's voice. It is now your task to preserve your own life. Twin Sons has permission to withdraw to Ebac 9. This came from Ebac 9, from her own controller. Jaina felt her tension drain away. Preserve your own life. 
How long had it been since anyone told her to do that? Her battle was over, and the annihilation that she had feared, that she had expected, had not come. Acknowledged, she told the flag, and then spoke to her pilots. Streak, I want you to cover Tisar. The rest of you form on me. Wearily, Jaina turned her craft toward safety. Jaina, Tisar, and Lobaka had landed on Ebac 9. Lou could sense their weariness in the Force, but still he felt them trying to send strength and clarity to the others in the Jedi meld. Luke sat on the bridge of the Moon Calamari cruiser Harbinger, flagship of Garmbel Iblis, and played a game of hollow chess in his mind with the enemy commander. Luke's mission to the old hero of the rebellion had succeeded. Bel Iblis had brought into the deep core half the fleet with which he had been guarding Talan, divided into three battle groups. Maneuvering against that fleet was a single Yuzhan Vong squadron, the one that had earlier been pursuing Han's squadron of Smugglers' Alliance ships. Its commander was clever and had managed to keep all three of Bel Iblis's battle groups occupied without quite engaging any of them. But it was an unfair contest. The Yuzhan Vong had only a single piece on the hollow board, the New Republic Three, four if Han's small squadron counted. Luke, maneuvering with the aid of the Jedi meld, slowly reduced the enemy's options to two. Fight and die, or flee. And he knew the Yuzhan Vong did not run away. He ordered the three battle groups to converge. No good, Savong Law realized. His plan wasn't working. He clenched his teeth in rage. May Nomanor's flayed skin be trampled by Rakamats. The battle groups of Yun Harla and Yun Xin were fighting bravely but being overwhelmed by the enemy. Two new enemy battle groups had joined the fight, fresh and formed and well organized, while the Yuzhan Vong were scattered and locked in combat with their old enemies. The battle group of Yun Ka was in the process of being trapped by three enemy battle groups. The battle group of Yun Yam Ka, as instructed, was immolating itself against the enemy, but such bravery was useless because Nothing else was going well. Only the battle group of Yun Yuzhan, under Savong La himself, still had options. He had planned to join the battle groups of Yun Harla and Yun Xin and help them win at least a local victory, but he saw now that this plan too would fail, that all he could do was reinforce a battle that was already lost, offering himself to the enemy like a sacrifice upon the altar. Like a sacrifice... Despair gripped his heart in iron talons. He should die in battle. After a defeat of this magnitude, Shimra could scarcely be expected to let him live. Savong La would be lucky not to be cut down like an animal, like Chigong Hul, and instead die a sacrifice to the gods. Sacrifice. Savong La jerked bolt upright on the cognition throne. A smile drew his slashed lips tight. A sacrifice. Of course. Alter course at once for Ebac 9, he commanded. Order the battle group of Yun Ka to head for the moon at maximum acceleration. Jedi, he thought. The Voxen had howled when he had first brought his fleet to the system. There had been Jedi in the system then. Some of them were probably with the fleet, but Savong La believed some, at least, would be on the ninth moon of Ebac. A sacrifice. Luke watched in surprise as the enemy battle group, the one he had been carefully maneuvering against, suddenly bolted, its formations dissolving every ship for itself. The Yuzhan Vong had never before fled from a fight in such disorder, and the New Republic battle groups were unprepared for what looked like a panicked withdrawal. There was a little skirmish across the front of one of the battle groups. A few ships flared in the night and died and then the enemy were away, with the entire fleet in pursuit. Luke didn't understand where the enemy intended to go. They weren't running directly away from him. It was almost as if they were running toward something. And then, with a dreadful certainty, he knew where they were headed. And he thought, Jaina. I did not foresee this. Akbar beat with one huge hand on the arm of his chair. What a fool I have been. 
Countless ships whirled in Jason's mind. He struggled madly with his expanded senses to understand what the new enemy maneuver meant, and suddenly he understood. At his realization, an electric shock rang through the Jedi meld. He struggled to find an answer. Calm. He sensed Verger's thoughts in his mind. Calm. The Force will tell you what to do. Suddenly Jason understood, and he was shouting orders to Admiral Crefe while he sent an urgent message through the Force. Mom, you've got to intercept that squadron. Use everything you've got. That would keep one of the enemy squadrons away from Ebak, at least for a while. It was only after he'd sent his instructions that he realized he might have just sent his parents to their deaths. Jason rose from his chair and turned to Admiral Crefe. I need my X-Wing now, he shouted, and without waiting for permission ran for the turbolift. Jason? Crefe seemed more astonished than anything else. We need you on the flagship. The turbolift wasn't parked at this level. In an agony of frustration, Jason slammed the control buttons. You've already won the battle, he said. Now I have to save Jaina. Crefe's white fur rippled as he stared at Jason. Distant rumbles echoed through the room as Ralroost's inadequate shielding absorbed hits. Very well, Crefe said, waving a hand. Very well. And Crefe turned back to hammering the enemy. Han, we need to stop them. Han cast a bewildered look over his shoulder. Stop who? Leia jabbed an urgent finger at the displays. The enemy squadron. Han shrugged. They're fleeing, but they still outnumber us. Let them go. Anger flared in Leia's voice. They're not running. They're heading straight for Jaina. There was a moment of stunned comprehension, and then the lines in Han's face turned grim. Right. He faced front and snapped on the comm. This is Solo, he said. It's up to us to hold the Vong until our people can catch up and finish them off. Everyone pick your targets carefully. This will not be fun. He rolled the Millennium Falcon toward the enemy and throttled up. The enemy ships, hundreds of them, got nearer and nearer. Keep an eye on the displays, sweetheart, Han told Leia. When this gets hairy, I don't want anyone sneaking up on us. Han brought the Smuggler's Alliance squadron right across the front of the Yuzhan Vong formation, which meant that every weapon on his squadron bore on the enemy, while the enemy could only reply with bow weapons. Han was either going to blow the Vong noses off or force them from their course. The Vong didn't turn. Errant Venture fired first, its enormous turbolasers hurling neon-colored destruction at the enemy, and then one by one the rest of the squadron opened fire. Leia could hear the rhythmic crashing of the Nugri firing the Falcon's turbolasers. And then return fire began smashing at the shields. Jaina felt cold sweat breaking out on her nape. Back to the fighters, she told her squadron. We'll launch and get out of the enemy's sight. That's a negative, twin leader. It was General Farlander himself on the comm, which spoke to the importance of the message. In the background she could hear the shouts, murmurs, and crashes of a big ship in combat. "'Just get into the mine shafts and slam the blast doors behind you,' Farlander said. "'Stick to the plan. You can hold out for hours in there, and we'll come get you before you know it.' "'The general is wise, Jaina,' Tisar hissed. His heavy tail lashed left and right. Our starfighters are too damaged to make a clean escape. Several of us would be lost. Jane hesitated as she looked at the expectant pilots around her, then nodded. Lost. Tisar was right. Understood, General, she said. Around her, Ebak 9's command center braced itself for the oncoming blow. Two huge Yuzhan Vong squadrons were headed their way. Stick to the plan, Farlander had said. But this wasn't the plan. The plan assumed that when the New Republic fleets arrived, the Yuzhan Vong would realize they were ambushed and either run or fight to the death. The plan never considered that the Yuzhan Vong would continue their assault on Ebak's ninth moon, 
which had no real military value at all. Right, Jaina said. This way. The weary pilots limped out of the command center. The gravity was still erratic. Sometimes they walked normally, and sometimes an ordinary step would catapult them to the ceiling. They took a hover car down the great central shaft that drove through the moonlit's core. From here, mine shafts branched off into the old diggings. Several of these had been equipped with the massive Durasteel blast doors designed to keep the enemy out for hours. Jaina stopped the car by the bunker that had been converted to an armory. I'm going to assume that everything else is going to go wrong, she said. Vaxen, Lubaka howled. How can things go right? Jaina nodded. That's why I want everyone here to have blasters, body armor, grenades, grenade launchers, and command detonated mines. And vac suits. We're pressurized here, but what can be pressurized can be depressurized. Tisar gave a hiss of Barabel amusement. The Major speaks his wisdom, he said. The turbo lift seemed to take an eternity in its glide toward the fighter docking bays. Jason used his private comm to call his astromech droid and have the fighter ready for him. The Jedi meld sang in his mind. He was aware of his own anxiety eddying out to the others, reflecting back toward him. He remembered how the force melt had kept dissolving on Mirker, as Jedi were hurt or died, or fought one another over strategy, and he tried to keep his worries from feeding out into the others. The turbo lift jolted to a stop. It had come to a bulkhead, and all bulkheads were sealed during combat. Jason flung the lift doors open with the force and sprinted for one of the internal airlocks that communicated between bulkheads. There was another eternity while the lock recycled, and then a narrow spiral stair. Jason used the force to fly down it, and then another bulkhead that communicated to the docking bay deck. He wasn't surprised to find Verger waiting for him. She held up a hand. Where are you going? Jason didn't break stride. To help Jaina. You cannot help. Ebak is being attacked by a squadron of capital ships. Your single starfighter will make no difference. I have to try. Jason sprinted on. His X-wing was alone in the docking bay next to a partially dismantled A-wing its weapons and sensor systems scavenged to repair other starfighters. Stop. This is not your destiny. Maybe not, but it's my family. Roger followed Jason, flying on pulses of the Force to match Jason's running pace. What can you hope to accomplish besides your own destruction? she demanded. Anger flamed through his mind. Jason turned to the little alien and put a hand on his lightsaber. Are you proposing to stop me? he demanded. Roger settled onto the deck and slowly, sadly bowed her head. I will not stop you, Jason Solo. You have chosen your destiny. Her eyes glittered. It is the consequences you must deal with now. Jason turned and vaulted into the cockpit. He closed the canopy and put on his helmet. Through the forest he could feel the cold fear that ran through Jaina's nerves. He opened the comm and asked Ralroost's docking control for permission to launch. The Millennium Falcon skimmed along the hull of the enemy cruiser, quad lasers pumping shots into the hull as well as toward the coral skippers that danced astern. The coral skipper pilots were having a problem trying to nail the Agile Falcon without hitting their own ship, and Han was trying to make the solution to that problem as difficult as he could. The Yuzhan Vong had already put several shots into their own vessel, and Han didn't want them to stop now. The problem was that Millennium Falcon hadn't been built as a bomber. Proton torpedoes and shadow bombs had the punch to knock out a capital ship, but Falcon didn't carry either. Neither did Lando's Lady Luck or Talon Card's Wild Card. They'd been built with the intention of keeping patrol craft off their backs, not with having to knock out large targets. They all had to improvise. Han figured the best way to splatter a big Yuzhan Vong ship was to trick the Vong into doing it for him. And that's just what happened. One of the pursuing Yuzhan Vong tried to duck closer to the cruiser than Falcon, in order to shoot up at Han without danger of hitting his own vessel. But unfortunately, he forgot about Leia's bodyguard, Miwal. 
in the belly turret. Miwal gave a yowl of pleasure at the appearance of the target and hurled an array of laser bolts at the Vaughn. The enemy pilot was either hit or dazzled by the flares, because the coral skipper splashed into the enemy cruiser, its store of weapons erupting in fire as it slashed a brilliant flaming scar across the giant hull. Han shot off the bow of the cruiser and performed another frantic series of evasive maneuvers before the ships on his tail were dispersed or discouraged. Behind, the cruiser shivered as secondary explosions blasted outward toward its coral skin. The cruiser arced into a wide turn as Dovin basils used for propulsion along one side were destroyed, while those on the other side continued to drive the ship forward, like a rowboat with one oar pulling, while the other trailed in the water. Another ship turned away from Jaina. He could leave it to Bel Iblis's fleet to finish the cruiser off. He cast a glance at Leia, who was sitting white-knuckled in the co-pilot's seat. "'How are we doing?' She shook her head. "'Beliblis has caught up to the rearmost enemy, but we're still the only force between the Yuzhan Vong and Evac-9. "'Better find us another target, then,' Han said. The Smuggler's Alliance Squadron was doing a lot of brilliant flying, but it was outnumbered, and many of its ships, like Millennium Falcon, were unsuited for fleet combat.' Fortunately, the enemy seemed largely at a loss as to how to cope with the attack. The Alliance had no uniform ships, therefore no uniform tactics, and that meant that both sides were improvising, and the smugglers had a lot more experience at improvising than the Yuzhan Vong. Look out! At the yelp from Leia, Han jerked at the sweat-slick controls and managed to avoid being swatted by the huge errant venture, the only real capital ship under his command. The Star Destroyer was pumping fire in all directions, from every weapon on the ship, and as the largest New Republic target was receiving a lot of attention in return. Booster Tarek was driving straight at one enemy ship after another, trying to force them away from their course, a tactic fraught with hazard, but thus far he seemed to be doing well enough. Perhaps the Vong remembered the way Luzankia had rammed their world ship at Borlias. Han found a pair of smuggler ships in the melee, and these had proton missile launchers. Follow me, he told them. I'll carve a path for you. And he led them in another slash at the Yuzhan Vong. And later, after more slashes than he could remember, he saw the enemy battle group turn away from its objective. Savong La howled in triumph as the battle group of Yun Yuzhan, completely unmolested, drew near to Ebak 9. He had caught the infidels utterly by surprise. "'Open fire on the shields,' he commanded. "'Kusurin, you will dive onto the shield over the enemy command center at maximum thrust. Victory section, you will follow Kusurin to the shields and try to destroy them.' As the other ships hammered away at the defenders, Kusurin made its death dive toward the moon. The frigate made a colossal impact on the shields, debris rising amid a royal of brilliant plasma jets. Other ships dived close, their Dovin basils reaching out to snatch at the shields, trying to overload them. No success, but the War Master wasn't distressed. He had plenty of time before the nearest enemy could reach him. Savong La ordered another frigate to immolate itself, and then paused to consider the rest of the battle. Blazebugs, their lights and voices extinguished, represented the hundreds of craft that had been destroyed. His forces were being overwhelmed. Even the battle group of Yun Ka that he'd ordered to join him. The little motley squadron that stood in its way was, it appeared, too troublesome. Attention all other battle groups, he commanded. Once our troops are down on Ebak, you are commanded to withdraw into hyperspace and make your way to Yuzhantar. This battle is lost, but you are ordered to preserve your lives and ships for the victorious battles that will follow. The battle group of Yun Yuzhan will cover your withdrawal. He drew his slashed lips back for his final message, which he shouted in a tone of angry defiance that filled the huge room. Praise to the gods! Long live Shimra, the Supreme One! Doroic Vong Prat! The group commanders, those who still lived, returned the warrior salute. Ebak Nine's shields shuddered as another frigate thundered down. Savong Law sat back in his chair and ordered another capital ship to its death. Prepare the auxil, he said. And as one of his subalterns attached the grasping appendages of the creature to one of the villips used for communication, 
Savongla detached himself from the cognition throne and lumbered from the dais. He wanted to deliver this particular message himself. The auxil had enfolded the villa by the time he arrived, its long antenna tail dangling. Savongla took the creature in one hand, gazed at it, and forced his face into a smile. Knowing that the Auxil was broadcasting his words and his image on New Republic frequencies, he said in his crude basic, This is Warmaster Savong La. We are having a Jedi hunt on Ebak 9. Although anyone else coming near will be destroyed, all Jedi are welcome to participate. Chapter 26 The commander's voice hissed with interference as he spoke, through the comm, from his armored communications center in the old mine headquarters. They've brought down our shields. We're evacuating into the bunkers. Thanks for letting us know, Jaina said. She shivered from cold as she signed to Lobaka to seal the blast doors. We're setting the mines, the commander said. We're going to nail a lot of them as they come in. Good luck, Jaina said but hydraulics began hissing, and the doors boomed shut, and she doubted the signal ever reached the commander in his communications center just below the surface of the moonlet. Jaina turned off the comm and looked at her group of pilots. Put on your vac suits, and our body armor over the vac suits. At that moment the artificial gravity switched off, and so did the lights. How many Yuzhan Vong warriors to capture a moon? Savong La wondered. He had twenty thousand in the troop ships under his command, but surely that was excessive. Ten thousand, then. The rest could escape to fight another day. Nor did he need the entirety of the battle group of Yun Yuzhan. One third should be sufficient to repel the New Republic forces long enough to assure the success of his sacrifice. Come, Jedi, he shouted to the Auxil. Come to the hunt. Where is your courage? Then, turning to the subalterns around the cognition throne, he told them to order the other battle groups to withdraw from the fight. He ordered two of the three divisions of his own squadron to flee as well, and half the troop ships. But not those containing Gretchen, he called. These we shall need once we land on the moon. The rock-eating Gretchen would be a surprise, he thought. The Jedi would be forced to move through the tunnels that already existed, but the Gretchen could dig their own. But before the Gretchen landed, the soldiers would have to secure the area. He ordered the first transports to the surface, covered by the fire of the ships above. War Master, came the call from one of his subalterns, a report from the battle group of Yun Harla. They succeeded in withdrawing into hyperspace, but their jump has failed. They report mines. Mines. The battle group of Yun Harla and the battle group of Yun Shin leapt into hyperspace together, racing to safety down the narrow corridor that snaked through the deep core. But both were yanked out of hyperspace by the interdictor mine that had been set up in the lane's choke point, and all then found themselves in the middle of an enormous minefield that had been laid clean across the narrow corridor. Every second the enemy remained in the minefield, thousands of mines detected the intruders, swung toward their new targets, and fired themselves at the Yuzhan Vong. Many of the Yuzhan Vong ships were damaged and unable to defend themselves properly. Overwhelmed by the mines, many of these were destroyed in a blizzard of explosions. The few with undamaged defenses fared better, though few escaped without any damage at all. The battle group of Yun Ka which had been engaged by the fleet of Garm Beliblis and the Small Smugglers Alliance Squadron, managed a clean jump into hyperspace and arrived in the minefield more or less together. Fewer of their ships had suffered critical damage, and most were able to fight their way out. The two-thirds of Savong La's battle group of Yun Yuzhan were warned of the minefield's existence before they jumped, prepared themselves beforehand, and fared best of all but the lightly armed troop transports were unable to defend themselves effectively, and within a few minutes in the minefields, ten thousand Yuzhan Vong warriors met their deaths. As for the battle group of Yunyamka, it was too far into Ebak's gravity field to jump, pinned by overwhelming New Republic forces and wiped out. More than a third of the Yuzhan Vong fleet had been destroyed, 
and that did not count the remainder of Savong La's battle group, gathered about Ebak 9 to defend their commander and his ground forces. There, the first Yuzhanvong warriors to charge into the New Republic command centers were met by automatic mines that shredded them through their Vondun crab armor. The warriors charged over their own dead and encountered even more mines. You are already dead, Savong La told them by Vilip. The only question is whether you will die honorably as Yuzhan Vong, or as a cowardly disgrace to the gods who made you. None of the warriors were cowards. More than a thousand gave their lives to the mines, and the rest trampled their dead brethren and found only an abandoned facility. There, they wrecked enough of the equipment to finish off the power supply and drop all of Ebak's shields. Bring blood sacrifice to the surface. Savong La commanded. We will release the Gretchen and the Voxen. The huge flagship was brought to the moon's surface. Before Savong La left for the moon, he seized the Ogzil again and shouted again in basic, Are you not coming, Jedi? Won't you join the hunt? Where is your courage? To his surprise, the answering voice was one he recognized. This is Jason Solo, the villip reported. I'll play your game, War Master. Sabong La's answer was filled with grim satisfaction. Welcome, traitor. I shall look forward to seeing you again. And I you, War Master. Menace rang in the War Master's words. Once I swore to sacrifice you, Jason Solo. Perhaps we shall have the sacrifice after all. Perhaps I'll manage to delay it again, Jason said. Will you let me land, War Master? Any Jedi may land. I will so instruct the fleet. That's very courteous of you, War Master. Not at all. Would you come to Ebak if I order the fleet to blast you out of existence the second you arrived? Jason would, but there was no point in telling the War Master that. I'll see you soon, War Master, Jason said, and keyed off. His astromech droid bleated at him to let him know he had another incoming call. Jason switched frequencies. Jason, Luke said, what are you doing? Helping my sister. Jason couldn't quite keep defiance out of his voice. Jason felt a surge of Luke's presence through the Jedi meld, a forceful effort by Luke to contact him emotionally as well as by words. You can't help her by sacrificing yourself, Luke said. I'm not planning on getting sacrificed. Jaina and the others are in a hardened bunker. All she has to do is wait there until the fleet comes to get her. And we are coming, all of us. Crefe, Farlander, Beliblis, and your parents. Jason felt the force meld urging him to listen to Luke, to surrender to his reasonable argument. He fought the compulsion and tried to sound as calm and reasonable as he could. I don't trust Savong La to do what people expect him to, he said. I felt your surprise when he moved on Ebak 9. Luke didn't have an answer for that. I have a plan, Jason continued. I'm not going to run right into his arms. I'm going to distract him and keep him off Jaina's neck. A stab of fear ran through the Jedi meld, and the taste of it was Jaina's. Jaina's being hunted, Jason said. I've got to go now. He snapped off the comm. Luke and others continued to try to contact him through the meld, but Jason withdrew, and tried instead to concentrate on his Vong sense. He was out of practice. There had been no Yuzhan Vong to practice on. But as he slowed his respiration and entered a meditative state, he felt the enemy out ahead of him. Grim, determined flecks of consciousness all ready to sacrifice themselves for their leaders. Yuzhan Vong bravery and determination weren't surprising. What did surprise him was the numbers. On Ebak alone, there must have been thousands. Jaina waited in the dark. The Jedi were perfectly at home in the dark, strengthened by the Force and able to sense the walls around them, but... She felt anxiety grow in her non-Jedi companions, so she had them all switch on helmet lights and belt lights. 
Through the Jedi meld, she felt the growing certainty of victory, and then the growing triumph as one Yuzhan Vong squadron after another fled the battle. She sensed that Jason was doing something completely out of the box, but she didn't know what, and she sensed the others trying to do something about it. Distress trickled into her at this knowledge, but she didn't have a comm unit that could reach Jason, and she couldn't talk to him. She had made up her mind to try to reach him through the meld when something else drew her attention. Or perhaps something not else. Through the enhanced perceptions of the Force meld, she felt an emptiness, a void, something that was not in the Force. The Yuzhan Vong. And then she felt a surge through the Force, a purposeful sensation as malevolent and certain as the sound of a blaster being cocked next to her ear. Voxen. Voxen hunting her. Babaka snarled. Remind me to tell the High Command how much I hate their battle plan. Jaina said. There were hundreds of mine shafts in the old diggings, and a dozen or so that had been shielded by blast doors to delay the enemy. Some had been booby-trapped to make the Vong cautious. The battle plan assumed that the odds of the Yuzhan Vong finding her particular blast doors and committing their forces to breaking through were very low. The battle plan hadn't assumed the presence of Voxen that could sense any force user and lead the enemy straight to Jaina, whether she was anonymous behind the blast doors or not. Too bad we don't have any of those YVH droids, one of her pilots said. There aren't enough of them, Jaina said. The ones they've got are guarding the government. She considered. Stand well away from the doors, Jaina decided. I don't know what they're going to use to bring them down, but I know I don't want to be anywhere near the blast. Perhaps it is time to deploy the mines, Tisar said. His vac-suited tail lashed left and right. Yes, but away from the entrance. I don't want our mines wrecked by whatever they used to knock the door down. And then, on cue, they felt as well as heard a crash. The floor trembled, and the still air of the shaft reverberated to the sudden thunder that came from the other side of the blast door. The eight pilots of Twin Sun's squadron fell back down the tunnel without a word. They busied themselves in the dark, setting up anti-personnel mines, while the crash repeated itself again and again. It was through the force as much as by eyesight that Jaina sensed part of the wall cracking, parts of it flaking off and coming down. "'They're not coming through the door,' she said. They're coming around it. Something else the plan had not foreseen. The Yuzhan Vong filled the long tunnel that ran the length of the moon. A thousand in the advance guard, followed by baying Voxen and a pair of massive Gretchen, surprisingly light and agile in the low gravity. Then came the main body, with Sabong Lai and half the communications staff from the Blood Sacrifice. Explosions ripped the air ahead, and two score of the advance guard went down in their own blood. Another trap laid by the cowardly infidels, who would not fight hand to hand but instead with these machine snares. The rest marched over them, past one set of durasteel blast doors after another. The Yuzhan Vong would not halt until the Voxen did. The Voxen, their sensory bristles erect, stopped before a blast door indistinguishable from the others. One of them was so close to death that it could barely drag itself along, even in the low gravity. They tasted the door with their forked tongues, and then their howling filled the huge tunnel and sang like a melody in Sabang La's nerves. Voxen back, Sabang La told the trainers. Bring the Gretchena forward. The Gretchena were sleek, black, armor-plated beasts six meters long, much larger cousins of the metal-eating Gretchens that Yuzhan Vong fighter craft used as weapons. The Gretchena lacked the Gretchen's flight capability, but also their mindlessness. These were trainable and semi-intelligent, and Savong La had brought them on this expedition knowing he might have to dig the infidels out of their hiding places. The huge beasts snarled forward, steel-sharp mandibles deployed. Savong La looked for a moment at the blast doors, then shouted at the trainers. Have them dig through the tunnel walls. The walls are softer and the doors may be mined. 
The tunnel shivered as the Gretchena hurled themselves at the rock walls. Savong La, thinking of mines, prudently retreated into the main body. He had no fear of death, and in any case, he knew he would die today. But dying foolishly as the victim of a mine would be to trivialize his own end. Blood Sacrifice reports that Jason Solo has landed, one of his subalterns reported. Very good, Savong La said. Did Blood Sacrifice say where? The subaltern communed with his villip for a moment. Not at the main entrance. Somewhere on the far side. Savong La drew his slashed lips into a smile. We shall find him soon enough. He turned to the Voxen handlers. Two Voxen to join the advance guard, he ordered. All of them to find Jason Solo. At your command, Warmaster. Capture him for sacrifice if possible. But if not, call the gods to witness and kill him where he stands. Savungla had to shout over the noise the Gretchen made disassembling the tunnel wall. Two of the Voxen snorted onto the head of the advance guard, and the whole body of a thousand set off at a purposeful trot. Jason Solo. At the thought of Jason, the warmaster's Vuasa foot clenched, the claws scoring the stone floor. Jason had thwarted him at their every encounter, had smashed his foot in personal combat, requiring its replacement and when captured, had humiliated him with his sham defection. Now Jason dared to thwart him again. It was only now that he wondered why. Why would Jason Solo fly alone to Ebak Nine so that he could be hunted by Savong La and ten thousand Yuzhan Vong warriors? At once the answer came to him. The twin sister. Jaina Solo she who mocked Yun Harla, the trickster, with her devious ploys, must be among the Jedi trapped on Ebak Nine. Joy raged in Savongla's breast. The twin sacrifice. Once he had planned to sacrifice the Solo twins, an ambition that had been thwarted by the treasons of Jason and Verger. But now, the sacrifice would come to pass. And once the two were dead, Savongla himself could go to his gods with a smile on his slashed lips. The tunnel wall crashed in as the Gretchena broke through to the mine shaft beyond. Onward, soldiers, Savongla cried. The Jedi are to be sacrificed. Forward. Jaina heard the tunnel wall come down, and then she heard the massed baying of Yuzhan Vong warriors from the corridor beyond. It sounded like thousands of them. Back, she said. Fall back to the next intersection. They left anti-personnel mines behind, set to go off when they detected the body heat of the enemy. The mine galleries branched here, and Jaina consulted the map of the diggings she'd stored on her data pad, and chose the branch that gave her the most options. They moved down the tunnel, and the Jedi used the Force to keep everyone from bumping into each other in the low gravity. Then came a shriek, a screech with an ultrasonic component that froze Jaina's blood and raised the hairs on the back of her neck. What was that? One of her pilots demanded. Voxen, Tisar said. They hunt us. We can kill them, right? Anxiously. She heard one mine go off, followed by a shriek and a roar of anger from a hundred warrior throats. I hope we just did, Jaina said. Jason sped down the corridor flying easily with the force in the moonlit's light gravity, his flashlight picking out the details of the tunnels ahead of him. He, too, had a map of Ebak-9 on his data pad, and he figured the Yuzhan Vong were in occupation of the command areas and the central corridor. He planned to materialize in the central corridor, strike the Yuzhan Vong, then retreat. He would do his best to sow confusion and lead the enemy away from Jaina. At least he could lead the Voxen on a chase, and with any luck— trap them in the narrow passages and kill them. His expanded Vong sense filled the room. The sheer number of enemy warriors was intimidating, but he still hoped that, with luck, his plan would succeed. Unfortunately, his equipment was sparse. He had just his lightsaber, plus the blaster pistol, and the two grenades that were in the X-Wing's survival kit. But he could fight with Yuzhan Vong weapons if he needed to, and if he got the jump on some enemy warriors, he could equip himself with their gear. 
And then he felt the mental surge of a voxen looking for him, and he pushed out with his vong sense, tried to convince the voxen not to see him. But he wasn't expert enough. There was a mental click of the voxen locking onto him. And he heard a distant howl that echoed down the shaft, followed by a surge of glee and determination from hundreds of Yuzhan Vong warriors, and he knew he was being hunted. He reversed direction. There was no possibility now of catching the Yuzhan Vong by surprise. It was time to find one of those narrow corridors he'd been thinking about. Jason found a right-angled bend in the corridor and decided to make a stand while he still had options for retreat. He stationed himself behind a curve in the tunnel and ignited his lightsaber, then primed one of his two grenades and held it in his left hand. Objectively, he considered the use of the Vong sense in combat. He could influence some of the enemy weapons, render them useless, but decided against it. There were simply too many enemy coming for him. He could convince a few of their amphistaffs to bite their owners or go limp. He could convince a few thudbugs to go off prematurely but he couldn't influence them all. The Force was better for this situation. He let his Vong sense ebb and called the Force to him. He heard the enemy rush toward him, shouts, and the rush of feet. A horde packed into the corridor, skimming along under the light gravity. The ultrasonic screech of the Voxen caught Jason by surprise and almost paralyzed him. He had forgotten how numbing and terrifying the sound was. He wrenched himself free of the shock, and hurled the grenade around the corner, exposing his head just enough to use the force to guide the grenade down the open mouth of the Voxen. The Voxen, in its turn, was spitting toxic sludge at Jason, but Jason used the force to catch the acid stuff and fling it back in the direction of the enemy warriors. What shocked him was the number of those same warriors. It was one thing to sense them coming. It was another to actually see them, and at close range— they seemed to go on forever down the tunnel. There were hundreds. He ducked back around the corner as the grenade took off most of the Voxen's head. Jason knew that even this was unlikely to kill the creature, so he drew his blaster pistol with his left hand and began firing around the corner again at the Voxen and at any enemy warriors behind it. The Voxen, blinded or mad with pain, thrashed in the corridor with amazing energy and incredible speed. Its flogging tail had already brought down a number of warriors, but as Jason began firing, again exposing only his hand and head, the Yuzhan Vong gave a shout and surged forward, right over the thrashing Voxen, some even shoving the creature ahead of them as they impaled themselves on its poisoned spikes. From the warriors' hands came a rain of thud bugs. Jason leapt back from the corner, parrying wildly with his lightsaber as the thud bugs soared toward him, either making the sharp turn or bouncing off a wall, and then coming on. One bug hit him on the thigh and spun him around, and he used the force to maintain the spin, his lightsaber a green blur as he batted the missiles away. He made a complete turn and then used the force to hurl himself backward down the tunnel while he parried with his lightsaber and fired the pistol left-handed to discourage the Vong from rounding the corner. He didn't discourage them. The first half-dozen went down in a sprawl alongside the wounded Voxen, but then the rest came on, a long column of them, shouting their battle cry, Duroic Vong Prat. From behind them somewhere came the cry of another Voxen. Jason fired round after round from the blaster, though he knew it would do no good, and somewhere in the force he felt Jaina's anguish. Bring the roof down, Jaina said. Right here. How? one of her pilots asked. We've got mines, not explosives. Jaina reached out with the force and sought out cracks and flaws in the structure of the stone overhead. Tisar and Lobaka joined their power to hers. Stand back, Jaina said. A half-ton overhead boulder came down with a sudden crash, followed by debris and rubble. She widened the hole overhead, gouging at the rock, bringing more of it down. Then a shriek seemed to steal the breath from her throat, and a voxen was there, somehow managing to writhe through the storm of falling rock and leap into the midst of Jaina's party. She had forgotten how fast they were. 
She managed to get a force shield up in time to deflect a hail of toxic spit and leapt over the first lash of the tail while she drew her lightsaber and ignited the violet blade. There was a thud and a cry behind her. Blasters flamed in the dark, confined space, and concussions slapped her ears. Obaka was slashing at the thing's head, the brilliance of his lightsaber reflecting off the Voxen's glittering eyes. The tunnel reeked of the Voxen's acid spit. The tail lashed a second time and Jaina leapt again, then came down, slashing at the tail. The tail parted near its root, and acrid blood spattered Jaina's vac suit. And then the three Jedi were fighting side by side, lightsabers swinging in a frenzy of close combat against teeth and claws and poison and sheer single-minded viciousness. Whenever one of the other pilots could get a clear shot, he let fly with a blaster. Blood and acid spattered and hissed on the tunnel walls. The Voxen didn't stop fighting until it was literally cut to pieces, and the fight left Jaina exhausted, gasping for breath and leaning against the wall of the shaft. She had taken only a few breaths when she heard the howl of Vong warriors and looked up to see them filling the tunnel just beyond her rock barrier. A barrage of thud bugs came over the obstruction, followed by a mob of warriors scrabbling over the fallen stone. Jaina fired her blaster rifle left-handed at point-blank range while using her lightsaber to slice the thud bugs that came at her. The roof, she gasped. Let's get the roof down. She and Tisar and Lobaka united their force talents once more and clawed at the roof, bringing down rubble and stones at first, then boulders. Blaster bolts ricocheted among the rocks, reflecting in all directions. Jaina parried one with her violet blade. And then the roof was down with the sound of thunder, a billowing cloud wall of dust rolling down the mine shaft toward Jaina. She had seen at least half a dozen Yuzhan Vong warriors buried. That won't hold them long, one of her pilots said. Those rocks won't weigh much in this gravity. And look how they got around the blast doors. Maybe it'll hold them long enough for me to get another idea, Jaina thought. Pull back, she gasped. She wiped dust and sweat from her face and felt a faint surprise that she had any sweat left. It was only then that she found she had casualties. Her stomach queezed as she saw a twin force sprawled against the wall where the Voxen's tail had thrown him, his vac suit punctured by a score of poison spines. Twin Seven had been hit in the chest by a thud bug and knocked sprawling. He claimed he'd just had the wind knocked out of him, but Jaina didn't like the way his face shivered with pain when the others stood him on his feet. Two carried Twin Four's body to the rear, and another two supported Twin Seven. The Jedi stayed behind his rear guard until they reached a three-way intersection. The pilots ahead halted, and one of them looked over his shoulder. Which way, Major? Jaina pulled her data pad from the pocket of her sleeve and looked at it. The map seemed to swirl before her eyes. She was too tired to think properly, she realized. She forced her mind to work on the problem. You go left, she said. Streak and Tisar and I are going straight ahead. Wait a minute. Twin Ten with Twin Seven's arm around his shoulders was indignant. What do you mean by splitting us up? The Vong are hunting Jedi, Jaina said. You'll be safe if you take a detour. And we'll be safer if we don't have to worry about protecting you. And you won't die with us, she thought. We can fight, Major, Twin Ten insisted. We can help you. I appreciate it, but we haven't come this far with you, just to let you go off and fight the Vong on your own. You made us a team, and we're sticking together. Jaina fought back the tears that suddenly stung her eyes. This was the fighting spirit that she had created created with the drills and painstaking labor and blood. But all this admirable resolution could do right now was get the others killed unnecessarily. She straightened and took a breath and looked at Twin Ten. Do I have to make this an order, Lieutenant? she asked. Anger and frustration twitched across Twin Ten's face. Then he shook his head. I guess not, Major, he said. Then get moving. I'll see you when this is over. Jaina watched for a moment as her weary pilots limped away, then dragged herself down the tunnel she'd chosen. Her mind swam with weariness. Gather strength from the Force, Tisar said. It was more an order than a suggestion. 
Jaina was too tired to agree verbally. She just expanded her force awareness and let its power drain into her. There was a limit as to how long she could keep this up. Ultimately, there was no substitute for nutrition and bed rest. But as the force swam through her body, flushing every cell with energy, she found herself standing straighter. Her step was more firm, her breathing less labored. She consulted the map in her data pad and made a decision. We turn here. Tisar and Loe looked at the blank tunnel walls in surprise. Loe growled a question. In answer, Jaina pointed above their heads. An air shaft went up, connecting the tunnel to another gallery above their heads. The other two used the force to help Jaina rise into the shaft, and then by bracing her arms and feet against the rough sides of the shaft, she was able to chimney up six or seven meters to the gallery above, where she turned and aided the others. The maneuver was made very easy by the light gravity. Even Nobaka didn't weigh any more than fifteen kilos. Tisar turned on his belt light and looked each way down the corridor. Frost glittered on the rough stone walls. Where now? he asked. We wait right here. We can hold this shaft forever, or at least until they find another way into this gallery. And then when they come, we run the other way. Tisar seemed to find this plan acceptable and switched off his belt light. The three stood in the frigid tunnel and waited, knowing they wouldn't wait long. Jaina closed her eyes and opened herself to the Jedi meld. Uncle Luke, she sent, where are you? Luke was wondering how to retake the moon when the New Republic didn't have any troops on hand. They hadn't anticipated ground combat, so the only forces available were the lightly armed military police on the large capital ships. These and the Jedi, whom War Master Sabong La hoped would land on the little moonlet, whom he had invited to land. The New Republic forces were on the verge of engaging the small squadron the Yuzhan Vong had left behind to guard their ground forces. The Yuzhan Vong would fight bravely, but wouldn't last long against the New Republic's numbers. Luke wondered how long it had been since the odds were on his side. It was then that he felt the query from Jaina. The reply he sent was nonverbal, just a basic mental impression that meant, Where are you? Jaina's response was equally nonverbal, Pictures as well as anything else. Tunnel. Voxen. Troops. How many troops? Picturing numerals and enemy warriors. Lots. Coming soon. With mental pictures of Vong packed shoulder to shoulder in the narrow mine shafts. Luke verbalized his next sending. Can you get to the surface from where you are? Negative. He clenched his teeth. His next message was complicated, and it took him a moment to arrange his thoughts. Would it be possible to get a starfighter down Ebak's central shaft? In Jaina's reply, Luke sensed a weary amusement at the sheer audacity of the idea, flying an X-wing down the shaft and blasting hosts of Yuzhan Vong from their perches. In response was a picture of the shaft, which showed it wide enough. But then Jaina sent another picture of the shaft head with its heavy ore-hoisting equipment that would have to be gotten out of the way. Still, it was the best plan Luke had come up with. We're coming for you, he sent. Just wait. Again, Luke sensed amusement, tinged this time with bitterness, as if Jaina had said, like I have a choice. Through the meld, Luke told the other Jedi to prepare for a landing on Ebak-9 and a fight against overwhelming numbers. The first voxen that Savong La sent up the vertical shaft came down in pieces, and was followed by a grenade. A dozen brave warriors who tried to chimney up the shaft were killed by blaster fire before they got more than a few meters, and another grenade dropped down and killed a dozen more. This would delay things only a little. Send for the Gretchena, the war master ordered. He wouldn't send any more brave warriors up that shaft. Instead, he'd dig away the floor from beneath the infidel's feet. Blood sacrifice reports they have engaged the enemy, one of his subalterns reported. They will delay the infidel's arrival as long as possible. Tell the fleet that the gods will salute their courage. He turned to another subaltern. 
How is the search for Jason Solo? No change, Warmaster. He flees, but our forces are keeping him in sight. He... Warmaster! The subaltern with the auxil interrupted. A communication for you. Savong Law took the auxil from the subaltern. Who wishes to speak to me? he demanded. Can you not guess, Warmaster? At the sound of the voice, Savong Law's heart began to rage within his chest. For Jer, he said in surprise. And then he forced amusement into his voice. Have you called to beg for the lives of the Solo Twins? No, I have come to join your Jedi hunt, if you'll let me. The War Master laughed. You're a miserable traitor, and very clever. But you are not a Jedi. But I am a Jedi. A real Jedi. Not one of these imitations you've been fighting. Haven't you worked that out by now? Smug pleasure oozed from Verger's words. I lived alongside you for fifty years without detection, and then I betrayed you. I'm surprised the Supreme Overlord allowed you to live after I made you look so ridiculous. Fury gripped Savong La by the throat. Come to Ebak Nine, he shouted. Come to the sacrifice of the Solo Twins, if you'll let me. I'll instruct the ships to let you by. He threw the auxil back to his subordinate. See to it. Immediately, War Master. The packed warriors surged aside as the first of the two Gretchen arrived, half floating in the low gravity. Ah, he said to one of the trainers, and pointed at the roof. Begin there. Then he turned to the nearest group of Yuzhan Vong. Up the shaft, warriors, he shouted. Keep the Jedi busy while we dig. The three Jedi stood in the dark, illuminated only by their lightsabers. Jaina had just begun to think that the Yuzhan Vong had been too inactive for too long, when the floor reverberated to an impact, and from below there was a crash of falling rock. Vong, Tisar said, and leaned out to fire into the shaft as warriors began to scramble up. Razorbugs shot up in a useless attempt at providing a covering attack, and Lobaka and Jaina sliced them effortlessly with their lightsabers. The floor rocked to another shattering blow. Jaina could hear rock cracking. Drop a grenade, she thought, and run. Run until they caught her, and then fight until she couldn't fight any longer. Jason had decided he might as well make his stand. The mine shafts branched and narrowed, branched and narrowed, and when the roof got less than two meters high, he realized he was out of choices. When the tunnels were so small he could only crouch, then the Voxen would have too great an advantage. He made a turn into a branching tunnel and readied his lightsaber and blaster. He'd save his last grenade for the next Voxen. The enemy warriors hurled themselves down the tunnel, and Jason fired on them. Thudbugs and blorash jelly flew at him. He ducked some and cut at others. He was strangely calm. This wasn't the first time he had made a mistake— and dying was nothing new either. It was the thought of Jaina that brought despair. He had failed to help her, and through the force and their twin bond he felt her own hopelessness. The Yuzhan Vong kept coming, dozens of them lunging, charging, hurling thudbugs, spitting poison from the heads of their amphistaffs. Jason's blaster was running out of charges. His lightsaber was a brilliant green blur as it parried and slashed. Pace by pace he stepped back into the narrowing shaft. Jason felt rage building in him, a red fury that was his response to his own despair. The blaster hummed empty, and he threw it at the warrior. And then he remembered the power he could call upon, the power fueled by the kind of despair and anger he felt now and had felt before, and he hurled it at the warrior, the brilliant emerald fire that lanced from his fingertips. The force lightning threw the first rank of Yuzhan Vong back into their comrades, and in the confusion Jason launched another blaze of fire. He hadn't killed them. The murderous form of lightning was a dark side weapon. But they wouldn't be waking for a long time. Young Jedi. Jason looked around and somehow wasn't surprised to find Verger standing there. Hello, he said, and fired another sizzling blast at the Yuzhan Vong. 
Vergere looked up at him, her tilted eyes glittering and wise. You're about to lose your air, she said. Vergere, the subaltern cried, his voice ringing high above the sound of the Gretchena bringing down stone. Savong La swung at the subaltern. Whatever. Impatiently, isn't she coming? She comes, but she isn't slowing down. The A-wing that Verger stole from Ralroost's fighter bays impacted E-back 9's main shaft head, traveling at 35,000 kilometers per hour. The starfighter's weapons had been scavenged for use elsewhere, but weapons were scarcely necessary. The impact vaporized the heavy girders and machinery at the shaft head, and the starfighter's power plant and the two huge Novaldex engines turned into a fast-moving ball of plasma that swept the length of Ebac 9's central shaft and blew out the other side, a brilliant volcanic eruption that blinded any holocams that happened to be turned in that direction. As the superheated ion storm rampaged through the moonlit, it flashed into any open side corridors, and, to a lesser degree, any corridors branching off these— but Jaina and Jason were too deep into the galleries to be directly affected. What happened in their galleries was an enormous, eardrum-punishing buffet of pressure and heat, followed by a furious dust and windstorm that lasted mere seconds, after which the air was simply gone. The hurtling ball of plasma pushed a huge pressure wave ahead of it, and carried an underpressure behind, drawing air out of all the galleries. In addition, the storm of heat and pressure had set the moon on fire. Even metal will burn if it's hot enough and there's enough oxygen to keep the fires going. The fires set by the A-wing's ion fury were hot enough and powerful enough to suck every bit of oxygen out of the tunnels within seconds. The Yuzhan Vong had come prepared for decompression. It was an obvious defense strategy, after all. All of them carried Uglith cloakers that would enable them to survive without air. But they had expected more warning— even if the New Republic engineers had blown the shaft head and exposed it to the vacuum of space, it would have taken many minutes for all the great volume of air to evacuate the tunnels, and the warriors would have had all that time from the first decompression warning to safely don their cloakers. Those who survived the great wave of heat and radiation experienced at first the brutal overpressure of the impact, followed by a dusty, disorienting, hurricane-like wind as the air was sucked behind the racing plasma ball and into the fires of the central core. The oxygen was gone within two or three seconds of the impact. The few Yuzhan Vong who realized what had just happened were caught in a pack of their cohorts, disoriented and unable to communicate in the sudden absence of air. Many experienced syncope and passed out at once. Any who tried to hold their breath died of embolism as their lungs frothed and exploded. In order to survive, any individual warrior would have had to claw his cloaker free and don it amid a scrambling, staggering, falling crowd of his fellows, many of whom would have tried to snatch the cloaker from him in order to don it themselves. The three surviving Voxens and the Gretchena had no Uglith cloakers to wear, and they panicked in the absence of air and thrashed madly. Many Yuzhan Vong were crushed or poisoned, slashed or bitten by the dying animals, including their handlers. Within twenty seconds, all the Yuzhan Vong had passed out. Within minutes, they were dead. As deaths in battle go, these were comparatively merciful. The first blast of heat and pressure knocked Jaina from the shaft, staggered with vertigo from the double slap to her ears. "'Depressurization,' she called, her mind whirling. "'With one quick movement, she slapped her faceplate closed. "'The air around her howled, a screaming hurricane that threatened to drag her into the shaft, "'but within three seconds this was diminished to nothing. "'By the time she had fully secured her pressure helmet, the air was gone. "'About time,' she thought. "'She could have done with engineers blowing the shaft head a lot earlier. "'Tisar stood closest to the shaft,' able to use his tail to brace himself against the shaft walls and avoid being knocked about by the storm. Jaina gestured at him to take a glance down the shaft and see if the enemy were moving. Tisar looked, stepped back, one hand gesturing at Jaina to stay where she was. Jaina understood. Whatever was happening in the lower gallery, it was something she didn't want to watch. 
Jason watched the Yuzhan Vong die. He had no helmet, but thanks to Verger's warning, he was able to preserve the air in his immediate area with the force, forming a seal across the tunnel opening ahead of him. The Yuzhan Vong fell in graceful silence one by one, dropping slowly in the light gravity like the petals of some absurdly menacing flower. I wish I could help them, Jason said. There is nothing more useless than an impossible wish. Verger was severe. He turned to her. You did this, didn't you? Verger's whiskers twitched with distaste. It was necessary that you be liberated from your choices. Jason sighed. My choices weren't very good, were they? You chose with your heart, and you achieved your object, did you not? Your sister lives? She looked at him solemnly. And I achieved my object as well. You are free to pursue your destiny. Truth struck Jason. He looked at Verger in shock. I just realized, he said. You're dead, aren't you? The blood sacrifice blew at the same moment the fireball blossomed from Ebak's far side, and Luke was staggered by the double explosion. He sought the force meld, searching for the Jedi trapped on the moon, but it was some time before their presence returned to the meld. They had been very busy. What happened, he demanded. Depressurization. A picture of wind whirling out of the tunnel, followed by another picture of enemy dead. Jaina? Tisar? Sending pictures. Luke received pictures in return. Jaina and Tisar, hale and well, beneath the blue skies of some green planet. And Jason? Jaina's excited presence interrupted. Jason? He's here? Yes. Jason's presence in the meld was calm. With Verger, she's saved us. Verger, thought Luke. His reaction was strong enough to send his complex feelings into the force meld, and he felt the others react. Luke quickly dampened his contact with the meld. There were secrets he didn't want all Jedi to know. Was Verger with the Yuzhan Vong? The complex idea took some time for Luke to formulate. If the answer to his question was yes, the Yuzhan Vong knew of the Alpha Red weapon, and this whole victory might be pointless. No. Verger's astringent personality flowed into the meld from wherever she had been concealing herself, and spoke with extraordinary clarity. I have been hiding among the New Republic forces. I stole a fighter and dived it into the moon to destroy the enemy. Luke absorbed the implications of this. You gave your life to save the others. Verger's response was the answer she had given all along. It was necessary. Luke hesitated. Battle was still raging and people were still dying. Hold on, he tried to send. We'll get you out as soon as we can. And to the rest of the Jedi, he sent a strong suggestion not to mention Verger to anyone. There are reasons. He shifted his mind to the battle. The Yuzhan Vong had fought with their usual tremendous courage, but such courage hadn't served them well. It had become a trap, as Akbar had foreseen. Their formation was broken, their ships of fire, their crews dying. The New Republic forces were finishing them off. Luke looked at Garm Beliblis, saw the man's knife-like profile gazing intently at the battle display. Can we call on them to surrender? he asked. Bel Iblis was surprised. Why? They'll fight on. They always do. Because it will make us feel better to know that we offered. That we did all we could to preserve life. Bel Iblis considered this for a moment as he tugged his long white mustache, then nodded. Very well, he said. The offer to accept the enemy's surrender was made repeatedly from that moment. The Yuzhan Vong did not answer, and died. Jason stood in the narrow mine gallery so that he wouldn't lose body heat by sitting or leaning on the cold stone. He was practicing tapas, the art of keeping warm in a cold environment. But he was finding it difficult to concentrate on this and on maintaining the force shield that retained his air, and so he was beginning to shiver. 
I got you killed, he said. Brigere tilted her chin. Dying was my decision, young Jedi, not yours. But, Jason reasoned, I created the situation that led to your making that decision. In that case, you may rejoice in the fact that your sister is alive. Brigere shook her head. Both of us could not live. The situation would not permit that. The choice was between the young and promising, as against the wise and superannuated. And given that choice, she sighed, nature always chooses the young. She sighed again. I chose to bow to the will of nature. My time ended forty years ago. Now at last I will join my master and my old comrades. Tears stung Jason's eyes. I wish it had worked out differently. Again, Verger looked severe. What did I say about impossible wishes? Jason hugged himself and rubbed his upper arms for warmth. His teeth chattered. Can you help me stay warm, he asked. Amusement glittered in Verger's eyes. My abilities in this state are necessarily limited. I suggest you call upon your other friends. Mara felt the tension go out of her as Seen Sov delivered his report from Bel Iblis's flagship. Master Skywalker reports that all the Jedi trapped on the moon have survived. In fact, no Jedi casualties have been reported at all. Sov looked as pleased as his heavy-jowled face permitted. His step was lighter and his button eyes glittered. He turned to Akbar. Your plan was brilliant, sir, he said. It worked perfectly. Akbar made an agitated movement of his hands. I should have foreseen the occupation of Ebak. His words were slurred, and his skin had turned gray. I should have insisted on ground troops defending that moon. The Supreme Commander wasn't about to let second thoughts spoil his victory. It all worked out for the best, Sov said. He gestured at the hollow representation of Ebak's system. Look, sir, no surviving enemy craft. The board's nothing but blue. Akbar's whiskered chin fell on his chest. I should have foreseen it, he mumbled. Winter looked at Mara. We should get Akbar home. Will you help me? Mara and Winter each took one of Akbar's arms and helped him rise. As they made their way out of the command center, Idar Nili Kirka ran up to Mara. Now we can roll up their spy networks, he said. The Vong will never believe any of these networks now. I've been thinking about that, Mara said. Maybe we should let one of them stay in place. Nili Kirka cocked his head. Really? he said. Can you explain your reasoning? If we roll up two of the networks and leave the third alone, that will give the third more credence. Hmm. Very intriguing. Mara and Neely Kirka debated the matter all the way to the shuttle gate. Luke was eager to mount a rescue mission immediately, but the central shaft of Ebak-9 was too hot and too radioactive for living beings to enter. Droids were sent instead, bringing food, water, heaters, bedding, and vacuum-proof tents in which the survivors could live while waiting for the moon to cool down. Cybot load-lifters were used, on the theory that their unsophisticated brains would be less subject to being scrambled by radiation. MD-series medical droids were sent in as well. One of them froze part way in, slagged by radiation, but the others got through intact. Jason was found keeping warm with energy sent to him by the Jedi meld. He set up the tent, ballooned it with air, set up the heater, and consumed several warm drinks. The medical droid pronounced him well. The loadlifters found Jaina as well, but were unable to ascend the vertical shaft to her hiding place. She, Tisar, and Lobaka dropped easily through the shaft, and for the first time, in the loadlifters' powerful lights, Jaina saw the piles of Yuzhan Vong corpses that choked the tunnel. She turned away and hoped she wouldn't be sick in her vac suit. The MD droid's voice came through the headset of Jaina's vac suit. I would like to examine you and your companions. We're all right, Jaina answered, if I don't throw up. 
I have a wounded pilot whom you should see first. Walk back the way you came, and take the first left facing out. Keep hailing on these frequencies, and they should answer. Very well. Take one of the load lifters with you. They'll need supplies as well. And there's a body that will have to be taken out. Maybe thousands of bodies. The MD droid turned to go. Then Jaina was surprised to see the droid's head fly off and strike the mine shaft wall. Sabong La passed out seconds after the tunnel was depressurized, and had survived only because his aides fought off the other Yuzhan Vong, who would have trampled him just long enough for one of them to deploy the Nulith that fed him air, and the Uglith cloaker that masked him against vacuum and cold. When the War Master woke, with the Nulith's tube down his throat, he was buried under an insulating pile of Yuzhan Vong dead, mostly his own subalterns. At first despair consumed him, the knowledge that he had failed utterly, that his fleet had been broken and forced to flee, and even his personal revenge against the Jedi twins had come to nothing. He considered tearing the Nulith from his face and dying along with the brave warriors he had led to destruction. But then he recalled that Jaina and her comrades were near. If they had moved while he was unconscious, then his revenge would still be thwarted. But there had been no reason for them to move. Jaina was still probably at the head of the vertical shaft just overhead. Animated by sudden hope, he clutched his baton of rank and worked his way to the top of the pile of corpses, where he gathered a stock of weapons. His baton and the amphistaffs were all dead, but had frozen into useful positions. Thud and razor bugs were no more than rocks, but the blorash jelly was in suspended animation and would live long enough when triggered to do what he intended. When Sabong La had prepared his arsenal, he returned to the corpses, draping enough arms and legs over himself to remain inconspicuous. It was a pity that it wouldn't be Jason Solo he confronted at the end, but he comforted himself with the thought that to kill Jaina would be to hurt Jason, to give him a lifelong sorrow that might be more damaging than if Jason himself were killed. Cold triumph sang through his nerves as he began to detect the powerful lights of the load-lifters approaching down the tunnel. He narrowed his eyes, keeping his focus on the vertical shaft, just a few meters over his head. Soon he would strike and take his vengeance. Jaina twisted as she drew her lightsaber, intending to spin away from any attacker, but her feet had somehow gotten stuck to the mineshaft floor, and instead of spinning she sprawled to one side. Luckily, because at that moment Savong La hurled his baton of rank like a spear. The baton missed Jaina entirely and impaled Lobaka, piercing him clean through the shoulder. The Wookiee roared and wobbled. Like Jaina, Blorash Jelly had pinned him to the floor. And he fell into Tisar, who was in the act of drawing his blaster. Little jets of air began to spurt from Lobaka's wounds, crystallizing immediately in the vacuum and drifting to the floor as glittering snow. Half-deafened by the wookie roar she heard over her headset, Jaina hauled herself upright, aided by muscle and low gravity, her lightsaber glowing a soft violet off the cavern walls. Sabong La seized an amphistaff from the weapons he'd strewn nearby and slashed the weapon at Jaina's head. Jaina was frozen to the floor by blorash jelly, and Sabong La was behind her. Her helmet cut off her peripheral vision— and the only way she knew she was being attacked was that she saw Savong La's madly dancing shadow cast by the powerful lights of the load-lifters. She dropped the point of her lightsaber behind her back to guard against Savong La's swing, and the impact almost wrenched her arm out of its socket. Her heart thundered in her ears. She twisted as far to her right as possible in order to see her attacker, and managed to parry the next furious series of strikes. Savong La shifted to her left, and Jaina twisted toward him and swung her lightsaber in a sweeping parry from high to low to catch any possible strike. Again, the impact was massive, and nearly tore the weapon from her grasp. The warrior kept chopping at her. The amphistaff held in both hands, and she parried furiously. She had no chance to counterattack, and the impacts were numbing her arm. If something didn't happen soon, her weapon would be knocked from her hand. The fight in the vacuum was in utter silence. Jaina could hear only her own rasping breath and the throbbing of her heart, 
and then the silence was broken over the calm by Lobaka's bellow as Tisar yanked the baton out of his shoulder. It's Sabongla. Gina was startled by Tisar's words coming through her helmet phones. The War Master's face was well known in the New Republic. Shoot him, Gina said. She didn't much care who he was. She only wanted him dead and her friends safe. Tisar obliged by firing at the War Master, the brilliant blaster bolts glancing off the rock walls. But the Yuzhan Vong danced to Jaina's right again to put Jaina between himself and Tisar's blaster. This one must patch up Loi, Tisar said. He's losing air. You've got to hold off the Vong. Thanks, Jaina muttered. She twisted to the right again, turning the movement into a cut. She chopped a chunk out of the frozen amphistaff, and Sabong La stepped out of range to pick up another weapon. When he came on again, he lunged rather than slashed, and Jaina was able to slide her blade into a circular parry and bind. But in her twisted position, she lacked the leverage of wrist and arm to force the disarm that followed the bind. Instead, her blade grated on the amphistaff and locked. Only a meter away, she could see Salong La's silent snarl of triumph. He kicked and drove his heel into Jaina's thigh. An overwhelming jolt of pain shot through her thigh and knee. With a cry, she lost her grip on her lightsaber and pitched forward. In front of her, Lobaka crouched before Tisar, both nailed to the ground by Blorash jelly. Loi's hand pressed on his shoulder, trying to hold in his air, while Tisar worked frantically to apply a patch to the wound on the Wookiee's back. Jaina snatched Loi's lightsaber from his belt and triggered it as she pulled herself to her feet. Savong La had cleared Jaina's lightsaber from his weapon and lunged forward again and his eyes widened in surprise as Jaina slashed two clawed toes from the rod-ank leg he had implanted as an arm. The War Master stepped back as dark blood oozed from the wound and fell with a graceful lack of haste to the floor. Jaina kept the lightsaber on guard, pointed at his face. He glared at her, red murder glowing in his eyes. "'How's Streak?' she asked. "'He's passed out.' This one has patched the exit wound, but the wound at the front is still venting. Jaina watched Savong La take a grip on his weapon and dig his feet into the ground. Hurry, she said. I think I just made him mad. Savong La charged the amphistaff blur. He attacked to Jaina's right, drawing her lightsaber out of line, then shifted to a vicious overhead cut coming in from the left. Jaina managed to block in time, but the impact bent her far over, the air going from her lungs in a woof. Her head low, she could see the soft violet radiance of her own lightsaber lying on the floor past the War Master's legs. She sliced madly at the amphistaff as she straightened again, engaging the furious warrior in a long series of attacks and parries. And then Jaina reached out with the force, picked up her lightsaber from the ground behind Savong La and drove the violet blade point-first through his throat. The War Master fell. Jaina didn't spare him another glance, but turned to Tisar and Lobaka. Tisar was just finishing the patch on the front of Loi's vac suit. She could see the suit begin to reinflate, the Wookiee's muzzle snarling open as he drew in a breath. Tisar looked up at her. The suit is patched, but the shoulder is not. Four smelled, Jaina gasped. Tell Uncle Luke we need another M.D. droid, and blood to replace what Loi's lost. That is wise. Tisar straightened, then looked down at his feet. He tried to move one foot, and the Blorash jelly shattered like fine glass. Apparently it didn't deal with vacuum well. Now we can move, Gina said. Great timing as usual. Chapter 27 Five days after the Battle of Ebak, Luke Skywalker met with Cal Omas. Cal had spent the weeks prior to the battle in isolation on the Super Star Destroyer Guardian, cruising safely between the stars. Now Guardian had joined Kreefe's fleet at Kashi'ik. My heart was in my mouth, Cal said. I was sitting there watching the battle, and I wanted to do something. I wanted to give an order. Thank you for your restraint. Luke smiled. That's been one of our problems. Too many voices giving orders. Don't I know it? 
Cal frowned. Where do you sit? The Star Destroyer possessed an admiral's lounge that seemed half the size of a hoverball field, filled with tasteful furniture and scented by the blossoms the ship's gardener cultivated and set in beautiful vases. Cal and Luke sat in plush armchairs, and Cal rang for a steward to bring drinks. "'I've been thinking about the government and how to fix it,' Cal said. "'The war's sense of urgency has resulted in unity right now, but once the Senate decides we're going to win, they're going to want to figure out how to get their hands on the spoils.' Luke nodded. "'What's your solution? Persuade the worlds to elect more responsible senators?' Cal suggested weakly, and then laughed at his own absurdity. "'You've got other ideas.' Cal nodded. "'Confine the Senate to its proper sphere, for one thing. It should legislate and supervise, not try to run the administration from day to day. A truly independent judiciary would curb their more ambitious maneuvers. A new federalism that properly defines the boundaries between the Senate and the regimes on the various planets. You're talking a new constitution.' Cal gave a tight-lipped little smile. I'm even thinking of names. Federal Galactic Republic. Galactic Federation of Free Alliances. He frowned. Do you think it's possible? I think a chief of state who's just won a war against an implacable enemy might have a lot of currency with the Senate and the people. Cal's smile faded. Guess I'd better get busy and win it, then. Which brought them to the point of the meeting— Luke looked at Cal and said, Win it with Alpha Red? Cal's look turned grim. No, he said, not now. It's a last resort only. Luke nodded. Thank you, sir. Luke was able to assure Jason that Alpha Red had been put on hold as soon as he and his nephew could find time to be alone. Jason had been rescued mere hours after the end of the battle, but he had spent the intervening time with his parents, and Luke had been too busy to question him. Now Jason had returned to his quarters on Ralroost, a ship filled with the sound of clattering pneumatic cutters and hissing welders, all busy repairing battle damage. Jason seemed rested and fit. He had put on weight since his escape from the Yuzhan Vong, and his eyes were bright and his short beard neatly trimmed. But Alpha Red will still exist, Jason said. He had courteously given Luke his only chair and sat cross-legged on his narrow bunk. We can't put the knowledge back in its box, Luke said. Jason shook his head, frowned down at the floor. Insufficient experience of depravity, he murmured. Beg pardon? Jason glanced up. Something Verger once said, implying that I had much to learn. Verger, Luke said, thought knowledge was the answer to everything. Was she wrong? Luke considered the question. I value compassion over knowledge, he said, but I hope never to have to choose between the two. I chose compassion as well, Jason said. Compassion for Jaina over the knowledge that my attempt to rescue her was almost certainly useless. Luke listened carefully to Jason's tone for a hint of bitterness. He didn't hear it. Jason seemed to have accepted what had happened, accepted it somehow, and dealt with it. He reflected that Jason was remarkable in his capacity for acceptance. And then Verger chose compassion as well, Jason went on. Compassion for me. And she gave her life for mine. She thought your life was worth saving, Luke said, and so do I. Jason looked up sharply. I hope you won't have to sacrifice yourself for me, he said. Luke smiled. Let's just say that's another choice I hope never to have to make. Jason looked away. Verger said the old must give way to the new. You're the future of the Jedi Order, Luke said. You and Jaina and Tahiri and the others. In my time I must make way for you as well. Jason looked thoughtful. In your time, he said. He scratched his brown beard, then looked in annoyance at his hand and returned it to his lap. He looked at Luke. 
Do you think it's possible that the issues of this war are completely different from... from your war? From the war against the Empire? How do you mean? A repair crew of droids clattered by outside the door, and Jason waited for their sound to fade before continuing. Your war was about light and dark. You and my mom versus Vader and the Emperor. But this war... He hesitated. For all the evil they do, the enemy aren't dark, exactly. The enemy are outside the Force entirely. So to fight them, we need to... to make the Force bigger. Bigger than light and dark. Bigger than human and Yuzhan Vong. He shook his head, then gave a laugh. I'm talking nonsense, aren't I? Make the Force bigger. The Force is already all living things. Perhaps it's not the force that needs to be bigger, Luke said. Maybe what needs to be bigger are our ideas about the force. Jason made as if to laugh again, then stopped. His face turned serious. Bigger ideas about the force. How do we manage that? Luke rose from the chair, and on his way out of the cabin put his hand on Jason's shoulder. If anyone can do it, Jason, he said, it would be you. Jaina left Ebak 9, eight days after the battle. The interior of the moon was still hot, but she was saved from the radiation by being carried by a load lifter in a lead-lined container box. She insisted on being the last one out. She had reunited after the battle— with the pilots she'd sent away down the side passage, and they'd spent the week in their oxygen tents. In the tents there had been nothing to do but talk, play sabak, and sleep. Occasionally the MD droid changed Lobaka's back to patches. Jaina rebelled at first against this unstructured life. She was used to long days of drill, study, and instruction. She wanted to do something. But no meaningful work was possible, and eventually the tension began to ebb as she began to relax. She joined the other Jedi in meditation, at first to help Loe heal, and then because it became her only connection to the universe that lay beyond the tents. Through the Force and the Jedi meld, she bade farewell to her friends as they left Ebak's system. Kreefe's fleet had been recalled to the defense of Kashi'ik, and Beliblis returned to Fondor. Soon, the only friendly force remaining in the system was the Smuggler's Alliance Squadron, led by her father, the squadron that had lost half its ships turning the enemy squadron from her. From her. So many had died to keep her safe. Her father's friends, Vale and three other twin sons' pilots, Verger. She didn't know how to think about them now. And so she meditated, and slowly relaxed, and opened herself to the universe, to its glories and pleasures, and its griefs and sorrows as well. Sometimes, when she was laughing with the others, she felt a wave of heartache strike her, and she had to turn away, gulping tears. There were so many to mourn, a whole war's worth. The final indignity came when she was carried out in the lead-lined box, like a package to be delivered to her friends, when she emerged, she was in the Millennium Falcon's cargo bay, and the room was filled with applause. The light dazzled her eyes. She stepped out of the box and wrestled the vac suit helmet off her head. Standing before her were her parents, Jason, the eight surviving twin sons pilots, Kip Duran, and old friends like Talon Card, Booster Tarek, and Lando Calrissian. They all seemed inexpressibly dear to her. Jaina went along the room and embraced them one by one. As she touched Jason, she felt the twin bond roaring in her head, the memories and comradeship and love all singing in her heart like a chorus of concern. Her father, himself blinking back tears, reached into a pocket and held out a pair of gleaming insignia. "'Admiral Crefe's decided to promote you,' he said. "'Congratulations, Lieutenant Colonel. Thank you.' She focused on the insignia Han wore on his civilian vest and snapped him a salute. Thank you, General. Han returned the salute with a shamefaced grin. 
Then Jaina turned to her mother, who stood by Han's side with her arms open, and Jaina threw herself at Leia and buried her face in her mother's neck. This is going to be really bad for discipline, she thought. Leia stroked her hair. Will you take a vacation now? she demanded. Jaina laughed, but the tears burned in her eyes. You know what? she mumbled. Being the sword of the Jedi really stinks. His body twitched to remembered pain. Images of needles and knife-like claws floated through his mind. He remembered the shriek of severed nerves, the grind of bone against bone, the way blood oozed slowly from a wound. He shivered. Why had this happened? Why? He had never harmed anyone. He opened his eyes at a sound, and there before him was the withered one, a sneer drawn across his crooked slash of a mouth. Your guests have arrived, Supreme One. At the words, Shimmer felt his power flow into him, his majesty and command and presence. He sat on his spiked throne in the Hall of Confluence with its white bone pillars, and his subjects waited outside the huge doors. He could detect them there, feel the subdued fluttering of their busy minds. Shimmer looked at the disfigured being before him. Onimi. Let the doors open, he said. The four doors trembled open, and the four castes and their leaders entered and filed in silence to their places. Onimi sat on the lowest step of Shimra's dais and adopted a sullen expression. Shimra could sense the deep foreboding in his inferiors, the sense that the great defeat at Ebak had been a disaster from which the Yuzhan Vong might never recover. Cowards, he thought. These fools must be strengthened. He rose massively from his throne, stood before them in the flayed skin of Sting. He sent his presence out among his listeners and began to work on their emotions to drive them into a frenzy. The gods test their servants, he shouted. They have permitted enemy treachery to betray one of our feats. One of the warriors flung himself to the ground. Command us, Supreme One. We must thank the gods for this chance to test our purity and resolve, Shimra roared. Let the sacrifices be doubled. Let heretics be sought and punished. Let prayers rise to the gods from every temple. So shall it be. High priest Jakan was on his feet, shaking a fist. Let the warriors redouble their vigilance. Any step backward is a betrayal. Let the commanders plan new offensives and new victories. Let them spill the blood of the infidels. The warriors bade their approval, raising their amphistaffs. The traitor Numanor must be found, Shimra proclaimed. Let him be slaughtered and his bones ground to powder. Afterward, after his audience filed out, Shimra collapsed onto his throne. Onimi rose from his couch and gave a sneering look at the far end of the hall. Fools, he said. But what choice is there but to use them? Shimmer made no reply. His eyes were closed. Onimi's voice was thoughtful. We began this war, and now we must fight on and hope for the best. He gave a little shiver. You've betrayed and used the gods. Perhaps they now betray you in return. Shimra said nothing. Yet Nenyim may yet fill the eighth cortex, Onimi mused. She needs time. Perhaps her resources should be increased. Shimra remained silent, his torn nostrils flaring with each massive breath. Onimi cocked his swollen, misshapen head. Do you not find it amusing, Supreme One? he said. We gambled and lost, and now we must double the stakes and gamble again, with the odds against us even greater than before. Is that not cause for laughter, Lord Shimra? Unimi threw his head back and laughed, a full-throated shriek of amusement that rang from the room's high ceiling. Shimra drew in air and laughed, 
a huge, deep booming that rattled his throne's coral spikes. Their laughter redoubled, treble and bass, twining among the chitin walls, the bone pillars, the arching roof. The room built like the mouth of a great carnivorous beast, a beast that devours all who enter.'